After a Few Words by Randall Garrett. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nick Number. After a Few Words by Randall Garrett. He settled himself comfortably in his seat and carefully put the helmet on, pulling it down firmly until it was properly seated. For a moment he could see nothing. Then his hand moved up and, with a flick of the wrist, lifted the visor. Ahead of him, in serried array, with lances erect and pennons flying, was the forward part of the column. Far ahead, he knew, were the Knights Templars who had taken the advance. Behind the Templars rode the mailed Knights of Brittany and Anjou. These were followed by King Guy of Jerusalem and the host of Poitou. He himself, Sir Robert de Bouin, was riding with the Norman and English troops just behind the men of Poitou. Sir Robert turned slightly in his saddle. To his right he could see the brilliant red and gold banner of the lion-hearted Richard of England, gules and pale three lions passant gardened oar. Behind the standard-bearer his great war-horse moving with a steady, measured pace, his coronet of gold on his steel helm gleaming in the glaring desert sun, the lions of England on his firm-held shield, was the king himself. Further behind, the knights' hospitallers protected the rear, guarding the column of the hosts of Christendom from harassment by the Bedouins. "'By Our Lady!' came a voice from his left. Three days out from Acre, and the accursed Saracens still elude us.' Sir Robert de Bouin twisted again in his saddle to look at the knight riding alongside him. Sir Gaëtan de l'Arctom sat tall and straight in his saddle, his visor up, his blue eyes narrowed against the glare of the sun. Sir Robert's lips formed a smile. They are not far off, Sir Gaëtan. They have been following us. As we march parallel to the seacoast, so they have been marching with us in those hills to the east. Like the jackals they are, said Sir Gaëtan. They assail us from the rear and they set up traps in our path ahead. Our spies tell us that the Turks lie ahead of us in countless numbers, and yet they fear to face us in open battle. Is it fear, or are they merely gathering their forces? Both, said Sir Gaëtan flatly. They fear us, else they would not dally to amass so fearsome a force. If, as our informers tell us, there are uncounted Turks to the fore, and if, as we are aware, our rear is being dogged by the Bedouin and the black horsemen of Egypt, it would seem that Saladin has at hand more than enough to overcome us, were they all truly Christian knights. Give them time. We must wait for their attack, Sir Knight. It were foolhardy to attempt to seek them in their own hills, and yet they must stop us. They will attack before we reach Jerusalem, fear not. We of Gascony fear no heathen Mussulman, Sir Gaeton growled. It's this hellish heat that is driving me mad, he pointed toward the eastern hills. The sun is yet low, and already the heat is unbearable. Sir Robert heard his own laugh echo hollowly within his helmet. Perhaps twere better to be mad when the assault comes. Madmen fight better than men of cooler blood. He knew that the others were baking inside their heavy armor, although he himself was not too uncomfortable. Sir Gaëtan looked at him with a smile that held both irony and respect. In truth, Sir Knight, it is apparent that you fear neither men nor heat, nor is your own blood too cool. True, I ride with your Normans and your English and your King Richard of the Lion's Heart, but I am a Gascon and have sworn no fealty to him. But to side with the Duke of Burgundy against King Richard, he gave a short, barking laugh, I fear no man, he went on, but if I had to fear one, it would be Richard of England. Sir Robert's voice came like a sword, steely, flat, cold, and sharp. My lord the king spoke in haste. He has reason to be bitter against Philip of France, as do we all. Philip has deserted the field. He has returned to France in haste, leaving the rest of us to fight the Saracen for the Holy Land, leaving only the contingent of his vassal, the Duke of Burgundy, to remain with us. Richard of England has never been on the best of terms with Philip Augustus, said Sir Gaëtan. No, and with good cause, but he allowed his anger against Philip to color his judgment when he spoke harshly against the Duke of Burgundy. The Duke is no coward, and Richard Plantagenet well knows it. As I said, he spoke in haste. And you intervened, said Sir Gaëtan. It was my duty, Sir Robert's voice was stubborn. Could we have permitted a quarrel to develop between the two finest knights and war leaders in Christendom at this crucial point? The desertion of Philip of France has cost us dearly. Could we permit the desertion of Burgundy, too? You did what must be done in honor, the Gascon conceded, but you have not gained the love of Richard by doing so. 
Sir Robert felt his jaw set firmly. My king knows I am loyal. Sir Gaeton said nothing more, but there was a look in his eyes that showed that he felt that Richard of England might even doubt the loyalty of Sir Robert de Bouin. Sir Robert rode on in silence, feeling the movement of the horse beneath him. There was a sudden sound to the rear. Like a wash of the tide from the sea came the sound of Saracen war cries and the clash of steel on steel mingled with the sounds of horses in agony and anger. Sir Robert turned his horse to look. The negro troops of Saladin's Egyptian contingent were thundering down upon the rear. They clashed with the hospitallers, slamming in like a rain of heavy stones, too close in for the use of bows. There was only the sword against armor, like the sound of a thousand hammers against a thousand anvils. "'Stand fast! Stand fast! Hold them off!' It was the voice of King Richard, sounding like a clarion over the din of battle. Sir Robert felt his horse move as though it were urging him on toward the battle, but his hand held to the reins, keeping the great charger in check. The king had said, Stand fast, and this was no time to disobey the orders of Richard. The Saracen troops were coming in from the rear, and the hospitallers were taking the brunt of the charge. They fought like madmen, but they were slowly being forced back. The master of the hospitallers rode to the rear, to the king's standard, which hardly moved in the still desert air, now that the column had stopped moving. The voice of the Duke of Burgundy came to Sir Robert's ears. "'Stand fast! The king bids you all to stand fast,' said the duke, his voice fading as he rode on up the column toward the knights of Poitou and the knights Templars. The master of the hospitallers was speaking in a low, urgent voice to the king. "'My lord, we are pressed on by the enemy and in danger of eternal infamy. We are losing our horses, one after the other.' "'Good master,' said Richard, "'it is you who must sustain their attack. No one can be everywhere at once.' The master of the hospitallers nodded curtly and charged back into the fray. The king turned to Sir Baldwin de Carreo, who sat a horse nearby, and pointed toward the eastern hills. "'They will come from there, hitting us in the flank. We cannot afford to amass a rearward charge. To do so would be to fall directly into the hands of the Saracen.' A voice very close to Sir Robert said, "'Richard is right. If we go to the aid of the hospitallers, we will expose the column to a flank attack.' It was Sir Gaeton. My lord the king, Sir Robert heard his voice say, is right in all but one thing. If we allow the Egyptians to take us from the rear, there will be no need for Saladin and his Turks to come down on our flank, and the hospitallers cannot hold for long at this rate. A charge at full gallop would break the Egyptian line and give the hospitallers breathing time. Are you with me? Against the orders of the king? The king cannot see everything. There are times when a man must use his own judgment. You said you were afraid of no man. Are you with me? After a moment's hesitation, Sir Gaeton couched his lance. I'm with you, Sir Knight. Live or die. I follow. Strike and strike hard. Forward, then, Sir Robert heard himself shouting. Forward for St. George and for England. St. George and England, the Gascon echoed. Two great war horses began to move ponderously forward toward the battle lines, gaining momentum as they went. Moving in unison, the two knights, their horses now at a fast trot, lowered their lances, picking their Saracen targets with care. Larger and larger loomed the Egyptian cavalrymen as the horses changed pace to a thundering gallop. The Egyptians tried to dodge as they saw, too late, the approach of the Christian knights. Sir Robert felt the shock against himself and his horse as the steel tip of the long ash lance struck the Saracen horsemen in the chest. Out of the corner of his eye he saw that Sir Gaeton, too, had scored. The Saracen, impaled on Sir Robert's lance, shot from the saddle as he died. His lighter armor had hardly impeded the incoming spear point, and now his body dragged it down as he dropped toward the desert sand. Another Moslem cavalryman was charging in now, swinging his curved saber, taking advantage of Sir Robert's sagging lance. There was nothing else to do but drop the lance and draw his heavy broadsword. His hand grasped it, and it came singing from its scabbard. The Egyptian's curved sword clanged against Sir Robert's helm, setting his head ringing. In return, the knight's broadsword came about in a sweeping arc, and the Egyptian's horse rode on with the rider's headless body. Behind him, Sir Robert heard further cries of, St. George and England! The hospitallers, taking heart at the charge, were going in. Behind them came the Count of Champagne, the Earl of Leicester, and the Bishop of Bouvet, who carried a great warhammer in order that he might not break church law by shedding blood. 
Sir Robert's own sword rose and fell, cutting and hacking at the enemy. He himself felt a dreamlike detachment, as though he were watching the battle rather than participating in it. But he could see that the Moslems were falling back before the Christian onslaught. And then, quite suddenly, there seemed to be no foeman to swing at. Breathing heavily, Sir Robert sheathed his broadsword. Beside him, Sir Gaeton did the same, saying, It will be a few minutes before they can regroup, Sir Knight. We may have routed them completely. Aye, but King Richard will not approve of my breaking ranks and disobeying orders. I may win the battle and lose my head in the end. This is no time to worry about the future, said the Gascon. Rest for a moment and relax, that you may be the stronger later. Here, have an old king's. He had a pack of cigarettes in his gauntleted hand which he proffered to Sir Robert. There were three cigarettes protruding from it, one slightly farther than the others. Sir Robert's hand reached out and took that one. Thanks. When the going gets rough, I really enjoy an old king's. He put one end of the cigarette in his mouth and lit the other from the lighter in Sir Gaeton's hand. Yes, sir, said Sir Gaeton after lighting his own cigarette. Old kings are the greatest. They give a man real, deep-down smoking pleasure. There's no doubt about it. Old kings are a man's cigarette. Sir Robert could feel the soothing smoke in his lungs as he inhaled deeply. That's great. When I want a cigarette, I don't want just any cigarette. Nor I, agreed the Gascon. Old kings is the only real cigarette when you're doing a real man's work. That's for sure. Sir Robert watched a smoke ring expand in the air. There was a sudden clash of arms off to their left. Sir Robert dropped his cigarette to the ground. The trouble is that doing a real he-man's work doesn't always allow you to enjoy the fine, rich tobaccos of old kings right down to the very end. No, but you can always light another later, said the Gascon knight. King Richard, on seeing his army moving suddenly toward the harassed rear, had realized the danger and had charged through the hospitallers to get into the thick of the fray. Now the Turks were charging down from the hills, hitting not the flank as he had expected, but the rear. Saladin had expected him to hold fast. Sir Robert and Sir Gaeton spurred their chargers toward the flapping banner of England. The fierce warrior king of England, his mighty sword in hand, was cutting down Turks as though they were grain stalks, but still the Saracen horde pressed on. More and more of the terrible Turks came boiling down out of the hills, their glittering scimitars swinging. Sir Robert lost all track of time. There was nothing to do but keep his own great broadsword moving, swinging like some gigantic metronome as he hacked down the Moslem foes. And then, suddenly, he found himself surrounded by the Saracens. He was isolated and alone, cut off from the rest of the Christian forces. He glanced quickly around as he slashed another Saracen from pate to breastbone. Where was Sir Gaeton? Where were the others? Where was the red and gold banner of Richard? He caught a glimpse of the fluttering banner far to the rear and started to fall back. And then he saw another knight nearby, a huge man who swung his sparkling blade with power and force. On his steel helm gleamed a golden coronet. Richard! And the great king, in spite of his prowess, was outnumbered heavily and would, within seconds, be cut down by the Saracen horde. Without hesitation, Sir Robert plunged his horse toward the surrounded monarch, his great blade cutting a path before him. He saw Richard go down, falling from the saddle of his charger, but by that time his own sword was cutting into the screaming Saracens and they had no time to attempt any further mischief to the king. They had their hands full with Sir Robert de Bouin. He did not know how long he fought there, holding his charger motionless over the inert body of the fallen king, hewing down the screaming enemy, but presently he heard the familiar cry of, For St. George and for England! behind him. The Norman and English troops were charging in, bringing with them the banner of England. And then Richard was on his feet, cleaving the air about him with his own broadsword. Its bright edge, besmeared with Saracen blood, was biting viciously into the foe. The Turks began to fall back. Within seconds the Christian knights were boiling around the embattled pair, forcing the Turks into retreat, and for the second time Sir Robert found himself with no one to fight. And then a voice was saying, you have done well this day, Sir Knight. Richard Plantagenet will not forget. Sir Robert turned in his saddle to face the smiling king. My lord king, be assured that I would never forget my loyalty to my sovereign and liege lord. My sword and my life are yours whenever you call. King Richard's gauntleted hand grasped his own. If it please God, I shall never ask your life. An earldom awaits you when we return to England, Sir Knight and then the king mounted his horse and was running full gallop after the retreating Saracens. Robert took off his helmet. 
He blinked for a second to adjust his eyes to the relative dimness of the studio. After the brightness of the desert that the televicarian helmet had projected into his eyes, the studio seemed strangely cave-like. "'How'd you like it, Bob?' asked one of the two producers of the show. Robert Bowen nodded briskly and patted the televike helmet. "'It was okay,' he said. "'Good show. A little talky at the beginning. And it needs a better fade-out. But the action scenes were fine. The sponsor ought to like it. For a while, at least.' "'What do you mean, for a while?' Robert Bowen sighed. If this thing goes on the air the way it is, he'll lose sales. Why, commercial not good enough? Too good. Man, I've smoked Old Kings, and believe me, the real thing never tasted as good as that cigarette did in the commercial. End of After a Few Words by Randall Garrett Recording by Nick Number And All the Earth a Grave by C. C. McApp. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lisa Hirschbach. And All the Earth a Grave by C. C. McApp. There's nothing wrong with dying. It just hasn't ever had the proper sales pitch. It all began when the new bookkeeping machine of a large Midwestern coffin manufacturer slipped a cog, or blew a transistor or something. It was fantastic that the error, one of two decimal places, should enjoy a straight run of OKs, human and mechanical, clear down the line. But when the figures clacked out at that last clacking out station, there it was. The figures were now sacred, immutable, and it is doubtful whether the president of the concern or the chairman of the board would have dared to question them, even if either of those two gentlemen had been in town. As for the advertising manager, the last thing he wanted to do was question them. He carried them, they were the budget for the coming fiscal year, into his office, staggering a little on the way, and dropped dazedly into his chair. They showed the budget for his own department as exactly 100 times what he'd been expecting. That is to say, 50 times what he'd put in for. When the initial shock began to wear off, his face assumed an expression of intense thought. In about five minutes, he leapt from his chair, dashed out of the office with a shouted syllable or two for his secretary, and got his car out of the parking lot. At home, he tossed his clothes into a traveling bag and barged towards the door, giving his wife a quick kiss and an equally quick explanation. He didn't bother to call the airport. He meant to be on the next plane east and no nonsense about it. With one thing and another, the economy hadn't been exactly in overdrive that year, and predictions for the Christmas season were gloomy. Early retail figures bore them out. Gift-buying dribbled along feebly until Thanksgiving, despite brave speeches by the administration. The holiday passed more in self-pity than in thankfulness among owners of gift-orientated businesses. Then, on Friday following Thanksgiving, the coffin ad struck. Struck may be too mild of a word. People on the streets saw feverishly working crews, at holiday rates, slapping up posters on billboards. The first poster was a dilly. A toothy and toothsome young woman leaning over a coffin she'd been unwrapping. She smiled, as if she had just received overtures of matrimony from an eighty-year-old billionaire. There was a Christmas tree in the background, and the coffin was appropriately wrapped. So was she. She looked as if she had just gotten out of bed, or were ready to get into it. For armorous young man, and some not so young, the message was plain. The motto? The gift that will last more than a lifetime seem hardly to the point. Those at home were assailed on TV with a variety of bright and clever skits of the same import. Some of them hinted that if the young lady's gratitude were really perceptuous, and the bedroom too far away, the coffin might be comfy. Of course, the more settled elements of the population were not neglected. For the older married man, there was the blow directly between the eyes. Do you want your widow to be half safe? And for the spinster, without immediate hopes, 
I dreamt I was caught dead without my virgin form casket. Newspapers, magazines, and every other medium added to the assault, never letting it cool. It was the most horrendous campaign for sheer concentration that had ever battered at the public mind. The public reeled, blinked, shook its head to clear it, gawked, and rushed out to buy. Christmas was not going to be a failure after all. Department store managers, who had grudgingly and under strong sales pressure made space for a single coffin somewhere at the rear of the store, now rushed to the telephones like touts with a direct pronouncement from a horse. Everyone who possibly could got into the act. Grocery supermarkets put in casket departments. The Association of Pharmaceutical Retailers, who felt they had some claim to priority, tried to get court injunctions to keep caskets out of service stations, but were unsuccessful because the judges were all out buying caskets. Beauty parlors showed real ingenuity in merchandising. Roads and streets clogged with delivery trucks, rented trailers, and whatever else could haul a coffin. The stock market went completely mad. Strikes were declared and settled within hours. Congress was called into session early. The president got authority to ration lumber and other materials suddenly in starvation short supply. State laws were passed against cremation under heavy lobby pressure. A new racket called box jacking blossomed overnight. The advertising manager who had put the thing over had been fighting with all the formidable weapons of his breed to make his plant managers build up a stockpile. They had, but went at it like a toupee in a wind tunnel. Competitive coffin manufacturers were caught napping, but by Wednesday, after Thanksgiving, they, along with the original one, were on a 24-hour, seven-day basis. Still only a fraction of the demand could be met. Jet passenger planes were stripped of their seats, supplied with Yankee gold, and sent to plunder the world of its coffins. It might be supposed that Christmas goods, other than caskets, would take a bad dumping. That was not so. Such was the upsurge of prosperity, and such was the shortage of coffins, that nearly everything, with a few exceptions, enjoyed the biggest season on record. On Christmas Eve, the frenzy slumped to a crawl, though on Christmas morning there were still optimists out there prowling the empty stores. The nation sat down to breathe, mostly sat on coffins, because there wasn't space in living rooms for any other furniture. There was hardly an individual in the United States who didn't have, in case of sudden sharp pains in the chest, several boxes to choose from. As for the rest of the world, it had better not die just now, or it would be literally a case of dust to dust. Of course, everyone expected a doozy of a slump after Christmas. But our advertising manager, who by now was of course sales manager and first vice president also, wasn't settling for any boom and bust. He'd been a frustrated victim of his choice of industries for so many years now. With his teeth in something, he was going to give it the old bite. He gave people a short breathing spell to arrange their coffin pavements and move the presents out of the front rooms. Then, late in January, his new campaign came down like a hundred megatonner. Within a week, everyone saw quite clearly that his Christmas models were now obsolete. The coffin became the new status symbol. The auto industry was, of course, demolished. Even people who had even had enough money to buy a new car weren't going to trade in the old one and let a new one stand out in the rain. The garages were full of coffins. Petroleum went along with autos, though there were those who whispered knowingly that the same people merely moved over into the new industry. It was noticeable that the center of it became Detroit. A few trucks and buses were still being built, but that was all. Some of the new caskets were true works of art. Others, well, there was a variety. Compact models appeared in which the occupant's feet were to be doubled up alongside his ears. One manufacturer pushed a circular model, claiming that by all the laws of nature, the fetal position was the only right one. At the other extreme were virtual houses, ornate and lavishly equipped. Possibly the largest of all was the togetherness model, triangular, with graduated recesses for father, mother, eight children, plus two playmates, and in the far corner beyond the baby, the cat. The slump was over. 
Still, economists swore that the new boom couldn't last either. They reckoned without the advertising manager, whose eyes gleamed brighter all the time. People already had coffins, which they polished and kept on display, sometimes in the new coffin ports being added to houses. The advertising manager's reasoning was direct and to the point. He must get people to use the coffins, and now he had all the money to work with that he could use. The new note was woven in so gradually that it's not easy to put a finger on any one ad and say, it began here. One of the first was surely the widely printed one, showing a tattooed, smiling young man with his chin thrust out manfully, lying in a coffin. He was rugged-looking and likable. Not too ruggy for the spindly limb to identify with. And he oozed, even though obviously dead, virility at every pore. He was probably the finest-looking corpse since Richard the Lionhearted. Neither must one overlook the singing commercials. Possibly the catchiest of these, a really cute little thing, was achieved by jazzing up the funeral march. It started gradually. And it was all so unviolent that few saw it as suicide. Teenagers began having popping off parties. Some of their elders protested a little, but adults were taking it up too. The tired, the unappreciated, the ill, and the heavy laden lay down in growing numbers and expired. A black market and poisons operated for a little while, but soon pinched out. Such was the pressure of persuasion that few needed artificial aids. The boxes were very comfortable. People just closed their eyes and exited smiling. The beatniks, who had their own models of coffin, moldy, scroungy, and without lids, since the beatniks insisted on being seen, placed their boxes on the Grant Avenue in San Francisco. They died with highly intellectual expressions, and eventually were washed by the gentle rain. Of course, there were voices shouting calamity. When aren't there? But in the long run, and not a very long one at that, they availed not. It isn't so hard to imagine the reactions of the rest of the world. So, let us imagine a few. The communist bloc immediately gave its stamp of disapproval, denouncing the movement as filthy capitalist imperialist pig plot. Red China, which had been squabbling with Russia for some time about a matter or method, screamed for immediate war. Russia exposed this as patent stupidity, saying that if the capitalist wanted to die, warring upon them would only help them. China surreptitiously tried out the thing as an answer to excess population and found it good. It also appealed to the well-known melancholy facet of Russian nature. Besides, after pondering for several days, the Red Bloc decided it could not afford to fall behind in anything, so it started its own program, explaining with much logic how it differed. An elderly British philosopher endorsed the movement, on the grounds that a temporary setback in evolution was preferable to facing up to anything. The Free Bloc, the Red Bloc, the Neutral Bloc, and some scraps as had been too obtruse to find themselves a bloc, were drawn into the whirlpool in an amazingly short time, if in a variety of ways. In less than two years, the world was rid of most of what had been bedeviling it. Oddly enough, the country where the movement began was the last to succumb to completely. Or perhaps it is not so odd, coffin maker to the world, the American casket industry had by now almost completely automated box making and grave digging with some interesting assembly lines and packaging arrangements, there still remained the jobs of management and distribution. The president of General Mortuary, any bullient fellow, affectionately called Sarcophagus Sam, put it well. <clears throat> as long as I have a single prospective customer and a single stockholder, he said, mangling a stoogie and beetling his brows at the one reporter who showed up for the press conference. I'll try and put him in a coffin so I can pay him a dividend. Finally, though, a man who thought he must be the last living human, 
wandered contentedly about the city of Denver, looking for the coffin he liked best. He settled at last upon a rich mahogany number with platinum trimmings, an automatic, self-adjusting, cadaver contour, interspring, wherever, plastic-covered mattress with a built-in bar. He climbed in, drew himself a generous slug of fine scotch, giggled as the mattress prodded at him exploringly, closed his eyes, and sighed in solid comfort. Soft music played as the lid closed itself. From a building nearby, a turkey buzzard swooped down, cawing in a raucous anger because it had let its attention wander for a moment. It was too late. It clawed screaming at the solid cover, hissing in frustration, and finally gave up. It flapped into the air again, still grumbling. It was tired of living on dead small rodents and coyotes. It thought it would take a swing over to Los Angeles, where the pickings were pretty good. As it moved westward over parched hills, it espied two black dots a few miles to its left. It circled over for a closer look, then grunted and went on its way. It had seen them before. The old prospector and his bureau had been out in the mountains for so long the buzzard had concluded they didn't know how to die. The prospector, whose name was Adams, trudged behind his burrow towards the buildings that simmered in the heat, humming to himself now and then, or addressing some remark to the beast. When he reached the outskirts of Denver, he realized something was amiss. He stood and gazed at the quiet sing. Nothing moved except some skinny pack rats and a few sparrows foraging for grain among the unburied coffins. Tarnation! he said to the burrow. Martians? A half-buried piece of newspaper fluttered in the breeze. He walked forward slowly and picked it up. It told him enough so that he understood. They're gone, Evie, he said to the burrow. All gone. He put his arm affectionately around her neck. I reckon it's up to me and you again. We gotta start all over. He stood back and gazed at her with mild approach. I sure hope they don't favor your side of the house so much this time. C.C. McApp The End of And All the Earth a Grave By C.C. McApp Recording by Lisa Hirschbach Big Lake, Alaska Bramble Bush by Randall Garrett. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nick Number. The Bramble Bush by Randall Garrett. There was a man in our town, and he was wondrous wise. He jumped into a bramble bush and scratched out both his eyes. Old Nursery Rhyme. Peter de Hoek was dreaming that the moon had blown up when he awakened. The room was dark except for the glowing nightlight near the door, and he sat up trying to separate the dream from reality. He focused his eyes on the glow plate. What had wakened him? Something had, he was sure, but there didn't seem to be anything out of the ordinary now. The explosion in his dream had seemed extraordinarily realistic. He could still remember vividly the vibration and the crump of the noise but there was no sign of what might have caused the dream sequence. Maybe something fell, he thought. He swung his legs off his bed and padded barefoot over to the light switch. He was so used to walking under the light lunar gravity that he was no longer conscious of it. He pressed the switch and the room was suddenly flooded with light. He looked around. Everything was in place, apparently. There was nothing on the floor that shouldn't be there. The books were all in their places in the bookshelf. The stuff on his desk seemed undisturbed. The only thing that wasn't as it should be was the picture on the wall. It was a reproduction of a painting by Peter de Hoek, which he had always liked, aside from the fact that he had been named after the seventeenth-century Dutch artist. The picture was slightly askew on the wall. He was sleepily trying to figure out the significance of that when the phone sounded. He walked over and picked it up. Yeah? Guz? Guz? Get over here, quick! Sam Willow's voice came excitedly from the instrument. "'What's the matter, puss?' he asked blearily. 
Number two just blew. We need help, Guz. Fast. I'm on my way, DeHoke said. Take C corridor, Willows warned. A and B caved in and the bulkheads have dropped. Make it snappy. I'm gone already, DeHoke said, dropping the phone back into place. He grabbed his vacuum suit from its hanger and got into it as though his own room had already sprung an air leak. Number two is blown, he thought. That would be the one that Ferguson and Meddy were working on. What had they been cooking? He couldn't remember right off the bat. Something touchy, he thought. Something pretty hot. But that wouldn't cause an atomic reactor to blow. It obviously hadn't been a nuclear blow-up of any proportions, or he wouldn't be here now, zipping up the front of his vac suit. Still, it had been powerful enough to shake the lunar crust a little, or he wouldn't have been wakened by the blast. These new reactors could get out a lot more power, and they could do a lot more than the old ones could, but they weren't as safe as the old heavy metal reactors by a long shot. None had blown up yet, quite, but there was still the chance. That's why they were built on Luna instead of on Earth. Considering what they could do, de Hoke often felt that it would be safer if they were built out on some nice safe asteroid, preferably one in the Jovian Trojan sector. He clamped his fishbowl on tight, opened the door, and sprinted toward Corridor C. The trouble with the Ditmars Horst reactor was that it lacked any automatic negative feedback system. If a DH decided to go wild, it went wild. Fortunately, that rarely happened. The safe limits for reactions were quite wide, wider usually than the reaction limits themselves, so that there was always a margin of safety, and within the limits a nicety of control existed that made nucleonics almost an esoteric branch of chemistry. Cookbook chemistry, practically. Want deuterium? Recipe. To 1.00813 grams purest hydrogen 1, add, slowly and with care, 1.00896 grams fine-grade neutrons. Cook until well done in a Ditmars Horst reactor. Yield, 2.01471 grams rare old deuterium, plus some 2 million 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 ergs of raw energy. Now you are cooking with gas. All you had to do was keep the reaction going at a slow enough rate so that the energy could be bled off and there was nothing to worry about usually. But control of the feebleizer field still wasn't perfect because the fields that enfeebled the reactions and made them easy to control weren't yet too well understood. Peter de Hoke turned into Corridor C and kept on running. There was plenty of air still in this corridor and there was apparently little likelihood of his needing his vac suit, but on the moon nobody responds to an emergency call without a vac suit. He was troubled about corridors A and B. The explosion must have been pretty violent to have sealed off two of the four corridors leading from the living quarters to the reaction labs. Two corridors went directly to one of the reactors, two went directly to the second. Two more connected the reactor labs themselves, putting the labs and the living quarters at the corners of an equilateral triangle. Peter had never been able to figure out why A and B corridors led to reactor 2, while C and D led to reactor 1. Logically, he thought it should have been the other way around. Oh well. Going down C meant that he'd have to get to Reactor 2 the long way around. What had the damage been, he asked himself. Had anyone been hurt? Or killed? He pushed the questions out of his mind. There was no point in speculating. He'd have the information soon enough. He took the cut off to the left at a sixty-degree angle to Corridor C, which led him directly to Corridor E, bypassing Reactor 1. He noticed as he went by that the operations lamp was out. Nobody was working with Reactor 1. As he pounded on down the empty corridor, he suddenly realized that he hadn't seen anyone else running with him. There were five other men in the reactor station, and, so far, he had seen no one. He knew where Willows was, but where were Ferguson, Meddy, Laynard, and Quillen? He pushed those questions out of his mind, too, for the time being. A head popped out of the door at the far end of the corridor. Guz! Hurry, Guz! De Hoke didn't bother to answer Willows. He was short of breath as it was. He knew, besides, that no answer was expected. He had known Willows for years and knew how he thought. It was Willows who had first tagged a hoke with that silly nickname, Guzzle, not because Peter was such a heavy drinker, although he could hold it like a gentleman, but because he had thought Guzzle de Hoke was so uproariously funny. Nobody likes a Guzzle as well as de Hoke, he'd say, with an idiot grin. As a result, everybody called Peter Guz now. The head had vanished back into the control room of Reactor 2. De Hoke kept on running, his breath rasping loudly in the confines of the fishbowl helmet. Running four hundred yards isn't the easiest thing in the world, even if a man is in good physical condition. There was less weight to contend with, but the mass that had to be pushed along remained the same. The notion that running on Luna was an effortless breeze was one that only earth-huggers clung to. He ran into the control room and stopped, panting heavily. What happened? 
Sam Willow's normally handsome face looked drawn. Something went wrong. I don't know what. I was finishing up with Reactor 1 when I heard the explosion. They are both, he gestured toward the reactor, both in there. Still alive? I think so. One of them, anyway. Take a look. De Hoek went over to the periscope and put his eyes to the binoculars. He could see two figures in heavy, dull-gray, radiation-proof suits. They were lying flat on the floor, and neither was moving. De Hoek said as much. The one on the left was moving his arm, just a little, Willow said. I'll swear he was. Something in the man's voice made De Hoek turn his head away from the periscope's eyepieces. Willow's face was gray, and a thin film of greasy perspiration reflected the light from the overhead plates. The man was on the verge of panic. Calm down, puss, De Hoek said gently. Where's Quillen and Leonard? They're in their rooms, Willow said in a tight voice. Trapped. The bulkheads have closed them off in A. No air in the corridor. We'll have to dig them out. I called them both on the phone. They're all right, but they're trapped. Did you call base? Yes, they haven't got a ship. They sent three mooncats, though. They ought to be here by morning. De Hoek looked up at the chronometer on the wall. O one twelve Greenwich time. Morning meant any time between eight and noon. The position of the sun up on the surface had nothing to do with lunar time. As a matter of fact, there was a full earth shining at the moment, which meant that it wouldn't be dawn on the surface for a week yet. If the cats from base get here by noon, we'll be okay, won't we? De Hoek asked. Look at the instruments, Willow said. De Hoek ran a practiced eye over the console and swallowed. What were they running? Mercury 203, Willow said. Half-life 46.5 days. Beta and gamma emitter. Converts to thallium-203. Stable. What did they want with a kilogram of the stuff? Special order. Shipment to Earth for some reason. Have you checked the endpoint? She's building up fast. No, no, I haven't. He wet his lips with the tip of his tongue. Check it, said De Hoek. Do any of the controls work? I don't know. I didn't want to fiddle with them. You start giving them a rundown. I'm going to get into a suit and go pull those two out of there, if they're still alive. He opened the locker and took his radiation-proof suit out. He checked it over carefully and began shucking his vac suit. A few minutes' delay in getting to the men in the reactor's anteroom didn't matter much. If they hadn't been killed outright and were still alive, they would probably live a good deal longer. The shells of the radiation suits didn't look damaged, and the instruments indicated very little radiation in the room. Whatever it was that had exploded had done most of its damage at the other end of the reactor. Evidently a fissure had been opened to the surface, forty feet above. A fissure big enough to let all the air out of A and B corridors and activate the automatic bulkheads to seal off the airless section. What troubled him was Willows. If he hadn't known the man so well, De Hoke would have verbally blasted him where he stood. His reaction to trouble had been typical. De Hoke had already seen Willows in trouble three times, and each time the reaction had been the same, near panic. Every time his first thought had been to scream for help rather than to do anything himself. Almost anyone else would have made one call and then climbed into a radiation suit to get Ferguson and Metty out of the anteroom. There was certainly no apparent immediate danger, but all that Willows had done was yell for someone to come and do his thinking and acting for him. He had called Bass, he had called De Hoke, he had called Quillen and Leonard, but he hadn't done anything else. Now he had to be handled with kid gloves. If De Hoke didn't act calm, if he didn't go about things just right, Willows might very likely go over the line into total panic. As long as he had someone to depend on, he'd be all right, and De Hoke didn't want to lose the only help he had right now. Fermium 256, said Willows in a tight, flat voice. What? De Hoke asked calmly. Fermium 256, Willows repeated. That's what the stuff is going to start building towards. Spontaneous fission. Half-life of three hours. He took a deep breath. The reactor won't be able to contain it. We haven't got that kind of bleed-off control. No, De Hoke agreed. I suggest we stop it. The freezer control isn't functioning, Willows said. I guess that's what they went in there to correct. I doubt it, De Hoke said carefully. They wouldn't have needed suits for that. They must have had something else bothering them. I'd be willing to bet they went in to pull a sample and something went wrong. Why? What makes you think so? If there had been trouble, they'd have called for someone to stay here at the console. Both of them wouldn't have gone in if there was any trouble. Yeah, yeah, I guess you're right. He looked visibly relieved. What do you suppose went wrong? Look at your meters. Four of them aren't registering. Willows looked. I hadn't noticed. I thought they were just registering low. 
You're right, though. Yeah, you're right. The surface bleed off. Hydrogen loss. Blew a valve is all. Yeah. He grinned a little. Must have been quite a volcano for a second or two. De Hoke grinned back at him. Yeah, must have. Give me a hand with these clamps. Willows began fastening the clamps on the heavy suit. Do you think Ferguson and Meddy are okay, Guz? he asked. De Hoke noticed it was the first time he had used the names of the two men. Now that there was a chance that they were alive, at least in his own mind, he was willing to admit that they were men he knew. Willows didn't want to think that anyone he knew had done such a terrible thing as die. It hit too close to home. The man wasn't thinking. He was willing to grasp at anything that offered him a chance. Dream straws. The idea was to keep him busy, keep his mind on trivia, keep him from thinking about what was going on inside that reactor. He should have known automatically that it was building toward Fermium-256. It was the most logical, easiest, and simplest way for a DH reactor to go off the deep end. A Ditmars horst reactor took advantage of the fact that any number can be expressed as a sum of powers of two, and the number of nucleons in an atomic nucleus was no exception to that mathematical rule. Building atoms by adding nucleons wasn't as simple as putting marbles in a bag because of the energy differential, but the energy derived from the fusion of the elements lighter than iron-56 could be compensated for by using it to pack the nuclei heavier than that. The trick was to find a chain of reactions that gave the least necessary energy transfer. The method by which the reactions were carried out might have driven a mid-twentieth century physicist a trifle gaga, but most of the reactions themselves would have been recognizable. There were several possible reactions which Ferguson and Meddy could have used to produce HG203, but de Hoke was fairly sure he knew which one it was. The five-branch double alpha addition scheme was the one that was easiest to use, and it was the only one that started the damnable doubling chain reaction where the nuclear weights went up exponentially under the influence of the peculiar conditions within the reactor. 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256... Hydrogen-2 and helium-4 were stable, so were oxygen-16 and sulfur-32. The reaction encountered a sticky spot at beryllium-8, which is highly unstable, with a half-life of 10 to the minus 16th seconds, spontaneously fissioning back into two helium-4 nuclei. Past sulfur-32 there was a lot of positron emission as the nuclei fought to increase the number of neutrons to maintain a stable balance. Germanium-64 is not at all stable, and neither is neodymium-128, but the instability can be corrected by positive beta emission. When two nuclei of the resulting xenon-128 are forced together, the positron emission begins long before the coalescence is complete, resulting in fermium-256. But not even a ditmars horst reactor can stand the next step, because matter itself won't stand it, not even in a DH reactor. The trouble is that a DH reactor tries. Mathematically, it was assumed that the resulting nucleus did exist, for an infinitesimal instant of time. Literally, mathematically, infinitesimal. So close to zero that it would be utterly impossible to measure it. Someone had dubbed the hypothetical stuff Instantanium 512. Whether Instantanium 512 had any real existence is an argument for philosophers only. The results, in any case, were catastrophic. The whole conglomeration came apart in a grand splatter of neutrons, protons, negatrons, positrons, electrons, neutrinos, a whole slew of Greek-lettered mesons of various charges and masses, and a fine collection of strange and ultra-strange particles. Energy? Just oodles and gobs. Peter de Hoke had heard about the results. He had no desire to experience them firsthand. Fortunately, the reaction that led up to them took time. It could be stopped at any time up to the FM-256 stage. According to the instruments, that wouldn't be for another six hours yet, so there was nothing at all to worry about. Even after that it could be stopped, provided one had a way to get rid of the violently fissioning fermium. "'Connections okay?' Willows asked. His voice came over the earphones inside the ponderous helmet of the radiation suit. "'Fine,' said de Hoke. He adjusted the double periscope so that his vision was clear. Perfect. He tested the controls, moving his arms and legs to see if the suit responded. The suit was so heavy that, without powered joints controlled by servo mechanisms, he would have been unable to move, even under lunar gravity. With the power on, though, it was no harder than walking underwater in a diving suit. All's well, puss, he said. I'll keep an eye on you, said Willows. Fine. Well, here goes Colossus to Hoke. He began walking toward the door that led into the corridor which connected the reactor anteroom to the control room. It took time to drag the two inert figures out of the anteroom. 
All de Hoke could do was grab them under the armpits, apply power, and drag them out. He went out the same way he had come in, traversing the separate chambers in reverse order. First came the decontamination chamber, where the radioactive dust that might have settled on the suits was sluiced off by the detergent sprays. When the radiation detectors registered low enough, de Hoke dragged Ferguson into the outer chamber, then went back and got Meddy and put him through the same process. Then he dragged them on into the control room so that Willows could get them out of the heavy suits. "'Can you help me, Guz?' Willows asked. It was obvious that he didn't want to open the suits. He didn't want to see what might be inside. De Hoke helped him. They were both alive but unconscious. Bones had been broken, and Meddy appeared to be suffering from concussion. They were badly damaged, but they'd live. De Hoke and Willows made two trips down E and C corridors, carrying the men on a stretcher to get them in bed. De Hoke splinted the broken bones as best he could and gave each of them a shot of narcodyne. He had to do the medical work because Quillen, the medic, was trapped in Corridor A. He called Quillen on the phone to tell him what had happened. He described the signs and symptoms of the victims as best he could, and then did what Quillen told him to do. They ought to be all right, Quillen said. With that dope in them, they'll be out cold for the next twelve hours, and by that time, the boys from base will be here. Just leave them alone and don't move them anymore. Right, I'll call you back later. Right now, Puss and I are going to see what's wrong with the control linkages on number two. Right. Bio. De Hoke and Willows walked back to the control room of number two reactor in silence. Once inside the control room, De Hoke said, How are those control circuits? Willows was supposed to have been checking them while he'd been dragging Ferguson and Meddy out of the antechamber. Well, I... I'm not sure. I'll show you what I've found so far, Guz. You ought to take a look at them. I... I'd like you to take a look-see. I think... He gestured toward the console. I think they're all right, except for the freezer vernier and the pressure release control. He doesn't trust his own work, De Hoke thought. Well, that's all right. Neither do I. Painstakingly, the two of them went over the checking circuits. Willows was right. The freezer and pressure controls were inoperable. Damn, said De Hoke. Double damn. They're probably both stuck at the firewall, Willows said. Sure, where else? I'll have to go in there and unstick them. Help me get back into that two-legged tank again. He wished he knew more about what Ferguson and Meddy had been doing. He wished he knew why the two men had gone into the anteroom in the first place. He wished a lot of things, but wishing was a useless pastime at this stage of the game. If only one of the two men had been in a condition to talk. He got back into his radiation-proof suit again, took one last look at the instruments on the console, and headed for the reactor. Through the first radiation trap, left turn, right turn, right turn, left turn, through the cold room, through the second radiation trap, through the decontamination chamber, and through the third radiation trap into the anteroom. Now that Ferguson and Meddy were safely out of the way, he could give his attention to the damage that had been done. Had Ferguson and Meddy actually come in to tap off a sample as he had suggested to Willows? He looked around at the wreckage in the antechamber. Quite obviously, the heavy door of the sample chamber was wide open, and it certainly appeared that the wreckage was scattered from that point. Cautiously, he went over to look at the open sample chamber. It looked all right, except that the bottom was covered with a bright, metallic dust. He rubbed his finger over it and looked at the fingertip. A very fine dust, and yet it hadn't been scattered very much by the explosion. Heavy. Very likely osmium. Osmium-187 was stable, but it wasn't a normally used step toward Mercury-203. Four successive alpha captures would give Polonium-203, not Mercury. Ditto for an oxygen fusion. It could be Iridium or Platinum, of course. Whatever it was, the instruments in his helmet told him it wasn't hot. He had a hunch that Ferguson and Meddy had been building Mercury-203 from Hafnium-179 by the process of successive fusions with Hydrogen-3, and that something had gone wrong with the H-3 production. It appeared that the explosion had been a simple chemical blast caused by the air oxidation of H-2, but the bleeder vent at the other end of the reactor had apparently kicked at the same time. An enormous amount of unused energy had been released, blowing the entire emergency bleeder system out. Something didn't seem right. Something stuck in his craw, and he couldn't figure out what it was. He opened up the conduit boxes that led through the antechamber from the control console to the reactor beyond the firewall. Everything looked fine. That meant that whatever it was that had fouled up the controls was on the other side of the firewall. How does it look? Willow's voice came worriedly over the earphones. Have I already said damn? De Hoke asked. You have, Willow said with forced lightness. 
You even said double damn. Factorial damn, then, said de Hoke. What's the matter? Apparently the foul-up is on the other side of the firewall. Are you going in? I'll have to. All right, watch yourself. I will. He went over to the periscope that surveyed the part of the reactor beyond the firewall. Everything looked normal enough. He carefully checked the pressure gauge. Normal. Check the spectro for me, will you? he asked. Make sure that's just the normal helium atmosphere in there. Sure. A pause. Nothing but helium, Guz. What were you expecting? I don't think I'd care to walk into a hydrogen atmosphere at 300 centigrade. Neither would I, but how could there be hydrogen in there? There shouldn't be, but there's something screwy going on here and I can't put my finger on it. Well, whatever it is, it isn't hydrogen in the reactor room. Okay, stand by, I'm going in. He walked over to the firewall door. On the other side of it was a small chamber where the oxygen and nitrogen of normal air would be swept out before he opened the inner door to go into the inner chamber itself. There was no need for an airlock, since small amounts of impurities in the HE-4 didn't bother anything. It was just as he turned the lever that undogged the firewall door that he realized his mistake. But it was too late. The door jerked outward and a hot wind picked him up and slammed him against the far wall. There was a moment of pain. Then, nothing. There was something familiar about the man who was turning the wheel, but de Hoke couldn't place it. The man was wearing a black hood, as befitted a torturer and executioner. "'Idiot!' said the hooded man, giving the wheel of the rack a little more pressure. "'Explain the following. If a half plus a half is equal to a whole, why is hafnium plus hafnium not equal to holmium?' Stretched as he was on the rack, de Hoke could not think straight because of the excruciating pain. "'Because a half is 8.28 percent heavier than a whole,' said de Hoke. "'You are an idiot nonetheless,' said the torturer. He gave the wheel another twist. De Hoke wanted to scream, but he couldn't. "'Try again,' said the torturer. "'What is a half plus four plus four plus four plus four plus—' "'Stop!' screamed de Hoke. "'Stop! Stop at the osmium!' "'Ah, but it didn't stop at the osmium,' said the hooded man. "'It went on and on and on. "'Plus four, plus four, plus four, plus four, plus four, "'until there were so many plus fours in there "'that the place looked like an old-fashioned golf course.' "'My legs hurt,' said de Hoke. "'The man was no longer wearing a hood, "'but de Hoke couldn't tell if it was Willows or himself. "'We will all go together when we go,' said the man. "'De Hoke turned his head away and looked at the ceiling.' and he realized that it was the ceiling of the antechamber. "'My legs hurt,' he repeated, and he could hear the hoarse whisper inside the helmet. He realized that he was lying flat on his back. He had been jarred around quite a bit in the suit. He wondered if he could sit up. He managed to get both arms behind him and push himself into a sitting position. He wiggled his feet. The servos responded. He hurt all over, but a little experiment told him that he was only bruised. Nothing was broken. He hadn't been hit as hard as Ferguson and Meddy had been. "'Willows?' he said. "'Willows?' There was no answer from the earphones. He looked at the chronometer dial inside his helmet. O two forty nine. He had been unconscious less than ten minutes. The same glance brought his eyes to two other dials. The internal radiation of the suit was a little high, but nothing to worry about. But the dial registering the external radiation was plenty high. Without the protection of the suit, he wouldn't have lived through those ten minutes. Where was Willows? And then he knew, and he pushed any thought of further help from that quarter out of his mind. What had to be done would have to be done by Peter de Hoke alone. He climbed to his feet. His head hurt, and he swayed with nausea and pain. Only the massive weight of the suit's shoes kept him upright. Then it passed, and he blinked his eyes and shook his head to clear it. He found he was holding his breath, and he let it out. The trouble had been so simple, and yet he hadn't seen it. Oh, yes he had. He must have, subconsciously. Otherwise, how would he have guessed that the stuff in the sampling chamber was osmium-187? Ferguson and Meddy had been trying to make mercury-203 by adding eight successive tritium nuclei to hafnium-179, progressing through tantalum-182, tungsten-185, rhenium-188, osmium-191, iridium-194, platinum-197, and gold-200, all of which were unstable. But the hydrogen-3 reaction had gone wrong. The doubling had set in, producing helium-4. Successive additions of the alpha particles to hafnium-179 had produced first tungsten-183 and then osmium-187, both of which were stable. 
Ferguson and Metty, seeing that something was wrong, drew off a sample and then reset the reaction to produce the HG203 they wanted. Then they had come down to pick up the sample. They hadn't realized that the helium production had gone wild. Much more helium than necessary was being produced, and the bleeder valve had failed. When they opened the sample chamber, they got a blast of high-pressure helium right in the face. The shock of that sudden release had jarred the whole atmosphere inside the reaction chamber, and the bleeder valve had let go. But the violence of the pressure release had caused a fault to the surface to open up and had closed the valve again, jammed it, probably. There had been enough pressure left in there to blow de Hoke up against the nearest wall when he opened the door. Since the pressure indicator system was connected to the release system, when one had failed, the other had failed. That's why the pressure gauge had indicated normal. And, of course, it had been the pressure differential that had caused the controls to stick. Well, they ought to be all right now, then. He decided he'd better take a look. The firewall door was still open. He walked over to it and stepped into the smaller chamber that led to the inner reactor room. The inside door, much weaker than the outer firewall door, had been blown off its hinges. He stepped past it and went on in. What he saw made him jerk his glance away from the periscope in his helmet and check his radiation detectors again. Not much change. Relief swept over him as he looked back at the reactor itself. The normally dead black walls were glowing a dull red. It was pure thermal heat, but it shouldn't be doing that. Moving quickly, he went over to the place where the control cables came in through the firewall. It took him several minutes to assure himself that they would function from the control room now. There was nothing more to do but get out of here and get that reaction damped. He went out again, closing the firewall door behind him and dogging it tight. There would be no more helium production now. He went through the radiation trap to the decontamination chamber to wash off whatever it was he had picked up. The decontamination room was a mess. De Hoke stared at the twisted pipes and the stream of water that gushed out of a cracked valve. The blast had jarred everything loose. Well, he could still scrub himself off. Except that the scrubbers weren't working. He swore under his breath and twisted the valve that was supposed to dispense detergent. It did, thank heaven. He doused himself good with it and then got under the flowing water. The radiation level remained exactly where it was. He walked over and pulled one of the brushes off the defunct scrubber and sudsed it up. It wasn't until he started to use it that he got a good look at his arms. He hadn't paid any attention before. He walked over to the mirror to get a good look. You look magnificent, he told his reflection acidly. The radiation-proof armor looked as though it had been chrome-plated. But de Hoke knew better than that. He knew exactly what had happened. He was nicely plated all over with a film of mercury, which had amalgamated itself with the metallic surface of the suit. He was thoroughly wet with the stuff, and no amount of water and detergent would take it off. There was something wrong with number two reactor, all right. It had leaked out some of the mercury 203 that Ferguson and Metty had been making. He thought a minute. It hadn't been leaking out just before he opened the door in the firewall, because Willows would certainly have noticed the bright mercury line when he checked with the spectroscope. The stuff must have been released when the pressure dropped. He walked back to the anteroom and looked at the sampling chamber. There were a few droplets of mercury around the inlet. Thus far, the three pressure explosions had wrecked about everything that was wreckable, he thought. No, not quite. There was still the chance that the whole station would go if he didn't get back into the control room and stop that Powers of Two chain. The detonation of Instantanium 512 would finish the job by doing what high-pressure helium could never do. He glanced at the thermometer. The temperature behind the firewall had risen to 240 centigrade. It wasn't supposed to be above 200. It wasn't too serious, really, because a little heat like that wouldn't bother a Ditmar's Horst reactor, but it indicated that things back there weren't working properly. He turned away and walked back to the decontamination chamber. There must be some way he could get the mercury off the suit, because he couldn't take the suit off until the mercury was gone. First, he tried scrubbing. That was what showed him how upset he really was. He had actually scrubbed the armor on his left arm free of mercury when he realized what he was doing and threw the brush down in disgust. Use your head, de Hoke, he told himself. What good would it do to scrub the stuff off of the few places he could reach? In the bulky armor, he was worse than muscle-bound. He couldn't touch any part of his back. He couldn't bend far enough to touch his legs. His shoulders were inaccessible, even. Scrubbing was worse than useless. It was time-wasting. He picked up the brush again and began scrubbing at the other arm. It gave him something to do while he thought. While he was thinking, he wasn't wasting time. What would dissolve mercury? Nitric acid. Good old HNO3. Fine. 
except that the hot lab was at the other end of the reactor, where the fissure had let all the air out. The bulkheads had dropped and he couldn't get in, and, naturally, the nitric acid would be in the lab. For the first time he found himself hating Willow's guts. If he were around, he could get some acid from the cold lab, or even from the other hot lab at number one. If Willow's... He stood up and dropped the brush. Dolt, boob, moron, idiot. Not Willow's, himself. There was no reason on Earth, or Luna, why he couldn't walk over to number one hot lab and get the stuff himself. The habit of never leaving the lab without thorough decontamination was so thoroughly ingrained in him that he had simply never thought about it until that moment. But what did a little contamination with radioactive mercury mean at a time like this? He could take F corridor to number one, use the decontamination chamber and the acid from the lab, shuck off his armor there, and come back through E corridor. F could be cleaned up later. So simple. He went through the light trap to the next chamber and turned the handle on the sliding door. The door wouldn't budge. It had been warped by the force of the helium blast, and it was stuck in its grooves. Well, there were tools. The thing could be unstuck. Peter de Hoke was a determined man, a strong man, and a smart man, but the door was more determined and stronger than he was, and his intelligence didn't give him much of an edge right then. After an hour's hard work he managed to get the door open about eighteen inches, then it froze fast and refused to move again. All the power and leverage he could bring to bear was useless. The door had opened all it was going to open. Beyond it he could see the next radiation trap, and freedom. Eighteen inches would have been plenty of space for him to get through if he had not been wearing the radiation-proof suit, but he didn't dare take that suit off. By the time he got out of the suit, the intensely radioactive mercury on its surface would have made his death only a matter of time, and not much time at that. He told himself that if it were simply a matter of running to the control room to shut off the D.H. reactor, he'd do it. That could have been done before he lost consciousness, but it wasn't that easy. Damping the reaction took time and control. The stuff had to be eased back slowly. Shutting off the Ditmar's horse would simply blow a hole in the crust of Luna and kill everyone if he did it now. There were four or five men out there who would die if he pulled anything foolish like that. The explosion wouldn't be as powerful as the instantanium 512 reaction would be, but it would be nonetheless deadly for all that. There had to be either a way to scrape the mercury off the suit or a way to open the door another six inches. Or, he added suddenly, a way to get safely out of the suit. At the end of another twenty minutes he had still thought of nothing. He wandered around the decontamination room, looking at everything, hoping he might see something that would give him a clue. He didn't. He went into the antechamber of the reactor and glared at the door in the firewall. The instruments said that things were getting pretty fierce on the other side of that wall. Temperature, 295, and still rising. Pressure? He carefully cracked the inlet of the sampling chamber and got a soft hiss. The helium was expanding from the heat, that was all. Part of the trouble with the reactor, he thought, was the high percentage of oxygen and nitrogen that had mixed in during the ten minutes or so that the door was open. All hell was fixing to bust loose in there, and he, Peter de Hoke, was right next to it. He walked back into the decontamination chamber. What would dissolve mercury? Mercury would dissolve gold. Would gold dissolve mercury? Very funny. He was like a turtle, de Hoke thought, perfectly safe as long as he was in his shell, but take him out of it and he would die. Hell of a way to spend the night, he thought, a knight in shining armor. That struck him as funny. He began to laugh and laugh. He almost laughed himself sick before he realized that it was fear and despair that were driving him into hysteria, not a sense of humor. He forced himself to calmness. He must be calm. He must think. Yes. How do you go about getting rid of a radioactive metal that is in effect welded to the outside of your suit? The trouble was he was a nucleonics engineer, not a chemist. He remembered quite a bit of his chemistry, of course, but not as much as he would have liked. Could the stuff be neutralized? Sure, he told himself. Very simple. All he had to do was go climb into the reactor and let the reactor do the job. Mercury-203 plus an alpha particle gives nice stable lead-207. Just go climb right into the Ditmar's horst and let the helium-4 do the job. But the thought stuck in his mind. He kept telling himself not to panic as Willows had done. And several minutes later, chuckling to himself in a half-demented fashion, he opened the firewall door and went in to let the helium do the job. It was nearly eight in the morning, Greenwich time, when the three surface vehicles, with their wide caterpillar treads, lumbered to a halt near the kiosk that marked the entrance to the underground site of the laboratories. 
Okay, said one of the men in the first machine, holding a microphone to his lips. Let's go in. If what Willow said is true, the whole place may blow any minute now, but I'm not asking for volunteers. Nobody will be any safer up here than they will down there, and we have to do a job. Besides, Willow's wasn't completely rational. Nobody would put on a vac suit and run away like that if he was in his right mind, so we can discount a lot of what he said when we picked him up on the road. The five of us in this car are going straight to number one reactor to see what can be done to stop whatever is going on. The rest of you start trying to see if you can get those trapped men out of A and B corridors. All right, let's move in. Less than five minutes later, five men went into the control room of number one reactor. They found Peter de Hoek sound asleep in the control chair, and the instruments showed that the Ditmar's horst reactor was inactive. One of the men shook de Hoek gently, awakening him in the middle of a snore. What? he said groggily. We're here, Guz. Everything's okay. Sure, everything's okay. Nothing to it. All I did was wait until the temperature got above 357 centigrade, above the boiling point of mercury. Then I went in and let the hot helium boil the stuff off me. Nothing to it. Near boiled myself alive, but it did the trick. What? asked the man in a puzzled voice. Are you talking about? I am a knight in dull armor, said Peter de Hoek, dozing off again. Then he roused himself a little and said, without opening his eyes, Hi-yo, Quicksilver, away! And he was sound asleep again. And when he saw what he had done, with all his might and main, he jumped back in that bramble bush and scratched them in again. End of The Bramble Bush by Randall Garrett Recording by Nick Number by Ambrose Bierce. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. The Damned Thing by Ambrose Bierce By the light of a tallow candle, which had been placed on one end of a rough table, a man was reading something written in a book. It was an old account book, greatly worn. It's not apparently very legible, for the man sometimes held the page close to the flame of the candle to get a stronger light upon it. The shadow of the book would then throw into obscurity a half of the room, darkening a number of faces and figures. For besides the reader, eight other men were present. Seven of them sat against the rough log walls, silent and motionless, and the room being small, not very far from the table. By extending an arm, any one of them could have touched the eighth man, who lay on the table, face upward, partly covered by a sheet, his arms at his sides. He was dead. The man with the book was not reading aloud, and no one spoke. All seemed to be waiting for something to occur. The dead man only was without expectation. From the blank darkness outside came in through the aperture that served for a window all the ever unfamiliar noises of night in the wilderness, the long nameless note of a distant coyote, the stilly pulsing thrill of tireless insects in trees, strange cries of night birds, so different from those of birds of day, the drone of great blundering beetles, and all that mysterious chorus of small sounds that seem always to have been but half heard when they have suddenly ceased, as if conscious of an indiscretion. But nothing of all this was noted in that company. Its members were not overmuch addicted to idle interest in matters of no practical importance. That was obvious in every line of their rugged faces, obvious even in the dim light of the single candle. They were evidently men of the vicinity, farmers and woodmen. The person reading was a trifle different. One would have said of him that he was of the world, worldly, albeit there was that in his attire which attested a certain fellowship with the organisms of his environment. His coat would hardly have passed muster in San Francisco. His footgear was not of urban origin, and the hat that lay by him on the floor, he was the only one uncovered, was such that if one had considered it as an article of mere personal adornment, he would have missed its meaning. In countenance, the man was rather prepossessing, with just a hint of sternness, though that he may have assumed or cultivated as appropriate to one in authority, for he was a coroner. It was by virtue of his office that he had possession of the book in which he was reading. It had been found among the man's effects in his cabin, where the inquest was now taking place. When the coroner had finished reading, he put the book into his breast pocket. 
at that moment the door was pushed open and a young man entered he clearly was not of the mountain birth and breeding he was clad in those who dwell in cities his clothing was dusty however as from travel he had in fact been riding hard to attend the inquest the coroner nodded no one else greeted him we have waited for you said the coroner it is necessary to have done with this business tonight the young man smiled i am sorry to have kept you he said i went away not to evade your summons but to post to my newspaper an account of what i suppose i am called back to relate the coroner smiled the account that you posted to your newspaper he said differs probably from that which you would give here under oath that replied the other rather hotly and with a visible flush is as you choose i used manifold paper and have a copy of what i sent it was not written as news for it is incredible but as fiction it may go as part of my testimony under oath but you say it is incredible that is nothing to you sir if i also swear that it is true coroner was apparently not greatly affected by the young man's manifest resentment he was silent for some moments his eyes upon the floor the men about the sides of the cabin talked in whispers but seldom withdrew their gaze from the face of the corpse presently the coroner lifted his eyes and said we will resume the inquest the men removed their hats the witness was sworn what is your name the coroner asked william harker age twenty-seven you know the deceased hugh morgan yes you were with him when he died near him how did that happen your your presence i mean i was visiting him at this place to shoot and fish a part of my purpose however was to study him and his odd solitary way of life he seemed a good model for a character in fiction i sometimes write stories i sometimes read them thank you stories in general not yours some of the jurors laughed. Against a somber background, humor shows high lights. Soldiers in the intervals of battle laugh easily, and a jest in the death chamber conquers by surprise. Relate the circumstances of this man's death, said the coroner. You may use any notes or memoranda that you please. The witness understood. Pulling a manuscript from his breast pocket, he held it near the candle, and turning the leaves until he found the page that he wanted, began to read. The sun had hardly risen when we left the house. We were looking for quail, each with a shotgun, but we had only one dog. Morgan said that our best ground was beyond a certain ridge that he pointed out, and we crossed it by a trail through the chaparral. On the other side was comparatively level ground, thickly covered with wild oats. As we emerged from the chaparral, Morgan was a few yards in advance. Suddenly we heard, at a little distance to our right and partly in front, a noise as of some animal thrashing about in the bushes, which we could see were violently agitated. "'We've started a deer,' I said. "'I wish we had brought a rifle.' Morgan, who had stopped and was intently watching the agitated chaparral, said nothing, but had cocked both barrels of his gun and was holding it in readiness to aim. I thought him a trifle excited, which surprised me for he had a reputation for exceptional coolness, even in moments of sudden and imminent peril. "'Oh, come,' I said. "'You are not going to fill up a deer with a quail shot, are you?' Still he did not reply, but catching a sight of his face as he turned it slightly toward me, I was struck by the pallor of it. Then I understood that we had serious business on hand, and my first conjecture was that we had jumped a grizzly. I advanced to Morgan's side, cocking my piece as I moved. The bushes were now quiet, and the sounds had ceased, but Morgan was as attentive to the place as before. "'What is it? What the devil is it?' I asked. "'That damned thing,' he replied. Without turning his head, his voice was husky and unnatural. He trembled visibly. I was about to speak further when I observed the wild oats near the place of the disturbance, moving in the most inexplicable way. I could hardly describe it. It seemed as if stirred by a streak of wind, but not only bent, but pressed it down, crushed it so that it did not rise, and this movement was slowly prolonging itself directly toward us. Nothing that I had ever seen had affected me so strangely as this unfamiliar and unaccountable phenomenon, yet I am unable to recall any sense of fear. 
i remember and tell it here because singularly enough i recollected it then that once in looking carelessly out an open window i momentarily mistook a small tree close at hand for one of a group of larger trees at a little distance away it looked the same size as the others but being more distinctly and sharply defined in mass and detail seemed out of harmony with them it was a mere falsification of the law of aerial perspective but it startled almost terrified me we so rely upon the orderly operation of familiar natural laws that any seeming suspension of them is noted as a menace to our safety a warning of unthinkable calamity so now the apparently causeless movement of the herbage and the slow and deviating approach of the line of disturbance was distinctly disquieting my companion appeared actually frightened and i could hardly credit my senses when i saw him suddenly throw his gun to his shoulders and fire both barrels at the agitated grass before the smoke of the discharge had cleared away i heard a loud savage cry a scream like that of a wild animal and flinging his gun upon the ground morgan sprang away and ran swiftly from the spot the same instant i was thrown violently to the ground by the impact of something unseen in the smoke some soft heavy substance that seemed thrown against me with great force before i could get upon my feet and recover my gun which seemed to have been struck from my hands i heard morgan crying out as if in mortal agony and mingling with his cries were such hoarse savage sounds as one hears from fighting dogs inexpressibly terrified i struggled to my feet and looked in the direction of morgan's retreat and may heaven in mercy spare me from another sight like that at a distance of less than thirty yards was my friend down upon one knee his head thrown back at a frightful angle hatless his long hair in disorder and his whole body in violent movement from side to side backward and forward his right arm was lifted and seemed to lack the hand at least i could see none the other arm was invisible at times as my memory now reports this extraordinary scene i could discern but a part of his body it was as if he had been partly blotted out i could not otherwise express it then a shifting of his position would bring it all into view again all this must have occurred within a few seconds yet in that time morgan assumed all the postures of a determined wrestler vanquished by a superior weight and strength i saw nothing but him and him not always distinctly during the entire incident his shouts and curses were heard as if through an enveloping uproar of such sounds of rage and fury as i had never heard from the throat of man or brute for a moment only i stood resolute then throwing down my gun i ran forward to my friend's assistance i had a vague belief that he was suffering from a fit or some form of convulsion before i could reach his side he was down and quiet all sounds had ceased but with a feeling of such terror as even these awful events had not inspired i now saw the same mysterious movement of wild oats prolonging itself from the trampled area about the prostrate man toward the edge of a wood it was only when it had reached the wood that i was able to withdraw my eyes and look at my companion he was dead the coroner rose from his seat and stood beside the dead man lifting an edge of the sheet he pulled it away exposing the entire body altogether naked and showing in the candlelight a clay-like yellow it had however broad maculations of bluish black obviously caused by extravasated blood from contusions the chest and sides looked as if they had been beaten with a bludgeon there were dreadful lacerations the skin was torn in strips and shreds the coroner moved round to the end of the table and undid a silk handkerchief which had been passed under the chin and knotted on top of the head when the handkerchief was drawn away it exposed what had been the throat some of the jurors who had risen to get a better view repented their curiosity and turned away their faces witness harker went to the open window and leaned out across the sill faint and sick dropping the handkerchief upon the dead man's neck the coroner stepped to an angle of the room and from a pile of clothing produced one garment after another each of which he held up a moment for inspection all were torn and stiff with blood the jurors did not make a closer inspection they seemed rather uninterested they had in truth seen all this before the only thing that was new for them being harker's testimony gentlemen the coroner said we have no more evidence i think your duty has been already explained to you 
if there is nothing you wish to ask you may go outside and consider your verdict the foreman rose a tall bearded man of sixty coarsely clad i should like to ask one question mr coroner he said what asylum did this year last witness escape from mr harker said the coroner gravely and tranquilly from what asylum did you last escape harker flushed crimson again but said nothing and the seven jurors rose and solemnly filed out of the cabin if you have done insulting me sir said harker as soon as he and the officer were left alone with the dead man i suppose i am at liberty to go yes harker started to leave but paused with his hand on the door latch the habit of his profession was strong in him stronger than his sense of personal dignity he turned about and said the book that you have there i recognize it is morgan's diary you seem greatly interested in it you read it while i was testifying may i see it the public would like the book will cut no figure in this matter replied the official slipping into into his coat pocket all the entries in it were made before the writer's death as harker passed out of the house the jury re-entered and stood about the table on which the now covered corpse showed under the sheet with sharp definition the foreman seated himself near the candle produced from his breast pocket a pencil and a scrap of paper and wrote rather laboriously the following verdict which with various degrees of effort all signed we the jury do find that the remains come to their death at the hands of a mountain lion but some of us thinks all the same they had fits in the diary of the late hugh morgan are certain interesting entries having possibly a scientific value as suggestions at the inquest upon his body the book was not in evidence possibly the coroner thought it not worth while to confuse the jury the date of the first of the entries mentioned cannot be ascertained the upper part of the leaf is torn away the part of the entry remaining is as follows would run on a half circle keeping his head turned away toward the center and again he would stand still barking furiously at last he ran away into the brush as fast as he could go i thought at first that he had gone mad but on returning to the house found no other alteration in his manner than what was obviously due to fear of punishment can a dog see with his nose do odors impress some olfactory center with images of the things emitted them september two looking at the stars last night as they rose above the crest of the ridge east of the house i observed them successfully disappear from left to right each was eclipsed but an instant and only a few at the same time but along the entire length of the ridge all that were within a degree or two of the crest were blotted out it was as if something had passed along between me and them but i could not see it and the stars were not thick enough to define its outline oh i don't like this several weeks entries are missing three leaves being torn from the book september twenty seven it has been about here again i find evidence of its presence every day i watched again all of last night in the same cover gun in hand double charged with buckshot in the morning the fresh footprints were there as before yet i should have sworn that i did not sleep indeed i hardly sleep at all it's terrible insupportable these amazing experiences are real i shall go mad if they are fanciful i am mad already october third i shall not go it shall not drive me away no this is my house my land god hates a coward october five i can stand it no longer I've invited Harker to pass a few weeks with me. He has a level head. I can judge from his manner if he thinks me mad. October 7. I have the solution of the problem. It came to me last night suddenly, as by revelation. How simple. How terribly simple. There are sounds that we cannot hear. At either end of the scale are notes that stir no chord of that imperfect instrument, the human ear. They are too high or too grave. I have observed a flock of blackbirds occupying an entire treetop, the tops of several trees, and all in full song. Suddenly, in a moment, at absolutely the same instant, all spring into the air and fly away. How? They could not all see one another. Whole treetops intervened. At no point could a leader have been visible to all. 
there must have been a signal of warning or command high and shrill above the din but by me unhurt i have observed too the same simultaneous flight when all were still among not only blackbirds but other birds quail for example widely separated by bushes even on opposite sides of a hill it is known to seamen that a school of whales basking or sporting on the surface of the ocean miles apart with the convexity of the earth between them will sometimes dive at the same instant all gone out of sight in a moment the signal has been sounded too grave for the ear of the sailor at the masthead or his comrades on the deck who nevertheless feel its vibrations in the ship as the stones of a cathedral are stirred by the base of the organ as with sounds so with colors at each end of the solar spectrum the chemist can detect the presence of what are known as actinic rays they represent colors integral colors in the composition of light which we are unable to discern the human eye is an imperfect instrument its range is but a few octaves of the real chromatic scale i am not mad there are colors that we cannot see and god help me the damned thing is of such a color end of the damned thing by ambrose Bierce. read by mary schneider in havana florida the librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Earthmen Bearing Gifts by Frederick Brown Dar Rai sat alone in his room, meditating. From outside the door he caught a thought wave equivalent to a knock, and glancing at the door he willed it to slide open. It opened. Enter, my friend, he said. He could have projected the idea telepathically, but with only two persons present, speech was more polite. Ijean Key entered. You are up late tonight, my leader, he said. Yes, Key. Within an hour, the earth rocket is due to land, and I wish to see it. I know it will land a thousand miles away, if their calculations are correct, beyond the horizon. But if it lands even twice that far, the flash of the atomic explosion should be visible. And I have waited long for first contact, but even though no Earthman will be on this rocket, it will still be first contact for them. Of course, our telepath teams have been reading their thoughts for many centuries, but this will be the first physical contact between Mars and Earth. Key made himself comfortable on one of the low chairs. True, he said. I have not followed recent reports too closely, though. Why are they using an atomic warhead? I know they suppose our planet is uninhabited, but still... They will watch the flash through their lunar telescopes and get, oh, what do they call it, a, a spectroscopic analysis. That will tell them more than they know now, or think they know, much of it is erroneous, about the atmosphere of our planet and the composition of its surface. It is, call it a sighting shot, Key. They'll be here in person within a few oppositions, and then... Mars was holding out, waiting for Earth to come. What was left of Mars, that is, this one small city of about 900 beings. The civilization of Mars was older than that of Earth, but it was a dying one. This was what remained of it. One city, 900 people. They were waiting for Earth to make contact for a selfish reason and for an unselfish one. Martian civilization had developed in a quite different direction from that of Earth. It had developed no important knowledge in the physical sciences, no technology, but it had developed social sciences to the point where there had not been a single crime, let alone a war on Mars, for 50,000 years. And it had developed fully the parapsychological sciences of the mind, 
which earth was just beginning to discover mars could teach earth much how to avoid crime and war to begin with beyond those simple things lay telepathy telekinesis empathy earth would mars hoped teach them something even more valuable to mars how by science and technology which it was too late for mars to develop now even if they had the type of minds which would enable them to develop these things to restore and read a dying planet so that an otherwise dying race might live and multiply again each planet would gain greatly and neither would lose and tonight was the night when earth would make its first sighting shot its next shot a rocket containing earthmen or at least an earthman would be at the next opposition two earth years or roughly four martian years hence the martians knew this because their teams of telepaths were able to catch at least some of the thoughts of the earthmen enough to know their plans unfortunately at that distance the connection was one way mars could not ask earth to hurry its program or tell earth scientists the facts about mars composition and atmosphere which would have made this preliminary shot unnecessary tonight rye the leader or as nearly as that martian word can be translated and key his administrative assistant and closest friend sat and meditated together until the time was near then they drank a toast to the future a beverage based on menthol which had the same effect on martians as alcohol on earthmen and climbed to the roof of the building in which they had been sitting they watched toward the north where the rocket should land the stars shone brilliantly and unwinkingly through the atmosphere on observatory number one on earth's moon raj everett his eye at the eyepiece of the spotter scope said triumphantly thar she blew willie and now as soon as the films are developed we'll know the score on that old planet mars he straightened up there'd be no more to see now and he and willie sanger shook hands solemnly it was an historical occasion hope it didn't kill anybody any martians that is Raj, did it hit dead center of Sirtis Major? Near as matters, I'd say it was maybe a thousand miles off to the south, and that's damn close on a fifty million mile shot. Willie, do you think there are any Martians? Willie thought a second and then said, No. He was right. End of Earthmen Bearing Gifts by Frederick Brown Read by Mary S. in Havana, Florida. Censor by Rosal George Brown. Read by Mark Douglas Nelson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. From an Unseen Censor Uncle Isidore's ship wasn't in bad shape, at first glance but a second look showed the combustion chamber was crumpled to pieces, and the jets were fused into the rocks, making a smooth depression. The ship had tilted into a horizontal position, nestling in the hollow its last blasts had made. Dust had sifted in around it, piling over the almost invisible seam of the port and filming the whole ship. We circled around the ship. It was all closed and sealed, blind as a bullet. Okay. Rene said. He's dead. My regrets. He coughed the word out as though it were something he had swallowed by accident. But how do you know? I asked. He might be in there. That port hasn't been open for months, maybe years. I told you the converter wouldn't last more than a month in dock. He couldn't live locked up in there without air or water. Let's go. My guide had no further interest in the ship. He hadn't even looked to see what the planet was like. I stood shivering in my warm clothes. The ship seemed to radiate a chill. I looked around at the lumpy, unimaginative landscape of Alvarla. There was nothing in sight but a scraggly, dun heather sprouting here and there in the rocks and dust, making hirsute patches in the low hills. 
I had some wild idea, I think, that Uncle Izzy might come sauntering nonchalantly over the hills, one hand in the pocket of a grilch-down jacket and the other holding a Martian cigarine. And he would have on his face that look which makes everything he says seem cynical and slightly clever, even if it isn't. The scenery is dull, he might say, but it makes a nice backdrop for you. Something like that, leaving the impression he'd illuminated a side of your character for you to figure out later on. Nothing of the kind happened, of course. I just got colder standing there. All right, Rene said. We've had a moment of silence. Now let's go. I... there's something wrong, I told him. Let's go in and see the... body. We can't go in. That ship's sealed from the inside. You think they make those things so any painted alien can open the door and shoot in poisoned arrows? Believe me, he has to be inside if those outside ports are sealed and he has to be dead because that port hasn't been opened in months. Look at the dust! It's a fourth of the way up the port!" Rene lumbered over to it and blew away some of the lighter dust higher up. "'See that?' he asked. "'No?' he groaned. "'Well, you'll have to take my word for it. It's a raindrop, almost four months old. A very light rain you could see the faint crusted outline of the drop, if you knew how to look. "'I believe you,' I said. "'I hired you because you know which side of the trees the moss grows on, and things like that. Still—' Rene was beginning to stomp around impatiently. "'Still what?' "'It just isn't like Uncle Isidore.' I was trying to search out, myself, what it was that struck me as incongruous. It's out of character. It's out of character for anybody to die, Rene said, but I've seen a lot of them dead. I mean, at least he would have died outside. Oh, for Pete's sake, why outside? You think he took rat poison? I went around to the other side of the spaceship, mostly to get away from Rene for a moment. I'm only a studs and neck class man, and Rene had twenty years' experience on alien planets. So he was right, of course, about the evidence. There was no getting around it. Still, I circled back around to where Rene was smoking his first cigarette since we left Earth. His face was a mask of sun-baked wrinkles, pointing down to the cigarette smack in the middle of his mouth. "'Uncle Izzy wouldn't die like an ordinary mortal,' I said. "'He'd have a brass band, or we'd find his body lying in a bed of roses with a big lily in his hand, or he might even disappear into thin air. But not this.' I waved a hand toward the dead ship. "'Look,' Rene said. My job was to find your Uncle Isidore. I've found him. We can't get inside that ship with anything short of a matter reducer, which I don't happen to have along, since they weigh several tons. You'll have to take my word for it that his body's in there. Now let's go home." He managed to talk without moving the cigarette at all. "'You said a week,' I reminded Rene. I said if I didn't find him in a week, then he wasn't there. I found him. I'm sorry if he was your favorite uncle or something. As a matter of fact, I never liked him. He was frivolous. He never had a job. He thought life was a big game. Then how come he got so rich? He always won. Not this time, brother. But if he's not your favorite uncle, why all this concern? You can take my word for it, he's dead, and you've done your duty." There are two things that bother me. One is curiosity. I just don't believe Uncle Izzy died in an ordinary fashion locked up in a spaceship. You don't know him, so you wouldn't understand. The other thing I'm concerned about is, well, his will." Rene barked a couple of times. I had learned this indicated laughter. I figured what you were really after was his money. Under my yellow overskin I could feel myself coloring. 
That wasn't at all the point. I'd mortgaged Mother's bonds to finance this trip, confident that Uncle Izzy would make it good when we found him. If I couldn't get Mother's bonds out of Hawk, she'd have to live out her life in a comfort park. I shuddered at the thought. Uncle Isidore must have known that when he radared for help. He must have provided some way. You said a week, and we're staying a week, I told Rene, as authoritatively as I could manage. You haven't actually showed me Uncle Izzy's, er, corpus delecti, so I have you on a legal technicality. I didn't know whether or not this was true, but it sounded good. All right, we'll stay, Rene spat the sentence out onto the ground. But if you think I'm going to do any more looking, take another guess. He tramped back into his own ship, leaving the outside port and the pressure chamber open. If only Uncle Izzy had done that. I went over his ship inch by inch, feeling with my hands to be sure there was no extra door that might be opened. Rene would have laughed, but I was beginning to build up antibodies against Rene's laughter. I got the bottom part of the ship dusted off and found nothing. I pushed open the door of Rene's ship and asked him for a ladder. "'You'll have to pay for it,' he warned. "'Once it's open, I can't carry it in my ship and I'll have to get another. Okay, okay, I'll pay for it.' He handed me a synthetic affair that looked like a meshed rope, wound tight, about the size of a Venusian cigar. "'This is a ladder?' I asked incredulously, but he had shut the door in my face. I slipped the cellophane off and unrolled it. It seemed to unroll endlessly. When it was ten feet long and four feet wide, I stopped unrolling. Sure enough, it hardened into a ladder in about ten minutes. It was so strong I couldn't begin to bend it over my knee. I set it against the side of the ship and began to investigate the viewports. The first two were sealed tight as a drum. The third slipped off in my hands and clattered over the side of the ship onto the rocks. I was almost afraid to look through the glass beneath. I needn't have been. I could see absolutely nothing. It was space black inside. I went back to Rene's ship for a flashlight. He was unimpressed by my discovery. Even if you could break the glass, which you can't, he said, you still couldn't get through that little porthole. Here's the flash. You won't be able to see anything. He came with me this time, not because he was interested, but because he wanted another cigarette and never smoked in the ship. He was right. I couldn't see a darn thing in the ship with the flashlight. But I found something a little lead object that looked like a coin. It had rolled into a corner of the port. Now, I don't like adventure. I don't like strange planets. All I've ever asked of life was my little four-by-six cubby in the Brooklyn block and my job. A job I know inside out. It's a comfortable, happy, harmless way to live, and I test ten to nine on job adjustment. All the same, it was a thrill to discover a clue that Rene would have thrown away if he'd been the one looking. I tossed it casually in the air and showed it to Rene. Know what that is? I asked. Slug for a half deck slot machine? Nope. Know what I can do with it? He didn't say. I'm going to open Uncle Izzy's ship from the inside. Rene lighted a fresh cigarette from the old one and let the smoke out of his nose. It gave rather the impression of a bull resting between picadors. Can you show me, on the outside, approximately where the button is that you push on the inside to unseal the ship? I inquired casually. I can show you exactly. He pointed to a spot next to the entrance port. I wet my finger and made a mark on the dust so I could get it just right. Then I found a sharp stone and cut around the edges of the lead. As I slipped off the back half of the coin-like affair, I clapped it over the finger mark. The entrance port swung open. If I'd had a feather, I would have taken great pleasure in knocking Rene over with it. 
It'd be worth a million dollars, he breathed, to know how you did that. Oh, a lot less than that, I said airily. Well, explain. Uncle Isidore had set it up, I told him, using the same patiently impatient tone he used on me. He knew I'd recognize that lead coin. There was a cufflink in it. A cufflink? A studs and neck class man has to know about cufflinks, too. This happens to be an expensive cufflink, but worth only about a year's salary, not a million dollars. They're held together by a jazzed-up electromagnetic force rather than by a clasp. This force is so strong it would take a derrick to pull them apart. The idea is to keep you from losing one. If you drop it to the floor, you just wave the mate around a little and it pops up through the air. How do you get them apart? Just slip them sideways, like a magnet. You can sheathe them in a lead, like the one I found, to cut down the attraction. This is how they're packaged. You don't know about them because they're not advertised. That keeps them a luxury item, you know. So your Uncle Isidore pasted one of them on the port button. He didn't have to paste. All he had to do was stick it on. All I had to do was line up the mate to it and the attractive force push the button. That's very neat, Rene said. But why the hell didn't he just leave the port open? He'd hardly do this sort of thing with his dying gasp. I'm not sure, I admitted. As a matter of fact, I wonder why he radared me if he really wanted to be rescued. He had plenty of friends who could rescue him more reliably. I had an inkling of what had been on Uncle Isidore's mind. Although Uncle Izzy had had three, or was it four, wives, he'd very carefully had no children. And it had occurred to him, at an advanced age, to take an interest in me. He'd sent me through two years of general studies, and reluctantly let me specialize in studs and neck clasps. "'You were a grill-chop expert in middle school,' he had told me. "'How come you're getting so stuffy?' "'Because I can't be an adolescent all my life, Uncle Isidore,' I had replied stiffly. "'I would like to get into some solid line of work and be a good citizen.' Fooey, he'd said but he had let me do what I'd wanted. It was because of this that I had felt duty-bound to answer his call for help. I'd not felt duty-bound to take all the opportunities he'd tried to force on me when I got out of school. Mining the semi-solid seas of Alfard Kappa, fur-trading on Procyon Beta, and a hundred others, all obviously doomed to failure unless there was one lucky chance. But I'm happy here with my little room and my little job, I kept telling Uncle Isidore. You only think you're happy because you don't know any better, he kept telling me. Only, now that he was dead, he seemed to have me where he wanted me. Now that nothing could matter to him any longer. Maybe he was getting senile, Rene suggested. Uncle Izzy always said he'd rather die than... He did die, I replied, suddenly recalling myself to the present and the open outside port of the ship. I realized how reluctant I was to go in. It was one thing to admit Uncle Izzy was dead, I cherished no great affection for him, but it was something else to have to face his dead body. Would you mind going in first? I asked Rene. He shrugged and shouldered the inside door open. He came out, his face a study in perplexity. "'Not here,' he said. "'This is the first time I've been wrong in fifteen years.' "'That's because it's the first time you've been up against Uncle Izzy. He must have closed the port behind him the same way I opened it.' I climbed through the door, feeling immensely relieved. I realized then what had really been worrying me. If the gods had abandoned Isidore at the last, what do they have in mind for the rest of us mere mortals? I kicked at my mind irritably, knowing these were young thoughts. But then, I am young, I explained to myself. The inside of the ship was neat and empty. 
Stuck on the instrument panel with a vac cup was a note in Uncle Izzy's flowery script. My boy, I have died of boredom. Do not look for the remains. I have hidden my body to avoid the banality of a decent burial. I bequeath you my entire fortune. Find it." Rene groaned. I suppose now you want to look for the body. No. If he says it's hidden, it's hidden. But it would be a little silly to go off without finding his fortune, wouldn't it? Looking for buried treasure wasn't in the contract, Rene pointed out. You'll have to make it worth my while. Another five thousand, I said. Make it ten. Payable if I find it. Suppose I find it. Don't be ridiculous. You'd be a fool to take two steps on this planet without me. He was right, of course. And if we left, I wouldn't get anything. I thought of Mother living by the bells at a comfort park. All right, I said. What form was his fortune in? Rene asked. Money, bonds, polarian droplets? It would help to know what I'm looking for. I have no idea, I confessed. Ordinarily, it would take a computer to figure out Uncle Isidore's financial affairs, but he'd have been perfectly capable of selling out everything and taking his entire fortune along with him for some new project. Rene had skillfully unscrewed the instrument panel, and he lifted it off and began poking inside and removing mysterious bits of machinery. That makes it harder. You don't know whether he sold out or not? I have no idea. He might have all his money piled in the locker of the whist club of Sirius Beta. In that case, we look for a key. Or he might have a block of Eretrevium buried somewhere. Your guess is as good as mine. If he's dug up the ground, Rene said, I'll recognize the spot. But that'll mean walking over every inch of ground for a day's journey around, or more if he did any overnight traveling. Nod, Uncle Izzy, I said. He wouldn't be at all likely to spend a freezing night out on Alvarla, even for a good joke. Radar equipment's in perfect shape. Rene said, shifting his activities to another segment of the ship's equipment. I wonder why he didn't leave it on so we could locate him easier. Not that we had any trouble. Or why he didn't continue broadcasting for help until he died. Mind if I take some of the equipment? You haven't been exactly generous with me. I intend to subtract its value from the cost of supplies and mileage on my ship. I never said I was generous, but by God, I'm honest." Rene slid out the compartment of lunch packages, dumped them on the floor. "'All unopened,' he was saying disgustedly. Then he picked up a heavy square object with square corners, open on three sides. "'What the hell is this?' "'A book,' I informed him. Rene opened it. "'Hey!' A real antique book. Must be worth at least a thousand. Look at the size of that print. You can read it with the naked eye, like an instrument panel. Well, here's a little piece of your fortune." He tossed it to me and went on examining the lunch packages. He didn't trust me to help him because I wouldn't be able to tell if they'd been opened and something inserted. I hung the book by the covers and let the pages flip open. Nothing fell out. I sighed. I'd have to go through the whole damn thing. I'm going back to your ship and read in comfort, I told Rene. You're no help here anyway, he said, putting the lunch packages in a large plastic bag he'd found somewhere. No use letting these go to waste. I didn't tell him I had the clue to Uncle Isidore's fortune in my hand. He didn't know Uncle Isidore, so he wouldn't have believed me. Nothing is more uncomfortable than reading an antique book. There is no way to lie back and flash it on a screen, or run the tape over your reading glasses, while you lie prone and relax. You have to hold it. If you try to hold it lying down, your arms get tired. If you put it down on a table to read, your neck gets tired from bending over. And the pages keep flipping and making you lose your place. 
Still, I read it all the way through. It wasn't too bad. Not like Edgar Guest, of course, who was the only ancient author I liked in general studies. But I found there was a sort of grilch hop beat to it that reminded me of the footlooses I used to go to in middle school. I grinned. It was funny to think of now. I found no clues in the book. The only thing to do was read it again, more carefully. I noticed there was one poem with a real grilch hop beat. I thought suddenly of Sally, my regular partner at the Footlooses. She was very blonde, and she affected a green crest wave in her hair, pulled over her forehead with a diamond clip. She was a beauty, all right, but she was a little silly. And she had that tendency to overdress. No, I sighed, she wouldn't have done for a studs and neck class man. But I couldn't help wondering where she was now and what she was like now. Did she remember me, and did she think about me when she heard that song we used to dance to, because it was about a girl named Sally? Once I knew a girl named Sally, met her at a footloose rally. I began humming the old grilch hop tune to the ancient poem in Uncle Algy's book. It was fantastic how closely it fitted, though of course the words in the poem were plain silly. But imagine finding a poem with a perfect grilch hop beat before anybody even knew what a grilch was. Before Venus was even discovered. Jump on both feet. Hop three times on left foot. Jump. Hop three times on right foot. The rhythm was correct, right down to the breakaway and four-step at the end of each run. It was while I was singing this poem to a grilch hop tune that I noticed the clue. The poem was named The Dodo and the rhyming was very smooth until I came to the lines, Though thy crest be shorn and shaven, though, I said, art like a raven, ghastly grim and ancient dodo, wandering from the nightly shore, tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's Plutonian shore, quoth the dodo, Isidore. Now, the author had gone to a lot of trouble in the previous verse not to break the grilch-hop rhyme scheme. He made thereat is rhyme with lattice, and that is. Why did he follow shaven and raven with dodo? Furthermore, it had not struck me the first time I read the poem quickly that there was anything odd about a bird being named Isidore. People who keep pet grilches frequently name them after famous reed players, and Isidore is a common name. On the other hand, it was my uncle's name, and the word dodo didn't rhyme as it should. I got out a magnifying glass to examine the ancient print. Sure enough, it had been tampered with. The print looked so odd to me anyway, I hadn't noticed the part that had been changed but it was obvious under the glass that dodo had been substituted for a word of almost equal length. The same with Isidore. I went over the whole poem now carefully to see which words had been changed. There weren't many. White in a couple of places, dodo and Isidore wherever they occurred. An O in the line, perfume from an unseen censer. S in the line, wretch I cried, Isidore hath sent thee. Sitting back, I thought about what I had read. It made no sense at all. Was I to look for a white bird, grim, ungainly, ghastly? And what if I found him? Why was he like a raven? What was this perfume from an unseen censer? I could picture the ghost of Uncle Isidore knowing his financial imagination as the unseen censor, because he always criticized me. Was I to look for perfume? Did he have a fortune in perfume stowed somewhere? It seemed to me it would take an awful lot of even the most expensive perfume to comprise a fortune. I decided to start with the bird. I went outside Renée's ship and looked around. No birds. Renée, I called. He was still looking through Uncle Izzy's ship. Have you seen an ungainly white bird around? What? he snapped, sticking an indignant face out of the door. I guess you haven't. Can your woodsy lore tell if there are birds on this planet? Obviously, 
Rene said. I don't know why you can't find your own spore. I noticed the droppings immediately. Where are the birds? How the hell would I know? But he couldn't contain his special knowledge. They're probably night birds, he said. Oh, yes. It checked. Wandering from the night's Plutonian shore. He looked at me suspiciously. You ever had a nervous breakdown? I have not. I test ten to nine on job adjustment and ten to eight on life adjustment. Some people crack on alien planets, he said. I have a padded room in my ship. You'd be surprised how often I have to use it. I told him about the poem I found in Uncle Izzy's book. We look for a white bird, I said, or perfume. You're nuts, he pointed out with some justice, because he hadn't known Uncle Isidore. How do you know these changes weren't made by somebody else a long time ago? Maybe this ancient printer printed it wrong and had to change it afterward. I don't think they were that primitive back then. But I didn't know what back then meant or how primitive ancient printing was. All I knew for sure was that as the poem stood, it sounded as if somebody had loused up a perfect grilch hop rhyme. And Uncle Izzy knew I was a grilch hop expert in middle school, and this was the only real grilch hop rhythm in the book. What's more, Uncle Izzy could depend on me to go over that book in painstaking detail, because a studs and neck class man has to be good on details. All right, I said. You look your way, and I'll look my way. We're not looking any more anyway today, Rene said, emerging from Uncle Isidore's ship, loaded down with removings. It'll be night and below freezing in half an hour. What do you think, I asked, a dodo would like to eat? A what? The birds. I want to put something out to attract them. Crackers or something? I think you're crazy. If you have any idea of sitting outside to wait for them, you'll freeze to death. Not only that, there's no moon. You wouldn't be able to see your hand in front of your face. How do the birds see? Maybe they aren't night birds. Maybe they migrated somewhere else. And if I use a light, I might scare them away, I mused. Well, maybe I'm not supposed to wait outside anyway. Rene went in and switched on the heat and lights. Leave the outside port open, I said. Why? So the birds can knock. Can what? It's possible, I said, defensively. It won't hurt anything to leave it open. All right, he consented, curving his mouth around unpleasantly, just to show what a jackass you are. Rene had the heat turned low for sleeping and the lights off, as soon as we had eaten and fed the converter. I hydrated a package of crackers so that they were full-sized, but not soggy broke them into pieces, and tossed them out. I admit, I felt a little embarrassed. I sat there in the chill quiet, on this ugly, alien world, reading The Dodo by the light of a miniature flash so as not to disturb René. Pretty soon I began to feel creepy. The Dodo is a ghastly poem. There's an insidious morbidity about it. It had sounded merely funny the first time I read it. Now, the more I read it, the more I began to hear strange, impossible creakings and sighs, which might or might not be due to temperature changes. The night outside was a deep, cold cup of darkness where no human thing moved. There was a knock at the door. I dropped the book and flashlight. Rene was up like a cat. He didn't turn on the light. "'Who's there?' he shouted. There was a scratching noise at the door. Then a voice croaked, "'My name is Isidore Summers.' I reached a trembling hand for the door. "'Wait, you fool!' Rene cried. He picked up the flash and got his gun. "'Stand behind me and keep your hands off your gun. 
I know when to shoot and when not to shoot. You don't. If it's Uncle Isidore, I tell you, you've got to leave it up to me, if you want to get off this planet alive. Now stand back and keep your mouth shut, no matter what happens." He kicked the door open and stood back and to one side of it. "'Come in with your arms up!' There was a sort of rustling sound, and in walked a huge, white, wingless bird. "'My name?' the dodo repeated, somewhat plaintively this time, with a glance toward the lunch compartment. "'Is Isidore Summers?' I couldn't help it. I rolled all over the ship with laughter. Rene looked a little shamefaced, tossed his gun onto the rack, and punched the lighting on. Obviously, the dodo recognized our lunch compartment from familiarity with Uncle Izzy's ship. Then he looked at the alcohol tap that led from the fuel conversion. Nepenthe? he begged. I hesitated. Isn't there something, I asked Rene, about corrupting the natives of a primitive planet? But Rene was sitting on his bunk, his jaw slack. This is the first time I ever been made a fool of by an alcoholic bird. If it's just a bird, of course, like a parrot. I addressed the bird. Sir, I began, and caught myself, or perhaps, madam, can you say anything else? Napente, the bird said firmly. I shrugged and drew a cup. The dodo lifted the cup and drained it in one smooth gesture. This, as it turned out, was the only thing it seemed to do smoothly. It began a wild attempt to scratch its head with one claw and remain upright. Then, abandoning all dignity, it rolled to its side and scratched furiously to satisfaction. After that it began what looked like a hopeless attempt to right its awkward body, legs struggling in the air and back bumping around the ship. I couldn't help remembering Uncle Izzy after a meal, slim and suave, lighting up a tapered, perfectly packed cigarine and blowing out one round, shapely smoke ring that hovered before his light, sardonic grin like a comment on his thoughts. An uncomfortable comparison, I shook myself to life. I righted the bird, no small problem, for he weighed almost two hundred pounds. Well, Rene finally said, coming out of his mood, now that you have this bird, what are you going to do with it? I had thought it might lead us to Uncle Izzy's fortune, I explained. The bird obviously had no such intention. It was getting ready to take a nap. A night bird, I told it approvingly, shouldn't take a nap in the middle of the night. All you're proving is that he has no self-respect, Rene pointed out. Why don't you look to see if he's got a note tagged to his leg or something? I did. He didn't. I think this whole thing is crazy, Rene said, but since he's a talking bird, you might ask him a few questions. Maybe he's trained to say something else. Where is Uncle Izzy's fortune? I asked, when I had tugged at the dodo's feathers until he opened one eye. He closed it. Do you have a message for me? He drew away from me irritably and closed the eye again, ruffling down into his feathers. He may be key to respond to certain phrases. Try your uncle's name. He obviously knows that, Rene suggested coldly, wanting no part of this, but unable to hold down the suggestion. My name, I screamed at the somnolent dodo, is Isidore Summers. He reared back and pecked the hell out of me. I picked the book up off the floor and flipped through the bent pages until I found the dodo. Maybe there'd be something in that. Listen to this, Rene, I said, and see if you catch anything I might have missed. Rene looked discomfited, but he didn't stop up his ears. When I came to the part, tell me what thy lordly name is, on the night's Plutonian shore, the dodo looked up and said, Isidore. Clearly this was it, although I couldn't recall that any of the questions in the poem were to the point. I got to... 
On the morrow he will leave me, as my hopes have flown before. And then the bird said, Ask me more, said the dodo, without missing a beat. I read on, getting excited. Quaff, O oh, quaff, this kind Nepenthe, and forget this lost Lenore. Quoth the dodo, Give me more, he supplied, pointing his beak at the alcohol tap. I gave him another cup and continued, sure that he must be going to say something relevant to Uncle Izzy's fortune. Is there, is there balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore. Quoth the dodo. Probably not, the dodo said, breaking the grilch-hop rhythm at last. But there are perfume trees on Alvarla. Perfume trees? Rene shouted. That bird's lying. It's impossible. Shut up, I yelled at him. The poem's not over. I read on, somewhat ashamed of having to say such inhospitable words to a dodo who had been, after all, cooperating with me. Take thy beak from out my heart, and take thy form from off my door, quoth the dodo. I was just leaving, the bird said, and struggled to his feet and went and stood by the door expectantly. I got up. Wait, I commanded the bird who couldn't do much else because the door was closed. Do you know what perfume trees are, Rene? Yeah, I know what they are, and they don't grow on this planet. You can take my word for it. They need a warm, moist soil to germinate in. They need to have their soil cultivated every day for a year. They die fast on contact with any sort of industrial fumes. They die in captivity, like some wild animals. They die if you sweat on them. They die if you breathe on them. They need to start off warm and get colder every month until they form their flowers. Then they need a frost for the pods to fill with the perfume along with the seeds. There aren't any industrial fumes here, I pointed out, and they could get plenty of frost. That's all they'd get. Where's the warm, moist climate to germinate in? Where's the parasitical runes to cultivate their soil? The urns couldn't exist without their glees, and the glees can't exist without... Never mind. The only place perfume trees can grow is on Odoria, and that's why the perfume is worth two thousand dollars an ounce. I have never heard of anything, I informed him, that spelled Uncle Isidore so exactly. He always said, if it can't be done, I can do it. Well, there's only one way to find out. Surely there's something on the ship I can wear. You mean you're going out into that frozen ink pot after that idiotic bird? That's exactly what I mean. For Pete's sake, you're as brainless as the bird is. But I think for all his attitude, he was curious too. He began to spray me with something. Close your eyes and mouth. If you don't wash this off with soap and water in twenty-four hours, you'll die. But it sure keeps in the body heat. I stuck the book in my pocket for good luck, and Rene handed me a gun, some lunch packages, an antibiotic kit, and a water purification kit. All right, I said, pocketing them. But it can't be far. Uncle Izzy wouldn't have gone more than a day's journey. Then why haven't we smelled the perfume? And why would he have gone through all this rigmarole when he must have known you'd searched that far? I didn't know why. I pushed the door open, the bird hopped out, and I realized how easy it would be to lose him from the small round glow of my flash. He looked curiously at me, as though expecting something further. I looked curiously at him, wondering where he would lead to. Then he was off. There was no question of following him. That big, awkward bird ran so fast that in a few minutes we could no longer hear the beat of his huge claws on the rocks, even in the perfectly still, dry air. "'How fast do you figure he's going?' I asked Rene. "'How the hell would I know?' "'Roughly. Roughly? Maybe fifty miles an hour. But that's incredible. The big point-tails on the Aldebaran Kappa can do eighty with a native on their backs.' Ah, I said, so that's it. Maybe tomorrow night. 
but we could hear the drumming of the returning dodo. "'Don't be stupid,' René said. "'He can't carry both of us, and you'd be a fool either to go alone or stay here alone. As a tribute to my deceased uncle, I'm going to be a fool.' I stuck my flashlight into one of my many pockets and climbed onto the huge bird's back. The down beneath his outer feathers was as soft and strong as heavy fur. I dug in with my hands and feet, my head braced against the thickened part of his neck. He started off with a lurch that brought my stomach out of hiding. I kept my eyes squeezed closed. I couldn't have seen anything anyway, not even the impossible creature that was rushing through the darkness carrying me for all I knew, straight to damnation. The night rushed past my ears into a wild keening, and it crossed my mind to wonder what Mr. Pix, my supervisor, would say if he saw me now. I had a sudden vision of Mr. Pix, even more neatly dressed than I always was, with middle-cost neck clasp and stud discreetly shining from a plain square-edged bag shirt and dun suit. I pictured him opening a refined little box and holding it two feet under the customer's eyes with a gesture of faint, unconscious supplication. A comfortable, warm, happy picture in which my place, one counter behind Mr. Pix, was reassuringly assured. Then, out of nowhere, into the picture galloped a yellow-skinned monster astride a huge white bird. It turned out to be me and I tumbled off the bird, crying, "'Mr. Pix, I don't know what came over me!' But I was answered only by a multitude of squawks, rustles, and scratchings. The bird was home. I could almost see vague forms. The darkness was beginning to give a little. I was warm, itchy, and uncomfortable under whatever it was that René had sprayed on me. Warm? Perfume trees? All I could smell were bird roosts. I stood up, finding my limbs weak, trembling and painful. First I glanced at my watch. Five hours Terran time since we left the ship. At fifty miles per hour we'd have gone two hundred and fifty miles. If we'd gone due north, as the bird started out, we must be in the snow zone. And I was warm. I switched my flash around. All I could see were birds. There seemed to be hundreds of them. I couldn't tell which one was my bearer. "'Where is the perfume?' I bawled. All I got was squawks. Some of the birds were, in fact, standing on one foot and tucking their heads away. It was growing lighter. The birds were going to bed. Feverishly, I pulled out Uncle Izzy's old volume of poetry. Brushing from my mind a vision of Mr. Pix in a state of shock, and another picture of Uncle Isidore snickering triumphantly, I stood on that desert land, enchanted, on that home by horror haunted, and solemnly read, The Dodo, to a colony of wingless birds. My Dodo identified himself at the proper place, but I kept on, waiting for something to show me my inheritance. Then methought the air grew denser, I read. Perfume from an unseen censer, a bird croaked from the back row. Where? I cried, pushing my way through the birds crowding around me in various stages of roost and curiosity. Then, I repeated, the air grew denser. Perfume, the bird now in front of me said, from an unseen censer. He began to scratch at the ground assiduously under one of the four dim shapes about the level of my eyes. Then he yawned gapingly, gave up, and went to sleep. I sat down to wait, because it was almost dawn and the last dodo had tucked his head into his feathers. Daylight showed me four little trees, nothing like the usual scraggly vegetation of Alvarla. They must be perfume trees, I thought but they were too young to have blossoms or pods. I didn't go too near them, remembering what René had said. And remembering that, I began to figure out how they grew here. This place was a little valley, no, a crater, several feet deeper than my height, with sloping sides. The birds apparently kept it warm with their body heat, 
plus the heat of the rocky sides would store. Since it was a crater, the winds wouldn't reach it. The crater made a basin to catch the snow, which I could see beginning to melt at the edges and ooze down the slope. The birds provided more than ample fertilizer, and Uncle Izzy had apparently trained at least one of them to cultivate the soil under the trees. I climbed out of the crater to see that I was indeed in the regions of snow. To the north were huge drifts, and far off loomed towering glaciers. To the south the hills tapered off from white to spotted brown. That was the reason for Uncle Izzy's crazy setup. Rene and I would never have come across this crater in an ordinary search. Of course, the setup needn't have been quite so crazy. That was the personal equation of which Uncle Izzy was so fond. The trees would, I assumed, poke their heads up over the crater as they grew, reaching toward the cold, and finally getting the frostbite to fill their pods properly. At two thousand dollars an ounce. I had neglected to ask Rene how many pods a tree could be expected to produce, or how big the pods were, but say half an ounce in each pod and a conservative fifty pods in each tree. A hundred thousand dollars. I slid back into the crater, sat leaning against a somnolent dodo, and ate a lunch package with a cupful of melted snow. All sorts of thoughts were jostling my brain. But I was bone-weary. I hadn't slept since we hit Alvarla, and the ride last night had been a tremendous strain, because I wasn't in the habit of getting any exercise at all. Therefore I fell asleep in mid-thought. It was the noon sun that woke me. I wasn't just warm. I was hot. And I was very reluctant to let go of my dream. I kept grabbing at the tag ends of it with both hands. It was the most exciting dream I'd had since the one about succeeding Mr. Pix, only very different. I'd made a fortune cultivating perfume trees. My dream was full of perfume. Some of it came from the exotic plants of my African estate. Some of it was from a long-legged, pink-haired girl, the kind African millionaires have. It was the sort of dream, I mused, unable to keep it in mood any longer, as large-minded men have. Men like Uncle Isidore. I sat up suddenly. Uncle Isidore? Large-minded? Why hadn't he had the avuncular decency to leave me his fortune the usual way? Why? Because then he wouldn't be able to play penny-ante psychology and get me dreaming about wild schemes with perfume trees and African estates. That's why. Or maybe there wasn't any fortune. Suddenly I understood why people smoke. It gives them something to do when they feel helpless. If there wasn't any fortune, then I was hopelessly tied to the perfume trees. If Uncle Izzy had lost his last cent, it would be very like him to borrow enough from friends to finance a perfume tree scheme. And if he didn't make it to the planet he had in mind, why, he'd make the planet he'd crashed on do. Anyone else would have shot the birds for fresh meat. Anyone else would have seen immediately that Alvarla was the last planet in the galaxy where perfume trees would grow. Anyone else would have seen immediately that I was one of the minor, comfortable people in the world who likes the happy regularities of a little job and an assured, if limited, future. Anyone else would have seen I had the sort of personality that could not be changed. But Uncle Izzy wasn't anyone else. Why did I keep smelling the perfume from my dream? I followed my nose out of the crater and found the snow melting around a water tank about four feet long and two feet in diameter, part of the ruined fuel system from Uncle Izzy's ship. I dislodged it from the ice beneath and shook it. The perfume was so strong, as it unfroze, that it made me dizzy. And all that smell was coming from a pinhole. There seemed to be half a gallon in it, enough to pay off mother's bonds and whatever I owed Rene, with a handsome sum left over for me. I could go home and forget about perfume trees and Alvarla and Uncle Isidore. 
But that dream of the African estate kept irritating the back of my mind. And the large free sky of Alvarla was soothing to the eye, when compared to the little squares of blue I noted occasionally when riding the slidewalks of Brooklyn. What did I want out of life, anyway? Damn, Uncle Isidore! I'd never test ten to nine on job adjustment again. I was still thinking when evening swept in fast, as it does in dry climates, and the birds began to wake up and climb out of the crater, presumably to forage for food. "'Wait!' I cried. "'Isidore!' I drew out a lunch package and spread it to attract him. It attracted all of them. I pulled out the dodo. "'Tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's Plutonian shore.' Isidore, he volunteered, swallowing fast while I climbed aboard him. Take me back. Then I realized I had made a mistake with the food. Go, I cried. Spaceship! More food! He just stood there, his beak poking around the ground for crumbs. But I had to get that skin spray washed off before twenty-four hours were up. Nepenthe! I shouted desperately. The dodo was off like a flash and didn't stop till we were back at the ship. "'You are gone quite a while,' Rene said nonchalantly. "'Find anything?' "'Enough to pay you off,' I said. "'And we'll make it five thousand, because I found it. Stow this somewhere. It's perfume.' He did. "'Find anything else?' "'Nothing that would interest you.' I'll be ready to blast off as soon as I've had a shower." Rene shrugged. The perfume, when we returned to Earth, proved to be worth what he'd said it would be. A lot of people wanted to know where I'd gotten it. The crops on Odoria, they said, are entirely sewed up by Odoria Inc. They certainly are, I always replied agreeably. It took all I cleared from the perfume to put a down payment on a ship and hire an expert on fertilizing perfume flowers. But this time I wanted to run the show. Mr. Pick shook his head sadly when I told him to replace me permanently. "'You have a great future ahead of you in studs and neck clasps,' he said. "'Why not take a little time and reconsider your decision? Or—' "'Never more,' I answered. Not until five years later did I find out what happened to the rest of good old Uncle Algernon's fortune. I was stretched out on a gently undulating force field in my interior patio, a huge scarlet fanflower tree sifting in the sunshine. Lita, her pink hair flowing down to her knees, was just emerging from the pool of grilch milk. She bent to an Aphrodite of Canido's position. "'Perfect!' I said and threw away my cigarine. "'Depart!' I told the robot, who came rolling in. "'But, Master, it's the Chan of Betelgeuse, Lord of the Seven Planets and the Four Hundred Moons.' "'Get dressed, Lita,' I said regretfully. "'We have company.' I'd never met him, but I knew he was one of Uncle Isidore's best friends, and I felt obliged to see him. The Chan had several meals and four cigarines, maintaining a courteous silence all the while. Then he loosened his belt, reached into his furry pouch, and handed me a piece of copper scroll. It was a check for five million dollars. "'You won,' he told me, or lost, as the case may be. I just looked at him. "'I was holding it in trust for you,' the Chan explained in accordance with your Uncle Isidore's last wishes. I blew a perfect smoke ring, let it float before my face for a perfect moment, and then asked, And suppose I had lost, or won as the case may be? I was to save it to try on your son, the gods permitting you have one. If necessary, I told him, I'll try it on him myself. O oh, Chan of the Seven Planets and the Four Hundred Moons! Call me Charlie, he said. The End of From an Unseen Censor by Rosal George Brown
Case of Fire by Randall Garrett. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nick Number. In Case of Fire by Randall Garrett. In his office apartment on the top floor of the Terran Embassy building in Ossack City, Bertrand Malloy leafed casually through the dossiers of the four new men who had been assigned to him. They were typical of the kind of men who were sent to him, he thought, which meant, as usual, that they were atypical. Every man in the diplomatic corps who developed a twitch or a quirk was shipped to Sarkod Four to work under Bertrand Malloy, permanent Terran ambassador to his utter munificence, the Ossack of Sarkod. Take this first one, for instance. Malloy ran his finger down the columns of complex symbolism that showed the complete psychological analysis of the man. Psychopathic paranoia. The man wasn't technically insane. He could be as lucid as the next man most of the time, but he was morbidly suspicious that every man's hand was turned against him. He trusted no one and was perpetually on his guard against imaginary plots and persecutions. Number two suffered from some sort of emotional block that left him continually on the horns of one dilemma or another. He was psychologically incapable of making a decision if he were faced with two or more possible alternatives of any major importance. Number three. Malloy sighed and pushed the dossiers away from him. No two men were alike, and yet there sometimes seemed to be an eternal sameness about all men. He considered himself an individual, for instance, but wasn't the basic similarity there, after all? He was... how old? He glanced at the Earth calendar dial that was automatically correlated with the sarcotic calendar just above it. Fifty-nine this week. Fifty-nine years old. And what did he have to show for it besides flabby muscles, sagging skin, a wrinkled face, and gray hair? Well, he had an excellent record in the Corps, if nothing else. One of the top men in his field, and he had his memories of Diane, dead these ten years, but still beautiful and alive in his recollections. And, he grinned softly to himself, he had Sarkad. He glanced up at the ceiling and mentally allowed his gaze to penetrate it to the blue sky beyond it. Out there was the terrible emptiness of interstellar space, a great yawning infinite chasm capable of swallowing men, ships, planets, suns, and whole galaxies without filling its insatiable void. Malloy closed his eyes. Somewhere out there a war was raging. He didn't even like to think of that, but it was necessary to keep it in mind. Somewhere out there the ships of Earth were ranged against the ships of the alien Karna in the most important war that mankind had yet fought. And, Malloy knew, his own position was not unimportant in that war. He was not in the battle line, nor even in the major production line, but it was necessary to keep the drug supply lines flowing from Sarkad, and that meant keeping on good terms with the Sarkadic government. The Sarkada themselves were humanoid in physical form, if one allowed the term to cover a wide range of differences, but their minds just didn't function along the same lines. For nine years Bertrand Malloy had been ambassador to Sarkad, and for nine years no Sarkada had ever seen him. To have shown himself to one of them would have meant instant loss of prestige. To their way of thinking, an important official was aloof. The greater his importance, the greater must be his isolation. The Osek of Sarkad himself was never seen except by a handful of picked nobles, who themselves were never seen except by their underlings. It was a long, roundabout way of doing business, but it was the only way Sarkad would do any business at all. To violate the rigid social setup of Sarkad would mean the instant closing off of the supply of biochemical products that the Sarkadic laboratories produced from native plants and animals, products that were vitally necessary to Earth's war and which could be duplicated nowhere else in the known universe. It was Bertrand Malloy's job to keep the production output high and to keep the materiel flowing towards Earth and her allies and outposts. The job would have been a snap cinch in the right circumstances. The Sarkata weren't difficult to get along with. A staff of top-grade men could have handled them without half trying. But Malloy didn't have top-grade men. They couldn't be spared from work that required their total capacity. It's inefficient to waste a man on a job that he can do without half trying, where there are more important jobs that will tax his full output. So Malloy was stuck with the culls. Not the worst ones, of course. There were places in the galaxy that were less important than Sarkad to the war effort. Malloy knew that, no matter what was wrong with a man, as long as he had the mental ability to dress himself and get himself to work, useful work could be found for him. Physical handicaps weren't at all difficult to deal with. A blind man can work very well in the total darkness of an infrared film darkroom. 
Partial or total losses of limbs can be compensated for in one way or another. The mental disabilities were harder to deal with, but not totally impossible. On a world without liquor, a dipsomaniac could be channeled easily enough, and he'd better not try fermenting his own on Sarkad unless he brought his own yeast, which was impossible in view of the sterilization regulations. But Malloy didn't like to stop at merely thwarting mental quirks. He liked to find places where they were useful. The phone chimed. Malloy flipped it on with a practiced hand. Malloy here. Mr. Malloy, said a careful voice. A special communication for you has been teletyped in from Earth. Shall I bring it in? Bring it in, Miss Drayson. Miss Drayson was a case in point. She was uncommunicative. She liked to gather in information, but she found it difficult to give it up once it was in her possession. Malloy had made her his private secretary. Nothing, but nothing, got out of Malloy's office without his direct order. It had taken Malloy a long time to get it into Miss Drayson's head that it was perfectly all right, even desirable, for her to keep secrets from everyone except Malloy. She came in through the door, a rather handsome woman in her middle thirties, clutching a sheaf of papers in her right hand as though someone might at any instant snatch it from her before she could turn it over to Malloy. She laid them carefully on the desk. If anything else comes in, I'll let you know immediately, sir, she said. Will there be anything else? Malloy let her stand there while he picked up the communique. She wanted to know what his reaction was going to be. It didn't matter because no one would ever find out from her what he had done unless she was ordered to tell someone. He read the first paragraph, and his eyes widened involuntarily. Armistice, he said in a low whisper. There's a chance that the war may be over. Yes, sir, said Miss Drayson in a hushed voice. Malloy read the whole thing through, fighting to keep his emotions in check. Miss Drayson stood there calmly, her face a mask, her emotions were a secret. Finally, Malloy looked up. I'll let you know as soon as I reach a decision, Miss Drayson. I think I hardly need to say that no news of this is to leave this office. Of course not, sir. Malloy watched her go out the door without actually seeing her. The war was over, at least for a while. He looked down at the papers again. The Karna, slowly being beaten back on every front, were suing for peace. They wanted an armistice conference, immediately. Earth was willing. Interstellar war is too costly to allow it to continue any longer than necessary, and this one had been going on for more than thirteen years now. Peace was necessary, but not peace at any price. The trouble was that the Karna had a reputation for losing wars and winning at the peace table. They were clever, persuasive talkers. They could twist a disadvantage to an advantage and make their own strengths look like weaknesses. If they won the armistice, they'd be able to retrench and rearm, and the war would break out again within a few years. Now, at this point in time, they could be beaten. They could be forced to allow supervision of the production potential, forced to disarm, rendered impotent. But if the armistice went to their own advantage... Already they had taken the offensive in the matter of the peace talks. They had sent a full delegation to Sarkad V, the next planet out from the Sarkad Sun, a chilly world inhabited only by low-intelligence animals. The Karna considered this to be fully neutral territory, and Earth couldn't argue the point very well. In addition, they demanded that the conference begin in three days, terrestrial time. The trouble was that interstellar communication beams travel a devil of a lot faster than ships. It would take more than a week for the Earth government to get a vessel to Sarkad V. Earth had been caught unprepared for an armistice. They objected. The Karna pointed out that the Sarkad sun was just as far from Karn as it was from Earth, that it was only a few million miles from a planet which was allied with Earth, and that it was unfair for Earth to take so much time in preparing for an armistice. Why hadn't Earth been prepared? Did they intend to fight to the utter destruction of Karn? It wouldn't have been a problem at all if Earth and Karn had fostered the only two intelligent races in the galaxy. The sort of grandstanding the Karna were putting on had to be played to an audience. But there were other intelligent races throughout the galaxy, most of whom had remained as neutral as possible during the earth karn War. They had no intention of sticking their figurative noses into a battle between the two most powerful races in the galaxy. But whoever won the armistice would find that some of the now neutral races would come in on their side if war broke out again. If the Karna played their cards right, their side would be strong enough next time to win. So Earth had to get a delegation to meet with the Karna representatives within the three-day limit or lose what might be a vital point in the negotiations. And that was where Bertrand Malloy came in. 
He had been appointed minister and plenipotentiary extraordinary to the Earth Karn Peace Conference. He looked up at the ceiling again. What can I do? he said softly. On the second day after the arrival of the communique, Malloy made his decision. He flipped on his intercom and said, Miss Drayson, get hold of James Norden and Kylan Brainick. I want to see them both immediately. Send Norden in first and tell Brainick to wait. Yes, sir. And keep the recorder on. You can file the tape later. Yes, sir. Malloy knew the woman would listen in on the intercom anyway, and it was better to give her permission to do so. James Norden was tall, broad-shouldered, and thirty-eight. His hair was graying at the temples, and his handsome face looked cool and efficient. Malloy waved him to a seat. Norden, I have a job for you. It's probably one of the most important jobs you'll ever have in your life. It can mean big things for you, promotion and prestige if you do it well. Norden nodded slowly. Yes, sir. Malloy explained the problem of the Karna peace talks. We need a man who can outthink them, Malloy finished, and judging from your record, I think you're that man. It involves risk, of course. If you make the wrong decisions, your name will be mud back on Earth. But I don't think there's much chance of that, really. Do you want to handle small-time operations all your life? Of course not. You'll be leaving within an hour for Sarkad 5. Norden nodded again. Yes, sir, certainly. Am I to go alone? No, said Malloy. I'm sending an assistant with you, a man named Kylan Brainick. Ever heard of him? Norden shook his head. Not that I recall, Mr. Malloy. Should I have? Not necessarily. He's a pretty shrewd operator, though. He knows a lot about interstellar law, and he's capable of spotting a trap a mile away. You'll be in charge, of course, but I want you to pay special attention to his advice. I will, sir, Norden said gratefully. A man like that can be useful. Right. Now you go into the anteroom over there. I've prepared a summary of the situation, and you'll have to study it and get it into your head before the ship leaves. That isn't much time, but it's the Karna who are doing the pushing, not us. As soon as Norden had left, Malloy said softly, Send in Brainick, Miss Drayson. Kylan Brainick was a smallish man with mouse-brown hair that lay flat against his skull and hard, penetrating dark eyes that were shadowed by heavy, protruding brows. Malloy asked him to sit down. Again Malloy went through the explanation of the peace conference. Naturally, they'll be trying to trick you every step of the way, Malloy went on. They're shrewd and underhanded. We'll simply have to be more shrewd and more underhanded. Norden's job is to sit quietly and evaluate the data. Yours will be to find the loopholes they're laying out for themselves and plug them. Don't antagonize them, but don't baby them either. If you see anything underhanded going on, let Norden know immediately. They won't get anything by me, Mr. Malloy. By the time the ship from Earth got there, the peace conference had been going on for four days. Bertrand Malloy had full reports on the whole parley as relayed to him through the ship that had taken Norden and Brainick to Sarkod 5. Secretary of State Blendwell stopped off at Sarkod 4 before going on to 5 to take charge of the conference. He was a tallish, lean man with a few strands of gray hair on the top of his otherwise bald scalp, and he wore a hearty, professional smile that didn't quite make it to his calculating eyes. He took Malloy's hand and shook it warmly. How are you, Mr. Ambassador? Fine, Mr. Secretary. How's everything on Earth? Tense. They're waiting to see what is going to happen on five. So am I, for that matter. His eyes were curious. You decided not to go yourself, eh? I thought it better not to. I sent a good team, instead. Would you like to see the reports? I certainly would. Malloy handed them to the secretary, and as he read, Malloy watched him. Blendwell was a political appointee. A good man, Malloy had to admit, but he didn't know all the ins and outs of the diplomatic corps. When Blendwell looked up from the reports at last, he said, Amazing! They've held off the Karna at every point. They've beaten them back. They've managed to cope with and outdo the finest team of negotiators that Karna could send. I thought they would, said Malloy, trying to appear modest. The secretary's eyes narrowed. I've heard of the work you've been doing here with, uh, sick men. Is this one of your, uh, successes? Malloy nodded. I think so. The Karna put us in a dilemma, so I threw a dilemma right back at them. How do you mean? Norden had a mental block against making decisions. If he took a girl out on a date, he'd have trouble making up his mind whether to kiss her or not until she made up his mind for him, one way or the other. He's that kind of guy. Until he's presented with one, single, clear decision which admits of no alternatives, he can't move at all. 
As you can see, the Karna tried to give us several choices on each point, and they were all rigged. Until they backed down to a single point and proved that it wasn't rigged, Norden couldn't possibly make up his mind. I drummed into him how important this was, and the more importance there is attached to his decisions, the more incapable he becomes of making them. The secretary nodded slowly. What about Brainick? Paranoid, said Malloy. He thinks everyone is plotting against him. In this case, that's all to the good because the Karna are plotting against him. No matter what they put forth, Brainick is convinced that there's a trap in it somewhere, and he digs to find out what the trap is. Even if there isn't a trap, the Karna can't satisfy Brainick because he's convinced that there has to be, somewhere. As a result, all his advice to Norden and all his questioning on the wildest possibilities just serves to keep Norden from getting unconfused. These two men are honestly doing their best to win at the peace conference, and they've got the Karna reeling. The Karna can see that we're not trying to stall. Our men are actually working at trying to reach a decision. But what the Karna don't see is that those men, as a team, are unbeatable because, in this situation, they're psychologically incapable of losing. Again the Secretary of State nodded his approval, but there was still a question in his mind. Since you know all that, couldn't you have handled it yourself? Maybe, but I doubt it. They might have gotten around me some way by sneaking up on a blind spot. Norden and Brainick have blind spots, but they're covered with armor. No, I'm glad I couldn't go. It's better this way. The Secretary of State raised an eyebrow. Couldn't go, Mr. Ambassador? Malloy looked at him. Didn't you know? I've wondered why you appointed me in the first place. No, I couldn't go. The reason why I'm here, cooped up in this office, hiding from the Sarkata the way a good Sarkatic big shot should, is because I like it that way. I suffer from agoraphobia and xenophobia. I have to be drugged to be put on a spaceship because I can't take all that empty space, even if I'm protected from it by a steel shell. A look of revulsion came over his face. And I can't stand aliens. End of In Case of Fire by Randall Garrett Recording by Nick Number By Philip K. Dick This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Reading by Greg Marguerite Mr. Spaceship by Philip K. Dick A human brain-controlled spacecraft would mean mechanical perfection. This was accomplished, and something unforeseen, a strange entity called Mr. Spaceship. Kramer leaned back. You can see the situation. How can we deal with a factor like this? The, the perfect variable. Perfect? Prediction should still be possible. The living thing still acts from necessity, the same as inanimate material, but the cause-effect chain is more subtle. There are more factors to be considered. The difference is quantitative, I think. The reaction of the living organism parallels natural causation, but with greater complexity. Gross and Kramer looked up at the board plates, suspended on the wall, still dripping the images hardened into place. Kramer traced a line with his pencil. See that? It's a pseudopodium. They're alive, and so far a weapon we can't beat. No mechanical system can compete with that, simple or intricate. We'll have to scrap the Johnson control and find something else. Meanwhile, the war continues as it is. Stalemate. Checkmate. They can't get to us, and we can't get through their living minefield. Kramer nodded. It's a perfect defense for them, but there still might be one answer. What's that? Wait a minute. Kramer turned to his rocket expert sitting with the charts and files. The heavy cruiser that returned this week, it didn't actually touch, did it? It came close, but there was no contact. Correct. The expert nodded. The mine was twenty miles off. The cruiser was in space drive moving directly toward Proxima, line straight, using the Johnson control, of course. It had deflected a quarter of an hour earlier for reasons unknown. Later it resumed its course. That was when they got it. It shifted, Kramer said, but not enough. The mine was coming along after it, trailing it, 
It's the same old story, but I wonder about the contact. Here's our theory, the expert said. We keep looking for contact, a trigger in the pseudopodium, but more likely we're witnessing a psychological phenomenon, a decision without any physical correlative. We're watching for something that isn't there. The mine decides to blow up. It sees our ship, approaches, and then decides. Thanks. Kramer turned to Gross. Well, that confirms what I'm saying. How can a ship guided by automatic relays escape a mine that decides to explode? The whole theory of mine penetration is that you must avoid tripping the trigger. But here, the trigger is a state of mind in a complicated, developed life form. The belt is 50,000 miles deep, Gross added. It solves another problem for them. Repair and maintenance. The damn things reproduce fill up the spaces by spawning into them. I wonder what they feed on. Probably the remains of our first line. The big cruisers must be a delicacy. It's a game of wits between a living creature and a ship piloted by automatic relays. The ship always loses. Kramer opened a folder. I'll tell you what I suggest. Go on, Gross said. I've already heard ten solutions today. What's yours? Mine is very simple. These creatures are superior to any mechanical system, but only because they're alive. Almost any other life form could compete with them, any higher life form. If the yucks can put out living minds to protect their planets, we ought to be able to harness some of our own life forms in a similar way. Let's make use of the same weapon ourselves. Which life form do you propose to use? I think the human brain is the most agile of known living forms. Do you know of any better? But no human being can withstand outspace travel. A human pilot would be dead of heart failure long before the ship got anywhere near Proxima. But we don't need the whole body, Kramer said. We need only the brain. What? The problem is to find a person of high intelligence who would contribute, in the same manner that eyes and arms are volunteered. But a brain? Technically it could be done. Brains have been transferred several times when body destruction made it necessary. Of course, to a spaceship, a heavy outspace cruiser instead of an artificial body. That's new. The room was silent. It's quite an idea, Gross said slowly his heavy square face twisted. But even supposing it might work, the big question is, whose brain? It was all very confusing. The reasons for the war, the nature of the enemy. The Yakone had been contacted on one of the outlying planets of Proxima Centauri. At the approach of the Terran ship, a host of dark, slim pencils had lifted abruptly and shot off into the distance. The first real encounter came between three of the Yuck Pencils and a single exploration ship from Terra. No Terran survived. After that it was all-out war with no holds barred. Both sides feverishly constructed defense rings around their systems. Of the two, the Yakone belt was the better. The ring around Proxima was a living ring, superior to anything Terra could throw against it. The standard equipment by which Terran ships were guided in outspace, the Johnson Control, was not adequate. Something more was needed. Automatic relays were not good enough. Not good at all, Kramer thought to himself as he stood looking down the hillside at the work going on below him. A warm wind blew along the hill, rustling the weeds and grass. At the bottom, in the valley, the mechanics had almost finished. The last elements of the reflex system had been removed from the ship and crated up. All that was needed now was the new core, the new central key that would take the place of the mechanical system. A human brain. The brain of an intelligent, wary human being. But would the human being part with it? That was the problem. Kramer turned. Two people were approaching him along the road. A man and a woman. The man was gross. Expressionless, heavy-set, walking with dignity. The woman was... He stared in surprise and growing annoyance. It was Dolores, his wife. Since they'd separated, he had seen little of her. Kramer, Gross said. Look who I ran into. Come back down with us. We're going into town. 
Hello, Phil, Dolores said. Well, aren't you glad to see me? He nodded. How have you been? You're looking fine. She was still pretty and slender in her uniform, the blue-gray of Internal Security Gross Organization. Thanks, she smiled. You seem to be doing all right, too. Commander Gross tells me that you're responsible for this project. Operation Head, as they call it. Whose head have you decided on? That's the problem. Kramer lit a cigarette. This ship is to be equipped with a human brain instead of the Johnson system. We've constructed special draining baths for the brain, electronic relays to catch the impulses and magnify them, a continual feeding duct that supplies the living cells with everything they need, but... But we still haven't got the brain itself. Gross finished. They began to walk back toward the car. If we can get that, we'll be ready for the tests. Will the brain remain alive? Dolores asked. Is it actually going to live as part of the ship? It will be alive, but not conscious. A very little life is actually conscious. Animals, trees, insects are quick in their responses, but they aren't conscious. In this process of ours, the individual personality, the ego, will cease. We only need the responsibility, nothing more. Dolores shuddered. How terrible! In time of war, everything must be tried, Kramer said absently. If one life sacrificed will end the war, it's worth it. This ship might get through. A couple more like it, and there wouldn't be any more war. They got into the car. As they drove down the road, Gross said, Have you thought of anyone yet? Kramer shook his head. That's out of my line. What do you mean? I'm an engineer. It's not my department. But all this was your idea. My work ends there. Gross was staring at him oddly. Kramer shifted uneasily. Then who is supposed to do it? Gross said. I can have my organization prepare examinations of various kinds to determine fitness, that kind of thing. Listen, Phil, Dolores said suddenly. What? She turned toward him. I have an idea. Do you remember that professor we had in college, Michael Thomas? Kramer nodded. I wonder if he's still alive. Dolores frowned. If he is, he must be awfully old. Why, Dolores? Gross asked. Perhaps an old person who didn't have much time left, but whose mind was still clear and sharp. Professor Thomas. Kramer rubbed his jaw. He certainly was a wise old duck, but could he still be alive? He must have been seventy then. We could find that out, Gross said. I could make a routine check. What do you think? Dolores said. If any human mind could outwit those creatures. I don't like the idea, Kramer said. In his mind an image had appeared, the image of an old man sitting behind a desk, his bright, gentle eyes moving about the classroom, the old man leaning forward, a thin hand raised. Keep him out of this, Kramer said. What's wrong? Gross looked at him curiously. It's, it's because I suggested it, Dolores said. No, Kramer shook his head. It's, it's not that. I didn't expect anything like this. Somebody I knew, a man I studied under. I remember him very clearly. He was a very distinct personality. Good, Gross said. He sounds fine. We can't do it. We're, we're asking his death. This is war. Gross said, and war doesn't wait on the needs of the individual. You said that yourself. Surely he'll volunteer. We can keep it on that basis. He may already be dead, Dolores murmured. We'll find that out, Gross said, speeding up the car. They drove the rest of the way in silence. For a long time the two of them stood studying the small wood house, overgrown with ivy, set back on the lot behind an enormous oak. The little town was silent and sleepy. Once in a while a car moved slowly along the distant highway, but that was all. This is the place, Gross said to Kramer. He folded his arms. Quite a quaint little house. Kramer said nothing. The two security agents behind them were expressionless. Gross started toward the gate. 
Let's go. According to the check, he's still alive, but very sick. His mind is agile, however. That seems to be certain. It's said he doesn't leave the house. A woman takes care of his needs. He's very frail. They went down the stone walk and up onto the porch. Gross rang the bell. They waited. After a time they heard slow footsteps. The door opened. An elderly woman in a shapeless wrapper studied them impassively. Security, Gross said, showing his card. We wish to see Professor Thomas. Why? Government business. He glanced at Kramer. Kramer stepped forward. I was a pupil of the professor's, he said. I'm sure he won't mind seeing us. The woman hesitated uncertainly. Gross stepped into the doorway. All right, mother. This is wartime. We can't stand out here. The two security agents followed him, and Kramer came reluctantly behind, closing the door. Gross stalked down the hall until he came to an open door. He stopped, looking in. Kramer could see the white corner of a bed, a wooden post, and the edge of a dresser. He joined Gross. In the dark room a withered old man lay propped up on endless pillows. At first it seemed as if he were asleep. There was no motion or sign of life. But after a time Kramer saw, with a faint shock, that the old man was watching them intently, his eyes fixed on them, unmoving, unwinking. "'Professor Thomas,' Gross said, "'I'm Commander Gross of Security. This man with me is perhaps known to you.' The faded eyes fixed on Kramer. I know him. Philip Kramer. You've grown heavier, boy. The voice was feeble, the rustle of dry ashes. Is it true you're married now? Yes. I married Dolores French. You remember her. Kramer came toward the bed. But we're separated. It didn't work out very well. Our careers. What we came here about, Professor? Gross began, but Kramer cut him off with an impatient wave. Let me talk. Can't you and your men get out of here long enough to let me talk to him? Gross swallowed. All right, Kramer. He nodded to the two men. The three of them left the room, going out into the hall and closing the door after them. The old man in the bed watched Kramer silently. I don't think much of him, he said at last. I've seen his type before. What's he want? Nothing. He just came along. Can I sit down? Kramer found a stiff, upright chair beside the bed. If I'm bothering you... No. I'm, I'm glad to see you again, Philip, after so long. I'm sorry your marriage didn't work out. How have you been? I've been very ill. I'm afraid that my moment on the world stage has almost ended. The ancient eyes studied the younger man reflectively. You look as if you've been doing well, like everyone else I thought highly of you. You've gone to the top in this society." Kramer smiled. Then he became serious. "'Professor, there's a project we're working on that I want to talk to you about. It's the first ray of hope we've had in this whole war. If it works, we may be able to crack the Yuk defenses, get some ships into their system. If we can do that, the war might be brought to an end. Go on. Tell me about it, if you wish. It's a long shot, this project. It may not work at all, but we have to give it a try. It's obvious that you came here because of it, Professor Thomas murmured. I'm becoming curious. Go on. After Kramer finished, the old man lay back in the bed without speaking. At last he sighed. I understand. A human mind taken out of a human body. He sat up a little looking at Kramer. I suppose you're thinking of me. Kramer said nothing. Before I make my decision, I want to see the papers on this, the theory and outline of construction. I'm not sure I like it. For reasons of my own, I mean. But I want to look at the material, if you'll do that. Certainly. Kramer stood up and went to the door. Gross and the two security agents were standing outside, waiting tensely. Gross. Come inside. They filed into the room. Give the professor the papers, Kramer said. He wants to study them before deciding. Gross brought the file out of his coat pocket, a manila envelope. He handed it to the old man on the bed. Here it is, professor. 
You're welcome to examine it. Will you give us your answer as soon as possible? We're very anxious to begin, of course. I'll give you my answer when I've decided. He took the envelope with a thin, trembling hand. My decision depends on what I find out from these papers. If I don't like what I find, then I will not become involved with this work in any shape or form. He opened the envelope with shaking hands. I'm looking for one thing. What is it? Gross said. That's my affair. Leave me a number by which I can reach you when I've decided. Silently, Gross put his card down on the dresser. As they went out, Professor Thomas was already reading the first papers, the outline of the theory. Kramer sat across from Dale Winter, his second in line. What then? Winter said. He's going to contact us, Kramer scratched with a drawing pen on some paper. I don't know what to think. What do you mean? Winter's good-natured face was puzzled. Look. Kramer stood up, pacing back and forth, his hands in his uniform pockets. He was my teacher in college. I respected him as a man as well as a teacher. He was more than a voice, a talking book. He was a person, a calm, kindly person I could look up to. I always wanted to be like him some day. Now look at me. So? Look at what I'm asking. I'm asking for his life, as if he were some kind of laboratory animal kept around in a cage. Not a man, a teacher at all. Do you think he'll do it? I don't know. Kramer went to the window. He stood looking out. In a way, I hope not. But if he doesn't... Then we'll have to find somebody else. I know. There would be somebody else. Why did Dolores have to... The vidphone rang. Kramer pressed the button. This is gross. The heavy features formed. The old man called me, Professor Thomas. What did he say? He knew he could tell already by the sound of Gross's voice. He said he'd do it. I was a little surprised myself, but apparently he means it. We've already made arrangements for his admission to the hospital. His lawyer is drawing up the statement of liability. Kramer only half heard. He nodded wearily. All right. I'm glad. I suppose we can go ahead, then. You don't sound very glad. I wonder why he decided to go ahead with it. He was very certain about it. Gross sounded pleased. He called me quite early. I was still in bed. You know, this calls for a celebration. Sure, Kramer said. It, it sure does. Toward the middle of August, the project neared completion. They stood outside in the hot autumn heat, looking up at the sleek metal sides of the ship. Gross thumped the metal with his hand. Well, it won't be long. We can begin the test any time. Tell us more about this, an officer in gold braid said. It's such an unusual concept. Is there really a human brain inside the ship? A dignitary asked, a small man in a rumpled suit. And the brain is actually alive? Gentlemen, this ship is guided by a living brain instead of the usual Johnson Relay Control System. But the brain is not conscious. It will function by reflex only. The practical difference between it and the Johnson System is this. A human brain is far more intricate than any man-made structure, and its ability to adapt itself to a situation, to respond to danger, is far beyond anything that could be artificially built. Gross paused, cocking his ear. The turbines of the ship were beginning to rumble, shaking the ground under them with a deep vibration. Kramer was standing a short distance away from the others, his arms folded, watching silently. At the sound of the turbines, he walked quickly around the ship to the other side. A few workmen were clearing away the last of the waste, the scraps of wiring and scaffolding. They glanced up at him and went on hurriedly with their work. Kramer mounted the ramp and entered the control cabin of the ship. Winter was sitting at the controls with a pilot from space transport. How's it look? Kramer asked. All right. Winter got up. He tells me that it would be best to take off manually. The robot controls... Winter hesitated. I mean, the built-in controls can take over later on in space. That's right, the pilot said. 
It's customary with the Johnson system, and so in this case we should— Can you tell anything yet? Kramer asked. No, the pilot said slowly. I don't think so. I've been going over everything. It seems to be in good order. There's only one thing I wanted to ask you about. He put his hand on the control board. There are some changes here I don't understand. Changes? Alterations from the original design. I wonder what the purpose is. Kramer took a set of the plans from his coat. Let me look. He turned the pages over. The pilot watched carefully over his shoulder. The changes aren't indicated on your copy, the pilot said. I wonder. He stopped. Commander Gross had entered the control cabin. Gross, who authorized alterations? Kramer said. Uh, some of the wiring has been changed. Why, your old friend, Gross signaled to the field tower through the window. My old friend? The professor. He took quite an active interest. Gross turned to the pilot. Let's get going. We have to take this out past gravity for the test, they tell me. Well, perhaps it's for the best. Are you ready? Sure. The pilot sat down and moved some of the controls around. Any time. Go ahead, then, Gross said. The professor, Kramer began, but at that moment there was a tremendous roar and the ship leaped under him. He grasped one of the wall holds and hung on as best he could. The cabin was filling with a steady throbbing, the raging of the jet turbines underneath them. The ship leaped. Kramer closed his eyes and held his breath. They were moving out into space, gaining speed each moment. Well, what do you think? Winter said nervously. Is it time yet? A little longer, Kramer said. He was sitting on the floor of the cabin, down by the control wiring. He had removed the metal covering plate, exposing the complicated maze of relay wiring. He was studying it, comparing it to the wiring diagrams. What's the matter? Gross said. These changes, I can't figure out what they're for. The only pattern I can make out is that for some reason... Let me look, the pilot said. He squatted down beside Kramer. You were saying? See this lead here? Originally it was switch-controlled. It closed and opened automatically according to the temperature change. Now it's wired so that the central control system operates it. The same with the others. A lot of this was still mechanical, worked by pressure, temperature, stress. Now it's under the central master. The brain? Gross said. You mean it's been altered so that the brain manipulates it? Kramer nodded. Maybe Professor Thomas felt that no mechanical relays could be trusted. Maybe he thought that things would be happening too fast. But some of these could close in a split second. The brake rockets could go on as quickly as— Hey, Winter said from the control seat. We're getting near the moon stations. What'll I do? They looked out the port. The corroded surface of the moon gleamed up at them, a corrupt and sickening sight. They were moving swift toward it. I'll take it, the pilot said. He eased Winter out of the way and strapped himself in place. The ship began to move away from the moon as he manipulated the controls. Down below them they could see the observation stations dotting the surface and the tiny squares that were the openings of the underground factories and hangars. A red blinker winked up at them, and the pilot's fingers moved on the board in answer. We're past the moon, the pilot said after a time. The moon had fallen behind them. The ship was heading into outer space. Well, we can go ahead with it. Kramer did not answer. Mr. Kramer, we can go ahead any time. Kramer started. Sorry, I was thinking. All right, thanks. He frowned, deep in thought. What is it? Gross asked. The wiring changes. Did you understand the reason for them when you gave the okay to the workmen? Gross flushed. You know I know nothing about technical material. I'm in security. Then you should have consulted me. What does it matter? Gross grinned wryly. We're going to have to start putting our faith in the old man sooner or later. The pilot stepped back from the board. His face was pale and set. Well, it's done, he said. That's it. 
What's done? Kramer said. We're on automatic, the brain. I turned the board over to it, to, to him, I mean, the old man. The pilot lit a cigarette and puffed nervously. Let's keep our fingers crossed. The ship was coasting evenly in the hands of its invisible pilot. Far down inside the ship, carefully armored and protected, a soft human brain lay in a tank of liquid, a thousand minute electric charges playing over its surface. As the charges rose, they were picked up and amplified, fed into relay systems, advanced, carried on through the entire ship. Gross wiped his forehead nervously. So he is running it now? I, I hope he knows what he's doing. Kramer nodded enigmatically. I think he does. What do you mean? Nothing. Kramer walked to the port. I see we're still moving in a straight line. He picked up the microphone. We can instruct the brain orally through this. He blew against the microphone experimentally. Go on, Winter said. Bring the ship around half right, Kramer said. Decrease speed. They waited. Time passed. Gross looked at Kramer. No change. Nothing. Wait. Slowly the ship was beginning to turn. The turbines missed, reducing their steady beat. The ship was taking up its new course, adjusting itself. Nearby, some space debris rushed past, incinerating in the blasts of the turbine jets. So far so good, Gross said. They began to breathe more easily. The invisible pilot had taken control smoothly, calmly. The ship was in good hands. Kramer spoke a few more words into the microphone, and they swung again. Now they were moving back the way they had come, toward the moon. Let's see what he does when we enter the moon's pull, Kramer said. He was a good mathematician, the old man. He could handle any kind of problem. The ship veered, turning away from the moon. The great eaten-away globe fell behind them. Gross breathed a sigh of relief. That's that. One more thing. Kramer picked up the microphone. Return to the moon and land the ship at the first space field, he said into it. Good Lord, Winter murmured. Why are you— Be quiet. Kramer stood listening. The turbines gasped and roared as the ship swung full around, gaining speed. They were moving back, back toward the moon again. The ship dipped down, heading toward the great globe below. We're going a little fast the pilot said. I, I don't see how he can put down at this velocity. The port filled up as the globe swelled rapidly. The pilot hurried toward the board, reaching for the controls. All at once the ship jerked, the nose lifted, and the ship shot out into space away from the moon, turning at an oblique angle. The men were thrown to the floor by the sudden change in course. They got to their feet again, speechless, staring at each other. The pilot gazed down at the board. It wasn't me. I, I didn't touch a thing. I didn't even get to it. The ship was gaining speed each moment. Kramer hesitated. Maybe you had better switch it back to manual. The pilot closed the switch. He took hold of the steering controls and moved them experimentally. Nothing. He turned around. Nothing. It, it, it doesn't respond. No one spoke. You can see what has happened, Kramer said calmly. The old man won't let go of it now that he has it. I was afraid of this when I saw the wiring changes. Everything in this ship is centrally controlled, even the cooling system, the hatches, the garbage release. We're helpless. Nonsense. Gross strode to the board. He took hold of the wheel and turned it. The ship continued on its course, moving away from the moon, leaving it behind. Release, Kramer said into the microphone. Let go of the controls. We'll take it back. Release. No good, the pilot said. Nothing. He spun the useless wheel. It's dead. Completely dead. And we're still heading out, Winter said, grinning foolishly. We'll be going through the first line defense belt in a few minutes if they don't shoot us down. We better radio back. The pilot clicked the radio to send. I'll contact the main bases, one of the observation stations. Better get the defense belt at the speed we're going. We'll be into it in a minute. And after that, Kramer said, we'll be in outer space. 
He's moving us toward outspace velocity. Is this ship equipped with baths? Baths? Gross said. The sleep tanks. For space drive, we may need them if we go much faster. But, good God, where are we going? Gross said. Where, where's he taking us? The pilot obtained contact. This is Dwight, on ship, he said. We're entering the defense zone at high velocity. Don't fire on us. Turn back, the impersonal voice came through the speaker. You're not allowed in the defense zone. We can't. We've lost control. Lost control? This is an experimental ship. Gross took the radio. This is Commander Gross, security. We're being carried into outer space. There's nothing we can do. Is there any way that we can be removed from this ship? A hesitation. We have some fast pursuit ships that could pick you up if you wanted to jump. The chances are good they'd find you. Do you have space flares? We do, the pilot said. Let's try it. Abandoned ship? Kramer said. I if we leave now, we'll never see it again. What else can we do? We're gaining speed all the time. Do you propose that we stay here? No. Kramer shook his head. Damn it. There, there ought to be a better solution. Could you contact him? Winter asked. The old man. Try to reason with him. It's worth a chance, Gross said. Try it. All right. Kramer took the microphone. He paused a moment. Listen, can you hear me? This is Philip Kramer. Can you hear me, Professor? Can you hear me? I want you to release the controls. There was silence. This is Kramer, Professor. Can you hear me? Do you remember who I am? Do you understand who this is? Above the control panel, the wall speaker made a sound, a sputtering static. They looked up. Can you hear me, Professor? This is Philip Kramer. I want you to give the ship back to us. If you can hear me, release the controls. Let go, Professor. Let go. Static. A rushing sound like the wind. They gazed at each other. There was silence for a moment. It's a waste of time, Gross said. No. Listen. The sputter came again. Then, mixed with the sputter, almost lost in it, a voice came. Toneless, without inflection, a mechanical, lifeless voice from the metal speaker in the wall above their heads. Is it you, Philip? I can't make you out. Darkness. Who's there, with you? It's me, Kramer. His fingers tightened against the microphone handle. You, you must release the controls, Professor. We have to get back to Terra. You must. Silence. Then the faint, faltering voice came again a little stronger than before. Kramer. Everything so strange. I was right, though, consciousness result of thinking. Necessary result. Cognito ergo sum. Retain conceptual ability. Can you hear me? Yes, Professor. I altered the wiring control. I was fairly certain. I wonder if I can do it. Try. Suddenly the air conditioning snapped into operation. It snapped abruptly off again. Down the corridor a door slammed. Something thudded. The men stood listening. Sounds came from all sides of them. Switches, shutting, opening. The lights blinked off. They were in darkness. The lights came back on, and at the same time the heating coils dimmed and faded. Good God, Winter said. Water poured down on them the emergency firefighting system. There was a screaming rush of air. One of the escape hatches had slid back, and the air was roaring frantically out into space. The hatch banged closed. The ship subsided into silence. The heating coils glowed into life. As suddenly as it had begun, the weird exhibition ceased. I can do everything. The dry, toneless voice came from the wall speaker. It is all controlled, Kramer. I wish to talk to you. I've been, been thinking. I haven't seen you in many years. A lot to discuss. You've changed, boy. We have much to discuss. Your wife. The pilot grabbed Kramer's arm. There's a ship standing off our bow. Look. They ran to the port. A slender, pale craft was moving along with them, keeping pace with them. 
It was signal blinking. A Terran pursuit ship, the pilot said. Let's jump. They'll pick us up. Suits. He ran to a supply cupboard and turned the handle. The door opened and he pulled the suits out onto the floor. Hurry, Gross said. A panic seized them. They dressed frantically, pulling the heavy garments over them. Winter staggered to the escape hatch and stood by it, waiting for the others. They joined him one by one. Let's go, Gross said. Open the hatch. Winter tugged at the hatch. Help me. They grabbed hold, tugging together. Nothing happened. The hatch refused to budge. Get a crowbar, the pilot said. Hasn't anyone got a blaster? Gross looked frantically around. Damn it, blast it open! Pull, Kramer grated. Pull together! Are you at the hatch? The toneless voice came, drifting and eddying through the corridors of the ship. They looked up, staring about them. I sense something nearby, outside. A ship? You are leaving? All of you? Kramer, you are leaving too? Very unfortunate. I had hoped we could talk. Perhaps at some other time you might be induced to remain. Open the hatch, Kramer said, staring up at the impersonal walls of the ship. For God's sake, open it! There was silence, an endless pause. Then, very slowly, the hatch slid back. The air screamed out, rushing past them into space. One by one they leaped, one after the other propelled away by the repulsive material of the suits. A few minutes later they were being hauled aboard the pursuit ship. As the last one of them was lifted through the port, their own ship pointed itself suddenly upward and shot off at tremendous speed. It disappeared. Kramer removed his helmet, gasping. Two sailors held on to him and began to wrap him in blankets. Gross sipped a mug of coffee, shivering. It's gone, Kramer murmured. I'll have an alarm sent out," Gross said. What's happened to your ship? A sailor asked curiously. It sure took off in a hurry. Who's on it? We'll have to have it destroyed, Gross went on, his face grim. It's got to be destroyed. There's no telling what it, what he, has in mind. Gross sat down weakly on a metal bench. What a close call for us. We were so damn trusting. What could he be planning? Kramer said, half to himself. It, it doesn't make sense. I don't get it. As the ship sped back toward the moon base, they sat around the table in the dining room, sipping hot coffee and thinking, not saying very much. Look here, Gross said at last. What kind of a man was Professor Thomas? W what do you remember about him? Kramer put his coffee mug down. It was ten years ago. I don't remember much. It's vague. He let his mind run back over the years. He and Dolores had been at Hunt College together, in physics and the life sciences. The college was small and set back away from the momentum of modern life. He had gone there because it was his home town, and his father had gone there before him. Professor Thomas had been at the college a long time, as long as anyone could remember. He was a strange old man, keeping to himself most of the time. There were many things that he disapproved of, but he seldom said what they were. "'Do you recall anything that might help us?' Gross asked. "'Anything that would give us a clue as to what he might have in mind?' Kramer nodded slowly. "'I remember one thing. One day he and the professor had been sitting together in the school chapel, talking leisurely. Well, you'll be out of school soon, the professor had said. What are you going to do? Do? Work at one of the government research projects, I suppose. And eventually, what's your ultimate goal? Kramer had smiled. The question is unscientific. It presupposes such things as ultimate ends. Suppose instead along these lines, then. What if there were no war and no government research projects? What would you do then? I don't know, but how can I imagine a hypothetical situation like that? There's been war as long as I can remember. We're geared for war. I don't know what I'd do. I suppose I'd adjust, get used to it. 
The professor had stared at him. Oh, and do you think you'd get accustomed to it, eh? Well, I'm glad of that. And you think you could find something to do? Gross listened intently. What do you infer from this, Kramer? Not much, except that he was against the war. We're all against the war, Gross pointed out. True, but he was withdrawn, set apart. He lived very simply, cooking his own meals. His wife died many years ago. He was born in Europe, in Italy. He changed his name when he came to the United States. He used to read Dante and Milton. He even had a Bible. Very anachronistic, don't you think? Yes. He lived quite a lot in the past. He found an old phonograph and records, and he listened to the old music. You saw his house, how old-fashioned it was. Did he have a file? Winter asked Gross. With security? No, none at all. As far as we could ever tell, he never engaged in political work, never joined anything, or even seemed to have strong political convictions. No, Kramer agreed. About all he ever did was walk through the hills. He liked nature. Nature can be of great use to a scientist, Gross said. There wouldn't be any science without it. Kramer, what do you think his plan is, taking control of the ship and disappearing? Winter said. Maybe the transfer made him insane, the pilot said. Maybe there's no plan, nothing rational at all. But he had the ship rewired, and he had made sure that he would retain consciousness and memory before he even agreed to the operation. He must have had something planned from the start. But what? Perhaps he just wanted to stay alive longer, Kramer said. He was old and about to die. Or... Or what? Nothing, Kramer stood up. I think as soon as we get to the moon base, I'll make a vid call to Earth. I want to talk to somebody about this. Who's that? Gross asked. Dolores. Maybe she remembers something. That's a good idea, Gross said. Where are you calling from? Dolores asked when he succeeded in reaching her. From the moon base. All kinds of rumors are running around. Why didn't the ship come back? What's happened? I'm afraid he ran off with it. He? The old man, Professor Thomas, Kramer explained what had happened. Dolores listened intently. How strange, and you think he planned it all in advance from the start? I'm certain. He asked for the plans of construction and the theoretical diagrams at once. But why? What, what for? I don't know. Look, Dolores, what do you remember about him? Is there anything that might give a clue to all this? Like what? I don't know. That's the trouble. On the vid screen, Dolores knitted her brow. I remember he raised chickens in his backyard, and once he had a goat. She smiled. Do you remember the day the goat got loose and wandered down the main street of town? Nobody could figure out where it came from. Anything else? No. He watched her struggling, trying to remember. He wanted to have a farm sometime, I know. All right, thanks. Kramer touched the switch. When I get back to Terra, maybe I'll stop and see you. Let me know how it works out. He cut the line, and the picture dimmed and faded. He walked slowly back to where Gross and some officers of the military were sitting at a chart table talking. Any luck? Gross said, looking up. No. All she remembers is that he kept a goat. Come over and look at this detail chart. Gross motioned him around to his side. Watch. Kramer saw the record tabs moving furiously, little white dots racing back and forth. What's happening? he asked. A squadron outside the defense zone has finally managed to contact the ship. They're maneuvering now for position. Watch. The white counters were forming a barrel formation around a black dot that was moving steadily across the board, away from the central position. As they watched, the white dots constricted around it. They're ready to open fire, a technician at the board said. Commander, what shall we tell them to do? Gross hesitated. I hate to be the one who makes the decision when it comes right down to it. 
It's not just a ship, Kramer said. It's a man, a living person. A human being is up there, moving through space. I wish we knew what... But the order has to be given. We can't take any chances. Suppose he went over to them, to the yucks. Kramer's jaw dropped. My God, he, he wouldn't do that. Are you sure? Do you know what he'll do? He wouldn't do that. Gross turned to the technician. Tell them to go ahead. I'm sorry, sir, but now the ship has gotten away. Look down at the board. Gross stared down, Kramer over his shoulder. The black dot had slipped through the white dots and had moved off at an abrupt angle. The white dots were broken up, dispersing in confusion. He's an unusual strategist, one of the officers said. He traced the line. It's an ancient maneuver, an old Prussian device, but it worked. The white dots were turning back. Too many yuck ships out that far, Gross said. Well, that's what you get when you don't act quickly. He looked up coldly at Kramer. We should have done it when we had him. Look at him go. He jabbed a finger at the rapidly moving black dot. The dot came to the edge of the board and stopped. It had reached the limit of the chartered area. See? Now what? Kramer thought, watching. So the old man had escaped the cruisers and gotten away. He was alert, all right. There was nothing wrong with his mind, or with ability to control his new body. Body. The ship was a new body for him. He had traded in the old dying body, withered and frail, for this hulking frame of metal and plastic, turbines and rocket jets. He was strong now, strong and big. The new body was more powerful than a thousand human bodies. But how long would it last him? The average life of a cruiser was only ten years. With careful handling, he might get twenty out of it before some essential part failed and there was no way to replace it. And then, what then? What would he do when something failed and there was no one to fix it for him? That would be the end. Someplace far out in the cold darkness of space the ship would slow down, silent and lifeless, to exhaust its last heat into the eternal timelessness of outer space. Or perhaps it would crash on some barren asteroid, burst into a million fragments. It was only a question of time. Your wife didn't remember anything? Gross said. I told you only that he kept a goat once. A hell of a lot of help that is. Kramer shrugged. It's not my fault. I wonder if we'll ever see him again. Gross stared down at the indicator dot still hanging at the edge of the board. I wonder if he'll ever move back this way. I wonder, too, Kramer said. That night Kramer lay in bed, tossing from side to side, unable to sleep. The moon gravity, even artificially increased, was unfamiliar to him, and it made him uncomfortable. A thousand thoughts wandered loose in his head as he lay, fully awake. What did it all mean? What was the professor's plan? Maybe they would never know. Maybe the ship was gone for good. The old man had left forever, shooting into outer space. They might never find out why he had done it, what purpose, if any, had been in his mind. Kramer sat up in bed. He turned on the light and lit a cigarette. His quarters were small a metal-lined bunk room, part of the moon station base. The old man had wanted to talk to him. He had wanted to discuss things, hold a conversation. But in the hysteria and confusion, all they had been able to think of was getting away. The ship was rushing off with them, carrying them into outer space. Kramer set his jaw. Could they be blamed for jumping? They had no idea where they were being taken or why. They were helpless, caught in their own ship, and the pursuit ship standing by waiting to pick them up was their only chance. Another half hour and it would have been too late. But what had the old man wanted to say? What had he intended to tell him in those first confusing moments when the ship around them had come alive, each metal strut and wire suddenly animate, the body of a living creature, a vast metal organism? It was weird unnerving. He could not forget it, even now. He looked around the small room uneasily. What did it signify, the coming to life of metal and plastic? All at once they had found themselves inside a living creature, 
in its stomach, like Jonah inside the whale. It had been alive, and it had talked to them, talked calmly and rationally as it rushed them off, faster and faster into outer space. The wall speaker and circuit had become the vocal cords and mouth, the wiring, the spinal cord and nerves, the hatches and relays and circuit breakers, the muscles. They had been helpless, completely helpless. The ship had, in a brief second, stolen their power away from them and left them defenseless, practically at its mercy. It was not right. It made him uneasy. All his life he had controlled machines, bent nature and the forces of nature to man and man's needs. The human race had slowly evolved until it was in a position to operate things, run them as it saw fit. Now, all at once, it had been plunged back down the ladder again, prostrate before a power against which they were children. Kramer got out of bed. He put on his bathrobe and began to search for a cigarette. While he was searching, the vidphone rang. He snapped the vidphone on. Yes? The face of an immediate monitor appeared. A call from Terra, Mr. Kramer. It's an emergency call. Emergency call? For me? Put it through. Kramer came awake, brushing his hair back out of his eyes. Alarm plucked at him. From the speaker a strange voice came. Philip Kramer? I is this Philip Kramer? Yes. Go on. This is General Hospital, New York City, Terra. Mr. Kramer, your wife is here. She has been critically injured in an accident. Your name was given to us to call. Is it possible for you to— How badly? Kramer gripped the vidphone stand. Is it serious? Yes, it's serious, Mr. Kramer. Are you able to come here? The quicker you can come, the better. Yes, Kramer nodded. I'll come. Thanks. The screen died as the connection was broken. Kramer waited a moment, then he tapped the button. The screen relit again. Yes, sir, the monitor said. Can I get a ship to Terra at once? It's an emergency. My wife? There's no ship leaving the moon for eight hours. You'll have to wait until the next period. Isn't there anything I can do? We can broadcast a general request to all ships passing through this area. Sometimes cruisers pass by here returning to Terra for repairs. Will you broadcast that for me? I'll come down to the field. Yes, sir, but there may be no ship in the area for a while. It's a gamble. The screen died. Kramer dressed quickly. He put on his coat and hurried to the lift. A moment later he was running across the general receiving lobby, past the rows of vacant desks and conference tables. At the door the sentry stepped aside and he went outside onto the great concrete steps. The face of the moon was in shadow. Below him the field stretched out in total darkness, a black void, endless, without form. He made his way carefully down the steps and along the ramp along the side of the field to the control tower. A faint row of red lights showed him the way. Two soldiers challenged him at the foot of the tower, standing in the shadows, their guns ready. Kramer? Yes. A light was flashed in his face. Your call has been sent out already. Any luck? Kramer asked. There's a cruiser nearby that has made contact with us. It has an injured jet and is moving slowly back toward Terra, away from the line. Good, Kramer nodded, a flood of relief rushing through him. He lit a cigarette and gave one to each of the soldiers. The soldiers lit up. Sir? One of them asked. Is it true about the experimental ship? What do you mean? It came to life and ran off? No, not exactly, Kramer said. It had a new type of control system instead of the Johnson units. It wasn't properly tested. But, sir, one of the cruisers that was there got up close to it, and a buddy of mine says this ship acted funny. He never saw anything like it. It was like when he was fishing once on Terra in Washington State, fishing for bass. The fish were smart, going this way and that. Here's your cruiser, the other soldier said. Look. An enormous vague shape was setting slowly down onto the field. They could make nothing out but its row of tiny green blinkers. Kramer stared at the shape. Better hurry, sir, the soldier said. They don't stick around here very long. Thanks. Kramer loped across the field toward the black shape that rose up above him, extended across the width of the field. 
The ramp was down from the side of the cruiser, and he caught hold of it. The ramp rose, and a moment later Kramer was inside the hold of the ship. The hatch slid shut behind him. As he made his way up the stairs to the main deck, the turbines roared up from the moon, out into space. Kramer opened the door to the main deck. He stopped suddenly, staring around him in surprise. There was nobody in sight. The ship was deserted. Good God, he said, realization sweeping over him, numbing him. He sat down on a bench, his head swimming. Good God. The ship roared out into space, leaving the moon and Terra farther behind each moment. And there was nothing he could do. So it was you who put the call through, he said at last. It was you who called me on the vidphone, not any hospital on Terra. It was all part of the plan. He looked up and around him. And Dolores is really— Your wife is fine, the wall speaker above him said tonelessly. It was a fraud. I am sorry to trick you that way, Philip, but it was all I could think of. Another day, and you would have been back on Terra. I don't want to remain in this area any longer than necessary. They have been so certain of finding me out in deep space that I have been able to stay here without too much danger. But even the purloined letter was found eventually. Kramer smoked his cigarette nervously. What are you going to do? Where are we going? First, I want to talk to you. I have many things to discuss. I was very disappointed when you left me along with the others. I had hoped that you would remain. The dry voice chuckled. Remember how we used to talk in the old days, you and I? That was a long time ago. The ship was gaining speed. It plunged through space at tremendous speed, rushing through the last of the defense zone and out beyond. A rush of nausea made Kramer bend over for a moment. When he straightened up, the voice from the wall went on. I'm sorry to step it up so quickly, but we are still in danger. Another few moments and we'll be free. How about yuck ships? Aren't they out there? I've already slipped away from several of them. They're quite curious about me. Curious? They sense that I'm different, more like their own organic minds. They don't like it. I believe they will begin to withdraw from this area soon. Apparently they don't want to get involved with me. They're an odd race, Philip. I would have liked to study them closely, try to learn something about them. I'm of the opinion that they use no inert material. All their equipment and instruments are alive, in some form or another. They don't construct or build at all. The idea of making is foreign to them. They utilize existing forms, even their ships. Where are we going? Kramer said. I want to know where you're taking me. Frankly, I'm not certain. You're not certain? I haven't worked some details out. There are a few vague spots in my program still, but I think that in a short while I'll have them ironed out. What is your program? Kramer said. It's really very simple, but don't you want to come into the control room and sit? The seats are much more comfortable than the metal bench. Kramer went into the control room and sat down at the control board. Looking at the useless apparatus made him feel strange. What's the matter? The speaker above the board rasped. Kramer gestured helplessly. I'm powerless. I can't do anything, and I don't like it. Do you blame me? No. No, I don't blame you. But you'll get your control back soon. Don't worry. This is only a temporary expedient, taking you off this way. It was something I didn't contemplate. I forgot that orders would be given out to shoot me on sight. It was Gross's idea. I don't doubt that. My conception, my plan, came to me as soon as you began to describe your project that day at my house. I saw at once that you were wrong. You people have no understanding of the mind at all. I realized that the transfer of a human brain from an organic body to a complex artificial spaceship would not involve the loss of the intellectualization faculty of the mind. When a man thinks, he is. When I realized that, I saw the possibility of an age-old dream becoming real. I was quite elderly when I first met you, Philip. Even then my lifespan had come pretty much to its end. 
I could look ahead to nothing but death, and with it the extinction of all my ideas. I had made no mark on the world, none at all. My students, one by one, passed from me into the world to take up jobs in the great research project, the search for better and bigger weapons of war. The world has been fighting for a long time, first with itself, then with the Martians, then with these beings from Proxima Centauri, whom we know nothing about. The human society has evolved war as a cultural institution, like the science of astronomy or mathematics. War is a part of our lives, a career, a respected vocation. Bright, alert young men and women move into it, putting their shoulders to the wheel as they did in the time of Nebuchadnezzar. It has always been so. But is it innate in mankind? I don't think so. No social custom is innate. There were many human groups that did not go to war. The Eskimos never grasped the idea at all, and the American Indians never took to it well. But these dissenters were wiped out, and a cultural pattern was established that became the standard for the whole planet. Now it has become ingrained in us. But if some place along the line, some other way of settling problems had arisen and taken hold, something different than the massing of men and materials to— What's your plan? Kramer said. I know the theory. It was part of one of your lectures. Yes buried in a lecture on plant selection, as I recall. When you came to me with this proposition, I realized that perhaps my conception could be brought to life after all. If my theory were right that war is only a habit, not an instinct, a society built up apart from Terra with a minimum of cultural roots might develop differently. If it failed to absorb our outlook, if it could start out on another foot, it might not arrive at the same point to which we have come, a dead end, with nothing but greater and greater wars in sight until nothing is left but ruin and destruction everywhere. Of course, there would have to be a watcher to guide the experiment at first. A crisis would undoubtedly come very quickly, probably in the second generation. Cain would arise almost at once. You see, Kramer, I estimate that if I remain at rest most of the time on some small planet or moon, I may be able to keep functioning for almost a hundred years. That would be time enough, sufficient to see the direction of the new colony. After that, well, after that it would be up to the colony itself. Which is just as well, of course. Man must take control eventually on his own. One hundred years, and after that they will have control of their own destiny. Perhaps I am wrong. Perhaps war is more than a habit. Perhaps it is a law of the universe that things can only survive as groups by group violence. But I'm going ahead and taking the chance that it is only habit, that I'm right, that war is something we're so accustomed to that we don't realize it is a very unnatural thing. Now, as to the place. I'm still a little vague about that. We must find the place still. That's what we're doing now. You and I are going to inspect a few systems off the beaten path, planets where the trading prospects are low enough to keep Terran ships away. I know of one planet that might be a good place. It was reported by the Fairchild Expedition in their original manual. We may look into that for a start. The ship was silent. Kramer sat for a time, staring down at the metal floor under him. The floor throbbed dully with the motion of the turbines. At last he looked up. You might be right. Maybe our outlook is only habit. Kramer got to his feet. But I wonder if something has occurred to you. What is that? If it's such a deeply ingrained habit going back thousands of years, how are you going to get your colonists to make the break, leave Terra and Terran customs? How about this generation, the first ones, the people who found the colony? I think you're right in that the next generation would be free of all this if there were an... He grinned. An old man, above, to teach them something else instead. Kramer looked up at the wall speaker. How are you going to get the people to leave Terra and come with you if, by your own theory, this generation can't be saved? It all has to start with the next. The wall speaker was silent. Then it made a sound, 
the faint, dry chuckle. I'm surprised at you, Philip. Settlers can be found. We won't need many. Just a few. The speaker chuckled again. I'll acquaint you with my solution. At the far end of the corridor a door slid open. There was a sound, a hesitant sound. Kramer turned. Dolores? Dolores Kramer stood uncertainly looking into the control room. She blinked in amazement. Phil, what are you doing here? What's going on? They stared at each other. What's happening? Dolores said. I received a vid call that you had been hurt in a lunar explosion. The wall speaker rasped into life. You see, Philip, that problem is already solved. We don't really need so many people. Even a single couple might do. Kramer nodded slowly. I see, he murmured thickly. Just one couple, one man and woman. They might make it all right if there were someone to watch and see that things went on as they should. There will be quite a few things I can help you with, Philip. Quite a few. We'll get along very well, I think. Kramer grinned wryly. You could even help us name the animals, he said. I understand that's the first step. I'll be glad to, the toneless, impersonal voice said. As I recall, my part will be to bring them to you one by one. Then you can do the actual naming. I, I don't understand, Dolores faltered. What does he mean, Phil, naming animals? What kind of animals? Where are we going? Kramer walked slowly over to the port and stood staring silently out, his arms folded. Beyond the ship a myriad fragments of light gleamed, countless coals glowing in the dark void. Stars, suns, systems. Endless without number. A universe of worlds, an infinity of planets waiting for them, gleaming and winking from the darkness. He turned back, away from the port. Where are we going? He smiled at his wife, standing nervous and frightened, her large eyes full of alarm. I don't know where we're going, he said, but somehow that doesn't seem too important right now. I'm beginning to see the professor's point. It's the results that count. And for the first time in many months he put his arm around Dolores. At first she stiffened, the fright and nervousness still in her eyes. But then suddenly she relaxed against him and there were tears wetting her cheeks. Phil, do, do you really think we can start over again, you and I? He kissed her tenderly, then passionately, and the spaceship shot swiftly through the endless, trackless eternity of the void. End of Mr. Spaceship by Philip K. Dick Machine by Hugh B. Cave. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nick Number. The Murder Machine by Hugh B. Cave. It was dusk on the evening of December 7, 1906, when I first encountered Sir John Harmon. At the moment of his entrance I was standing over the table in my study, a lighted match in my cupped hands and a pipe between my teeth. The pipe was never lit. I heard the lower door slam shut with a violent clatter. The stairs resounded to a series of unsteady footbeats and the door of my study was flung back. In the opening, staring at me with quiet dignity, stood a young, careless fellow, about five feet ten in height and decidedly dark of complexion. The swagger of his entrance branded him as an adventurer. The ghastly pallor of his face, which was almost colorless, branded him as a man who has found something more than mere adventure. "'Dr. Dale?' he demanded. "'I am Dr. Dale.' He closed the door of the room deliberately, advancing toward me with slow steps. "'My name is John Harmon, Sir John Harmon. It is unusual, I suppose,' he said quietly with a slight shrug. "'Coming at this late hour, I won't keep you long.' He faced me silently. A single glance at those strained features convinced me of the reason for his coming. Only one thing can bring such a furtive, restless stare to a man's eyes. Only one thing. Fear. I've come to you, Dale, because... Sir John's fingers closed heavily over the edge of the table. 
Because I am on the verge of going mad. From fear? From fear, yes. I suppose it is easy to discover. A single look at me. A single look at you, I said simply, would convince any man that you are deadly afraid of something. Do you mind telling me just what it is? He shook his head slowly. The swagger of the poise was gone. He stood upright now with a positive effort, as if the realization of his position had suddenly surged over him. I do not know, he said quietly. It is a childish fear, fear of the dark, you may call it. The cause does not matter, but if something does not take this unholy terror away, the effect will be madness. I watched him in silence for a moment, studying the shrunken outline of his face and the unsteady gleam of his narrowed eyes. I had seen this man before. All London had seen him. His face was constantly appearing in the sporting pages, a swaggering member of the upper set, a man who had been engaged to nearly every beautiful woman in the country, who sought adventure in sport and in nightlife merely for the sake of living at top speed. And here he stood before me, whitened by fear, the very thing he had so deliberately laughed at. Dale, he said slowly, for the past week I have been thinking things that I do not want to think and doing things completely against my will. Some outside power, God knows what it is, is controlling my very existence. He stared at me and leaned closer across the table. Last night, some time before midnight, he told me, I was sitting alone in my den. Alone, mind you, not a soul was in the house with me. I was reading a novel, and suddenly, as if a living presence had stood in the room and commanded me, I was forced to put the book down. I fought against it, fought to remain in that room and go on reading, and I failed. Failed? My reply was a single word of wonder. I left my home because I could not help myself. Have you ever been under hypnotism, Dale? Yes? Well, the thing that gripped me was something similar, except that no living person came near me in order to work his hypnotic spell. I went alone the whole way, through back streets, alleys, filthy dooryards, never once striking a main thoroughfare, until I had crossed the entire city and reached the west side of the square. And there, before a big gray townhouse, I was allowed to stop my mad wandering. The power, whatever it was, broke. I, well, I went home. Sir John got to his feet with an effort and stood over me. Dale, he whispered hoarsely, what was it? You were conscious of every detail, I asked, conscious of the time, of the locality you went to, you are sure it was not some fantastic dream? Dream? Is it a dream to have some damnable force move me about like a mechanical robot? But you can think of no explanation? I was a bit skeptical of his story. He turned on me savagely. I have no explanation, doctor, he said curtly. I came to you for the explanation, and while you are thinking over my case during the next few hours, perhaps you can explain this. When I stood before that gray mansion on After Street, alone in the dark, there was murder in my heart. I should have killed the man who lived in that house had I not been suddenly released from the force that was driving me forward. Sir John turned from me in bitterness. Without offering any word of departure, he pulled open the door and stepped across the sill. The door closed, and I was alone. That was my introduction to Sir John Harmon. I offer it in detail because it was the first of a startling series of events that led to the most terrible case of my career. In my records I have labeled the entire case, The Affair of the Death Machine. Twelve hours after Sir John's departure, which will bring the time to the morning of December 8th, the headlines of the Daily Mail stared up at me from the table. They were black and heavy, those headlines and horribly significant. They were... Franklin White, Jr. found murdered. Midnight Marauder strangles young society man in West End Mansion. I turned the paper hurriedly and read. Between the hours of one and two o'clock this morning, an unknown murderer entered the home of Franklin White, Jr., well-known West End sportsman, and escaped, leaving behind his strangled victim. Young White, who is a favorite in London upper circles, was discovered in his bed this morning, where he had evidently lain dead for many hours. Police are seeking a motive for the crime which may have its origin in the fact that White only recently announced his engagement to Margot Vernet, young and exceedingly pretty French debutante. Police say that the murderer was evidently an amateur and that he made no attempt to cover his crime. Inspector Thomas Drake of Scotland Yard has the case. There was more, much more. Young White had evidently been a decided favorite, and the murder had been so unexpected, so deliberate, that the mail reporter had made the most of his opportunity for a story. But aside from what I have reprinted, there was only a single short paragraph which claimed my attention. It was this. 
The white home is not a difficult one to enter. It is a huge gray townhouse, situated just off the square in After Street. The murderer entered by a low French window, leaving it open. I have copied the words exactly as they were printed. The item does not call for any comment. But I had hardly dropped the paper before she stood before me. I say she, it was Margot Vernet, of course, because for some peculiar reason I had expected her. She stood quietly before me, her cameo face set in the black of mourning, staring straight into mine. "'You know why I have come?' she said quickly. I glanced at the paper on the table before me and nodded. Her eyes followed my glance. "'That is only part of it, doctor,' she said. "'I was in love with Franklin, very much, but I have come to you for something more, because you are a famous psychologist and can help me.' She sat down quietly, leaning forward so that her arms rested on the table. Her face was white, almost as white as the face of that young adventurer who had come to me on the previous evening, and when she spoke her voice was hardly more than a whisper. Doctor, for many days now I have been under some strange power, something frightful that compels me to think and act against my will. She glanced at me suddenly as if to note the effect of her words, then— I was engaged to Franklin for more than a month, Doctor, yet for a week now I have been commanded, commanded by some awful force, to return to... to a man who knew me more than two years ago. I can't explain it. I did not love this man. I hated him bitterly. Now comes this mad desire, this hungering, to go to him. And last night... Margot Vernet hesitated suddenly. She stared at me searchingly. Then, with renewed courage, she continued... Last night, doctor, I was alone. I had retired for the night, and it was late, nearly three o'clock, and then I was strangely commanded by this awful power that has suddenly taken possession of my soul to go out. I tried to restrain myself, and in the end I found myself walking through the square. I went straight to Franklin White's home. When I reached there it was half-past three. I could hear Big Ben. I went in through the wide French window at the side of the house. I went straight to Franklin's room because I could not prevent myself from going. A sob came from Margot's lips. She had half risen from her chair and was holding herself together with a brave effort. I went to her side and stood over her, and she, with a half-crazed laugh, stared up at me. He was dead when I saw him, she cried. Dead, murdered. That infernal force, whatever it was, had made me go straight to my lover's side to see him lying there with those cruel finger marks on his throat. Dead, I tell you. I... Oh, it is horrible. She turned suddenly. When I saw him, she said bitterly, the sight of him and the sight of those marks broke the spell that held me. I crept from the house as if I had killed him. They, they will probably find out that I was there, and they will accuse me of the murder. It does not matter, but this power, this awful thing that has been controlling me, is there no way to fight it? I nodded heavily. The memory of that unfortunate fellow who had come to me with the same complaint was still holding me. I was prepared to wash my hands of the whole horrible affair. It was clearly not a medical case, clearly out of my realm. There is a way to fight it, I said quietly. I am a doctor, not a master of hypnotism, or a man who can discover the reasons behind that hypnotism. But London has its Scotland Yard, and Scotland Yard has a man who is one of my greatest comrades. She nodded her surrender. As I stepped to the telephone, I heard her murmur in a weary, troubled voice, "'Hypnotism? It is not that. God knows what it is. But it has always happened when I have been alone. One cannot hypnotize through distance.' And so, with Margot Vernet's consent, I sought the aid of Inspector Thomas Drake of Scotland Yard. In half an hour Drake stood beside me, the quiet of my study. When he had heard Margot's story, he asked a single significant question. It was this. You say you have a desire to go back to a man who was once intimate with you. Who is he? Margot looked at him dully. It is Michael Strange, she said slowly. Michael Strange, of Paris, a student of science. Drake nodded. Without further questioning, he dismissed my patient, and when she had gone, he turned to me. She did not murder her sweetheart, Dale, he said. That is evident. Have you any idea who did? And so I told him of that other young man, Sir John Harmon, who had come to me the night before. When I had finished, Drake stared at me, stared through me, and suddenly turned on his heel. I shall be back, Dale, he said curtly. Wait for me. Wait for him? Well, that was Drake's peculiar way of going about things, impetuous, sudden, until he faced some crisis. Then, in the face of danger, he became a cold, indifferent officer of Scotland Yard. And so I waited. 
During the twenty-four hours that elapsed before Drake returned to my study, I did my best to diagnose the case before me. First, Sir John Harmon, his visit to the home of Franklin White. Then, the deliberate murder. And finally, young Margot Vernet and her confession. It was like the revolving whirl of a pinwheel, this series of events, continuous and mystifying, but without beginning or end. Surely, somewhere in the procession of horrors, there would be a loose end to cling to, some loose end that would eventually unravel the pinwheel. It was plainly not a medical affair, or at least only remotely so. The thing was in proper hands, then, with Drake following it through, and I had only to wait for his return. He came at last and closed the door of the room behind him. He stood over me with something of a swagger. "'Dale, I've been looking into the records of this Michael Strange,' he said quietly. "'They are interesting, those records. They go back some ten years when this fellow Strange was beginning his study of science.' And now Michael Strange is one of the greatest authorities in Paris on the subject of mental telegraphy. He has gone into the study of human thought with the same thoroughness that other scientists go into the subject of radio telegraphy. He has written several books on the subject. Drake pulled a tiny black volume from the pocket of his coat and dropped it on the table before me. With one hand he opened it to a place which he had previously marked in pencil. Read it, he said significantly. I looked at him in wonder and then did as he ordered. What I read was this. Mental telegraphy is a science, not a myth. It is a very real fact, a very real power which can be developed only by careful research. To most people it is merely a curiosity. They sit, for instance, in a crowded room at some uninteresting lecture and stare continually at the back of some unsuspecting companion until that companion, by the power of suggestion, turns suddenly around. Or they think heavily of a certain person nearby, perhaps commanding him mentally to hum a certain popular tune, until the victim, by the power of their will, suddenly fulfills the order. To such persons the science of mental telegraphy is merely an amusement. And so it will be until science has brought it to such a perfection that these waves of thought can be broadcast, that they can be transmitted through the ether precisely as radio waves are transmitted. In other words, mental telegraphy is at present merely a mild form of hypnotism. Until it has been developed so that those hypnotic powers can be directed through space and directed accurately to those individuals to whom they are intended, this science will have no significance. It remains for scientists of today to bring about that development. I closed the book. When I looked up, Drake was watching me intently, as if expecting me to say something. Drake, I said slowly, more to myself than to him, the pinwheel is beginning to unravel. We have found the beginning thread. Perhaps if we follow that thread... Drake smiled. If you'll pick up your hat and coat, Dale, he interrupted, I think we have an appointment. This Michael Strange, whose book you have just enjoyed so immensely, is now residing on a certain quiet little side street, about three miles from the square, in London. I followed Drake in silence until we had left Cheney Lane in the gloom behind us. At the entrance to the square my companion called a cab, and from there on we rode slowly through a heavy darkness which was blanketed by a wet, penetrating fog. The cabby, evidently one who knew my companion by sight, and what London cabby does not know as Scotland Yard men, chose a route that twisted through gloomy, uninhabited side streets, seldom winding into the main route of traffic. As for Drake, he sank back in the uncomfortable seat and made no attempt at conversation. For the entire first part of our journey he said nothing. Not until we had reached a black, unlighted section of the city did he turn to me. Dale, he said at length, have you ever hunted tiger? I looked at him and laughed. Why, I replied, do you expect this hunt of ours will be something of a blind chase? It will be a blind chase, no doubt of it, he said. And when we have followed the trail to its end, I imagine we shall find something very like a tiger to deal with. I have looked rather deeply into Michael Strange's life and unearthed a bit of the man's character. He has twice been accused of murder, murder by hypnotism, and has twice cleared himself by throwing scientific explanations at the police. That is the nature of his entire history for the past ten years. I nodded without replying. As Drake turned away from me again, our cab poked its laboring nose into a narrowing, gloomy street. I had a glimpse of a single unsteady street lamp on the corner and a dim sign, Mate Lane. And then we were dragging along the curb. The cab stopped with a groan. I had stepped down and was standing by the cab door when suddenly, from the darkness in front of me, a strange figure advanced to my side. He glanced at me intently. Then, seeing that I was evidently not the man he sought, he turned to Drake. I heard a whispered greeting and an undertone of conversation. Then, quietly, Drake stepped toward me. Dale, he said, I thought it best that I should not show myself here tonight. No, there is no time for explanation now. You will understand later. Perhaps, 
significantly, sooner than you anticipate. Inspector Hartnett will go through the rest of this pantomime with you. I shook hands with Drake's man, still rather bewildered at the sudden substitution. Then, before I was aware of it, Drake had vanished and the cab was gone. We were alone, Hartnett and I, in Mate Lane. The home of Michael Strange, number seven, was hardly inviting. No light was in evidence. The big house stood like a huge unadorned vault set back from the street, some distance from its adjoining buildings. The heavy steps echoed to our footbeats as we mounted them in the darkness, and the sound of the bell as Hartnett pressed it came sharply to us from the silence of the interior. We stood there, waiting. In the short interval before the door opened, Hartnett glanced at his watch, it was nearly ten o'clock, and said to me, I imagine, doctor, we shall meet a blank wall. Let me do the talking, please. That was all. In another moment the big door was pulled slowly open from the inside, and in the entrance, glaring out at us, stood the man we had come to see. It is not hard to remember that first impression of Michael Strange. He was a huge man, gaunt and haggard, molded with the hunched shoulders and heavy arms of a gorilla. His face seemed to be unconsciously twisted into a snarl. His greeting, which came only after he had stared at us intently for nearly a minute, was curt and rasping. "'Well, gentlemen, what is it?' "'I should like a word with Dr. Michael Strange,' said my companion quietly. "'I am Michael Strange.' "'And I,' replied Hartnett with a suggestion of a smile, "'am Raoul Hartnett from Scotland Yard.' I did not see any sign of emotion on Strange's face. He stepped back in silence to allow us to enter. Then, closing the big door after us, he led the way along a carpeted hall to a small, ill-lighted room just beyond. Here he motioned us to be seated, he himself standing upright beside the table, facing us. "'From Scotland Yard,' he said, and the tone was heavy with dull sarcasm. "'I am at your service, Mr. Hartnett.' And now, for the first time, I wondered just why Drake had insisted on my coming here to this gloomy house in Mate Lane. Why he had so deliberately arranged a substitute so that Michael Strange should not come face to face with him directly. Evidently Hartnett had been carefully instructed as to his course of action, but why this seemingly unnecessary caution on Drake's part? And now, after we had gained admission, what excuse would Hartnett offer for the intrusion? Surely he would not follow the bull-headed role of a common policeman. There was no anger, no attempt at dramatics in Hartnett's voice. He looked quietly up at our host. "'Dr. Strange,' he said at length, "'I have come to you for your assistance. Last night, some time after midnight, Franklin White was strangled to death. He was murdered, according to substantial evidence, by the girl he was going to marry, Margot Vernet. I come to you because you know this girl rather well, and can perhaps help Scotland Yard in finding her motive for killing White.' Michael Strange said nothing. He stood there, scowling down at my companion in silence, and I, too, I must admit, turned upon Hartnett with a stare of bewilderment. His accusation of Margot had brought a sense of horror to me. I had expected almost anything from him, even to a mad accusation of Strange himself, but I had hardly foreseen this cold-blooded declaration. "'You understand, doctor,' Hartnett went on, in that same ironical drawl, "'that we do not believe Margot Vernet did this thing herself. "'She had a companion, undoubtedly, one who accompanied her to the house on After Street, "'and assisted her in the crime. "'Who that companion was we are not sure, "'but there is decidedly a case of suspicion against a certain young London sportsman. "'This fellow is known to have prowled about the White Mansion "'both on the night of the murder and the night before.' Hartnett glanced up casually. Strange's face was a total mask. When he nodded, the nod was the most even and mechanical thing I have ever seen. Certainly this man could control his emotions. Naturally, doctor, Hartnett said, we have gone rather deeply into the past life of the lady in question. Your name appears, of course, in a rather unimportant interval when Margot Vernet resided in Paris, and so we come to you in the hope that you can perhaps give us some slight bit of information, something that seems insignificant, perhaps, to you, but which may put us on the right track. It was a careful speech. Even as Hartnett spoke it, I could have sworn that the words were Drake's and had been memorized, but Michael Strange merely stepped back to the table and faced us without a word. He was probably, during that brief interlude, attempting to realize his position and to discover just how much Raoul Hartnett actually knew. And then, after his interim of silence, he came forward sullenly and stood over my comrade. "'I will tell you this much, Mr. Hartnett of Scotland Yard,' he said bitterly. My relations with Margot Vernet are not an open book to be passed through the clumsy fingers of ignorant police officers. As to this murder, I know nothing. At the time of it I was seated in this room in company with a distinguished group of scientific friends. I will tell you on authority that Margot did not murder her lover. Why? Because she loved him. 
The last words were heavy with bitterness. Before they had died into silence, Michael Strange had opened the door of his study. "'If you please, gentlemen,' he said quietly. Hartnett got to his feet. For an instant he stood facing the gorilla-like form of our host, then he stepped over the sill without a word. We passed down the unlighted corridor in silence while Strange stood in the door of his study watching us. I could not help but feel, as we left that gloomy house, that Strange had suddenly focused his entire attention upon me and had ignored my companion. I could feel those eyes upon me and feel the force of the will behind them. A decided feeling of uneasiness crept over me, and I shuddered. A moment later the big outer door had closed shut after us and we were alone in Mate Lane. Alone, that is, until a third figure joined us in the shadows and Drake's hand closed over my arm. "'Capital, Dale,' he said triumphantly. "'For half an hour you entertained him, you and Hartnett, and for half an hour I've had the unlimited freedom of his inner rooms with the aid of an unlocked window on the lower floor. Those inner rooms, gentlemen, are significant. Very.' As we walked the length of Mate Lane, the gaunt, sinister home of Michael Strange became an indistinct outline in the pitch behind us. Drake said nothing more on the return trip until we had nearly reached my rooms, then he turned to me with a smile. "'We are one up on our friend, Dale,' he said. "'He does not know, just now, which is the bigger fool, you or Hartnett here. However, I imagine Hartnett will be the victim of some very unusual events before many hours have passed.' That was all, at least all of significance. I left the two Scotland Yard men at the opening of Cheney Lane and continued alone to my rooms. I opened the door and let myself in quietly, and there some few hours later began the last and most horrible phase of the case of the murder machine. It began, or to be more accurate, I began to react to it at three o'clock in the morning. I was alone and the rooms were dark. For hours I had sat quietly by the table considering the significant events of the past few days. Sleep was impossible with so many unanswered questions staring into me, and so I sat there wondering. Did Drake actually believe that Margot Vernet's simple story had been a ruse, that she had in truth killed her lover on that midnight intrusion of his home? Did he believe that Michael Strange knew of that intrusion, that he had possibly planned it himself and aided her in order that Margot might be free to return to him? Did Strange know of that other intrusion and of the uncanny power which had driven Sir John Harmon and supposedly driven Margot to that house on After Street? Those were the questions that still remained without answers, and it was over those questions that I pondered, while my surroundings became darker and more silent as the hour became more advanced. I heard the clock strike three and heard the answering drone of Big Ben from the square. And then it began. At first it was little more than a sense of nervousness before I had been content to sit in my chair and doze. Now, in spite of myself, I found myself pacing the floor, back and forth like a caged animal. I could have sworn at the time that some sinister presence had found entrance to my room, yet the room was empty, and I could have sworn too that some silent power of will was commanding me with undeniable force to go out, out into the darkness of Cheney Lane. I fought it bitterly, I laughed at it, yet even through my laugh came the memory of Sir John Harmon and Margot and what they had told me, and then, unable to resist that unspoken demand, I seized my hat and coat and went out. Cheney Lane was deserted, utterly still. At the end of it the street lamp glowed dully, throwing a patch of ghastly light over the side of the adjoining building. I hurried through the shadows, and as I walked a single idea had possession of me. I must hurry, I thought, with all possible speed, to that grim house in Mate Lane, number seven. Where that deliberate desire came from I did not know. I did not stop to reason. Something had commanded me to go at once to Michael Strange's home, and though I stopped more than once, deliberately turning in my tracks, inevitably I was forced to retrace my steps and continue. I remember passing through the square and prowling through the unlightened side streets that lay beyond. Three miles separated Cheney Lane from Mate Lane, and I had been over the route only once before, in a cab. Yet I followed that route without a single false turn, followed it instinctively. At every intersecting street I was dragged in a certain direction, and not once was I allowed to hesitate. It was as though some unseen demon perched on my shoulders, as the demon of the sea rode Sinbad and pointed out the way. Only one disturbing thing occurred on that night journey through London. I had turned into a narrow street hardly more than a quarter mile from my destination, and before me, in the shadows, I made out the form of a shuffling old man. And here, as I watched him, I was conscious of a new, mad desire. I crept upon him stealthily, without a sound. My hands were outstretched, clutching for his throat. At that moment I should have killed him. I cannot explain it. During that brief interval I was a murderer at heart. I wanted to kill. 
and now that I remember it, the desire had been pregnant in me ever since the lights of Cheney Lane had died behind me. All the time that I prowled through those black streets, murder lurked in my heart. I should have killed the first man who crossed my path. But I did not kill him. Thank God, as my fingers twisted toward the back of his throat, that mad desire suddenly left me. I stood still while the old fellow, still unsuspecting, shuffled away into the darkness. Then, dropping my hands with a sob of helplessness, I went forward again. And so I reached Mate Lane and the huge gray house that awaited me. This time, as I mounted the stone steps, the old house seemed even more repulsive and horrible. I dreaded to see that door open, but I could not retreat. I dropped the knocker heavily. A moment passed, and then, precisely as before, the huge door swung inward. Michael Strange stood before me. He did not speak. Perhaps if he had spoken, that fiendish spell would have been broken, and I should have returned even then to my own peaceful little rooms in Cheney Lane. No, he merely held the door for me to enter, and as I passed him he stood there, watching me with a significant smile. Straight to that familiar room at the end of the hall I went, with Strange behind me. When we had entered, he closed the door cautiously. For a moment he faced me without speaking. You came very close to committing a murder on your way here, did you not, Dale? I stared at him. How in God's name could this man read my thoughts so completely? You would have completed the murder, he said softly, had I wished it. I did not wish it. I did not answer. There was no reply to such a mad declaration. As for my companion, he watched me for an instant and then laughed. He was not mad. I am doctor enough to know that. But the laugh was not long in duration. He stepped forward suddenly and took my arm in a steel grip, dragging me toward the half-hidden door at the farther end of the room. I shall not keep you long, Dale, he said harshly. I could have killed you, could have made you kill yourself, and in fact, I intended to do so. But after all, you are merely a poor stumbling fool who has meddled in things too deep for you. He pulled open the door and pushed me forward. The room was dark, and not until he had closed the door again and switched on a dim light could I see its contents. Even then I saw nothing, at least nothing of importance to an unscientific mind. There was a low table against the wall, with a profusion of tiny wires emanating from it. I was aware that a cup-shaped microphone, or something very similar, hung over the table about on a level with my eyes had I been sitting in the chair. Beyond that I saw nothing, until Strange had moved forward and drawn aside a curtain that hung beside the table. "'I made you come here tonight, Dale,' he murmured, "'because I was a bit afraid of you. Your comrade, Hartnett, was an ignorant police officer. He has not the intellect to connect the series of events of the past day or two, and so I did not trouble myself with him. But you are an educated man. You have made no demonstrations of your ability in the field of science, but... He stopped speaking abruptly. From the room behind us came the sound of a warning bell. Strange turned quickly and went to the door. You will wait here, doctor, he said. I have another caller tonight, another one who came the same way as you. He vanished. For a short interlude I was alone with that peculiar radio-like apparatus before me. It was, for all the world, like a miniature control room in some small broadcasting station. Except for the odd shape of the microphone, if it was such, I could detect no radical difference in equipment. However, I had little time for conjecture. A patter of footsteps interrupted me from the next room, and a frightened feminine voice broke the stillness of the outer study. Even before the owner of that voice stepped into my presence, I knew her. And when she came, with white, fearful face and trembling body, I could not withhold a shudder of apprehension. It was a young woman who had come to my office, Margot Vernet. Evidently, at last, she had yielded to the horrible impulse that had drawn her back to Michael Strange, an impulse which, I now understood, had originated from the man himself. He pressed her forward. There was nothing tender in his touch. It was cruel and triumphant. "'So you have succeeded, at last,' I said bitterly. He turned to me with a sneer. I have brought her here, yes, he replied, and now that she has come, she shall hear what I have to tell you. It will perhaps give her a respect for me, and this time she will not have the power to turn me away. He pointed to the table, to the apparatus that lay there. I'm telling you this, Dale, he said, because it gives me pleasure to do so. You are enough of a scientist to appreciate and understand it. And if, when I have finished, I have told you too much, there is a very easy way to keep your tongue silent. You have heard of hypnotism, Dale? You have heard also of radio? Have you ever thought of combining the two? He faced me directly. I made no effort to reply. Radio, he said quietly, is broadcast by means of sound waves. That much you know. 
but hypnotism too can be transmitted through distance if an instrument delicate enough to transmit thought waves can be invented for twenty years i have worked on that instrument and for twenty years i have studied hypnotism you understand of course that this instrument is worthless unless it is operated by a master mind thought waves are useless they will not control the actions of even a cat but hypnotic waves or concentrated thought waves will control the world there was no denying him he faced me with the savage triumph of a wild beast he was glorying in his power and in my amazement i wanted franklin white to die he cried it was i who murdered him why because he was about to take the girl i desired is that not reason enough for murder and so i killed him it was not Margot Vernet who strangled her lover. It was a complete stranger, a London sportsman, who had no reason for committing the murder, except that I wished him to. He died on the night of December 7th, murdered by Sir John Harmon, the sportsman. Why? Because of all London, Sir John would be the last man to be suspected. I have a keen appreciation for the irony of fate. White would have died the night before, Dale, except that I lacked the courage to kill him. His murderer was standing, under my power, outside his very house, and then I suddenly thought it best that I should have an alibi. Your Scotland Yard is clever, and it was best that I have protection. And so, on the following night, I sent Sir John to the house once again. This time, while I sat here and controlled the actions of my puppet, a group of men sat here with me. They believed that I was experimenting with a new type of radio receiver. Michael Strange laughed, laughed harshly, in utter triumph, as a cat laughs at the antics of his mouse victims. When that murder was done, he said, I sent Margot to the scene so that she might see her lover strangled, dead. I repeat, Dale, that I enjoy the irony of fate, especially when I can control it. And as for you, I brought you here tonight merely so that you would realize the intensity of the powers that control you. When you leave here, you will be unharmed, but after the exhibition I shall give you, I am sure that you will make no further attempt to interfere with things out of your realm of understanding. I heard a sob from Margot. She had retreated to the door and clung there. For myself, I did not move. Strange's recital had revealed to me the horrible lust that gripped him, and now I watched him in fascination. He would not harm the girl, that much I was sure of. In his distorted fashion, he loved her. In his crazed, murderous way he would attempt to win her love, even though she had once scorned him. I saw him step toward the table, saw him drop heavily into the chair and stare directly into that microphonic thing that hung before his eyes. As he stared, he spoke to me. Science, in its intricate forms, is probably above the mind of a common medical man, Dale, he said. It would be useless to explain to you how my thoughts and my will can be transmitted through space. Perhaps you have sat in a theater and stared at a certain person until that person turned to face you. You have? Then you will perhaps understand how I can control the minds of any human creature within the radius of my power. You see, Dale, this intricate little machine gives me the power to transform London into a city of stark murder. I could bring about such a horrible wave of crime that Scotland Yard would be scorned from one end of the world to the other. I could make every man murder his neighbor until the streets of the city were running with blood. Strange turned quietly to look at me. He spoke deliberately. And now for the little exhibition of which I spoke, Dale, he murmured. Your detective friend, Hartnett, has been under my power for the past three hours. You see, it was safer to control his movements and be sure of him. And now, to be doubly sure of him, perhaps you would like to see him kill himself. I stepped forward with a sudden cry. Strange said nothing. His eyes merely burned into mine. Once again I felt that strange, all-powerful control forcing me back. I retreated, step by step, until the wall stopped me. Yet even as I retreated, a childish hope filled me. How could Strange, working his terrible murder machine, concentrate his power on any individual when the whole of London lay before him? He answered my question. He must have read it as it came over me. Have you ever been in a crowd, Dale, and watched a certain individual intently until that particular individual turned to look at you? The rest of the crowd pays no attention, of course, but that one man. And now we shall make that one man murder himself. Strange turned slowly. I saw his fingers creep along the rim of the table, touching certain wires that came together there. I heard a dull, droning hum fill the room, and over it Strange's penetrating voice. When I am finished, Dale, I shall probably kill you. I brought you here merely to frighten you, but I believe I have told you too much. With that new horror upon me, I saw my captor's lips move slowly. 
and then from the shadows at the other end of the small room came a low, unemotional voice. Before you begin, Strange. Michael Strange whipped about in his chair like a tiger. His hand dropped to his pocket, so swiftly that my eyes did not follow it, and as it dropped, a single staccato shot split the darkness of the room. The scientist slumped forward in his chair. The dull whirring sound of that hellish machine had stopped abruptly, cut short by the sudden weight of Strange's lunging body as he fell upon it. I saw the livid, fiery snake of white light twist suddenly upward through that coil of wires, and in another moment the entire apparatus shattered by a blinding crash of flame. After that I turned away. Whether the bullet killed Strange or not I do not know, but the sight of his charred face hanging over that table of destruction told its own story. It was Inspector Drake who came across the room toward me and took my arm. The smoking revolver still lay in his hand, and as he led me into the adjoining room I saw that Margot had already found refuge there. "'You see now, Dale,' Drake said quietly, "'why I let Hartnett go with you before? If Strange had suspected me, I should have been merely another victim. As for Hartnett, he has been kept under constant guard down at headquarters. He's safe. They've kept him there at my instructions, in spite of all his terrific efforts to leave them.' I was listening to my companion in admiration. Even then I did not quite understand. I was wrong in just one thing, Dale. I left you alone, without protection. I believed Strange would ignore you, because, after all, you are not a Scotland Yard man. Thank God I had the sense to follow Margot, to trail her here, and get here soon enough. And so ended the horrible series of events that began with Sir John Harmon's chance visit to my study. As for Harmon, he was later cleared of all guilt upon the charred evidence in Michael Strange's house in Mate Lane. The girl, I believe, has left London where she can be as far as possible from memories that are all too terrible. As for me, I am back once again in my quiet rooms in Cheney Lane, where the routine of common medical practice has wiped out many of those vivid horrors. In time, I believe, I shall forget, unless Inspector Drake of Scotland Yard insists upon bringing the affair up again. End of The Murder Machine by Hugh B. Cave Recording by Nick Number By Gordon R. Dixon This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Greg Marguerite No Shield from the Dead by Gordon R. Dixon No conceivable force could penetrate Terry's shield, yet he was defenseless. It was a nice little party, but a bit obvious. Terry Mack saw through it before he had taken a half-dozen steps into the apartment, a light flush staining his high cheekbones. This is ridiculous, he said. The light chatter ceased. Cocktail glasses were set down on various handy tables and ledges, and all faces in the room turned toward a man in his late fifties who sat propped up invalid-wise on pillows in a chair in a corner of the room. "'The comptroller is perspicacious,' said the old man agreeably, waving one hand in a casual manner. "'On your way, children.' And the people present smiled and nodded. Quite as if it were an ordinary leave-taking, they pushed past Terry Mack and filed out the door. Even the blonde Terry had picked up at the embassy ball and who had brought him here strolled off casually, but in a decidedly less drunken fashion than she had exhibited earlier in the evening. "'Sit down,' said the old man. Terry Mack did so, gazing searchingly at the skinny frame and white eyebrows in an unsuccessful effort to connect him with something in memory. This is ridiculous, he repeated. Really? The old man smiled benignly. And why so? Why? The situation was so obvious that Terry fumbled a little at the loss for words. Obviously you intend some form of coercion, or else you would have come to me along recognized channels. And any thought of coercion is obviously, well, ridiculous. Why? Why? You senile old fool, don't you know that I'm shielded? 
Don't you know all government officials from the fifth class up wear complete personal shields that are not only crack-proof, but contain all the necessary elements to support life independently within the shield for more than twenty hours? Don't you know that I'll be missed in two hours at the most and tracked down in less than sixty minutes more? Are you crazy?" The old man chuckled, rubbing dry hands together. He said, I'm shielded, too. You can't get at me. And now the room's shielded. You can't get out of it." Terry stared at him. The initial shock was passing. His own statements and the completeness of his protection had brought back confidence, and his natural coolness was returning. "'What do you want?' he asked, eyeing the other narrowly. "'Pleasure of your company,' said the old man. "'There are some very strong connections between us. Yes, very strong. We must get to know each other personally." It occurred to Terry that he had misinterpreted the situation. Relief came, mixed with a certain amount of chagrin at the way in which he allowed himself to show alarm. He had looked ridiculous. He leaned back in the chair and allowed a note of official hauteur and annoyance to creep into his voice. "'I see,' he said. "'You want something?' The old man nodded energetically. "'I do. Indeed I do. And you think you have some kind of bargaining tool that is useful, but might not be so if it became known to official channels." "'Well,' said the old man cautiously. "'Don't waste my time,' interrupted Terry harshly. I'm not an ordinary politician. No man who works his way up to the fifth level of the government is. I didn't get to where I am today by pussyfooting around, and I haven't the leisure to spend on people who do. Now." What do you want?" The other cackled. Now, what do you think? He said, putting one finger to his nose cunningly. You are old, Terry said, and therefore cautious. Consequently, you would not risk trying to force something from me, but are almost certainly trying to sell me something. Now, what do I want? Not the usual things, certainly. Within my position I have all the material things a man could want, and within my shield I enjoy complete immunity. No one but the Central Bureau itself can crack this shield, and no one but they can prevent the conditioned reflex that stops my heart if for some reason the shield should be broached. I have a hold on every man beneath me that prevents him from knifing me in the back. There could only be one thing that I want that you could give me. He leaned forward, staring into the deep, pouched eyes. And that is a means of getting at the man above me. Am I right?" No, said the man. Terry stiffened. No, he echoed in angry incredulity. Their eyes locked. For a long time they held, and at last Terry looked away. The old man sighed, sipped noisily from a drink on the table beside his chair. Wait, said Terry, to his own surprise. His voice was eager, even a little timorous in its hopefulness. Wait, I I've got it. There will be a test. There's always a test every time a man moves up. His superiors watch him when he doesn't suspect it. It will be that way for me when I am ready for the fourth level. And you have some kind of advance information. You know what the test will be. Maybe you know the man who will administer it. You want to sell me this information. The other said nothing. "'Well,' Terry spread his hands openly, "'I am interested. I'll buy. What do you want? Money? A favor? Protection?' "'No.' "'No?' Terry shouted, starting up from his chair. "'What do you mean by no? Can't you say anything but no?' A rage possessed him. He flung himself forward two furious steps to stand threateningly over the aged figure. "'You doddering idiot. Say what you want, and quickly. My two hours are nearly up. I'll be missed. They'll be here in a few minutes. The Bureau guards. They'll crack the room shield. They'll rescue me. And they'll take you into custody, to be questioned, to be executed, at my order. Do you understand? Your life depends on me." After a little, the old man chuckled again. Yes, he muttered in a high-pitched old voice. That's the way it'll be. Terry stared at him. You don't seem to understand. You're going to die. Oh, yes, said the old man, nodding his head indulgently. I'll die, but I'm an old man. I'd die anyway in a year or so, maybe in a day or so. But for you, 
for a young man like you, the up-and-coming young governmental with everything to lose. He leered slyly at Terry. Your death won't be so easy for you to take. I die? echoed Terry, stupefied. But I'm not going to die. They're coming to rescue me. Oh, are they? said the old man ironically. Of course, said Terry. Of course. Why shouldn't they? The old man winked one faded eye portentously. Fine young man, he said. Up and coming young man. Brilliant. Never a thought for the people he trampled on the way up the ladder. Dear me, no. What do you mean? said Terry. The old eyes, looking up, suddenly pierced him. Do you remember Kilaren? Kilaren? Kilaren, recited the old man, as if quoting from a newspaper. The beautiful young secretary of a provincial governor whose lecherous and unnatural pursuit drove her to suicide. So that one day, to escape the governor, she jumped, or fell, from a high window. And the people of the province, who had for a long time heard ugly stories and rumors, finally mobbed the office and lynched the governor, hanging him from the same window from which the girl had jumped. They said that even the fall had not spoiled her beauty, but that was probably false. The old man's words dwindled away into silence. If so, what of it? said Terry. What's that to do with me? Why, you were there. You were the governor's aide, and when the mob had gone home and feeling had slackened off, you stepped into the gap and seized up the reins of government, handling matters so skillfully that you were immediately promoted to an underpost at Government City. What of it? Why, it was all your doing, replied the other in a mildly reproving voice. The rumors, the stories, the mob, even the suicide. Poor Kilaren a pitiful pawn in your ruthless game to eliminate the governor in your mad dash up the ladder. I never touched her, cried Terry, his voice cracking. I swear it. Who said you did? The type of mind that stoops to murder would never have gotten you this far. But you were the one who hired her, knowing the governor's tendencies. You were the one that gave her work that kept her night after night alone with the man. You preyed upon her fear of losing her job. You threw the sin in her face after she had committed it. You told her what she might have been, and what she was, and what she would be. You broke her, day after day. In the sterile privacy of the office you reviled her, scorned her, brought her to believe that she was what she was not, a creature of filth and dishonor. You blocked off all avenues of escape, but the one that led through one high window. You killed her. No. Yes. Terry brought his quivering hands together and clenched them in his lap. He stared at the old man. Who are you? I was a friend of hers. We lived in the same hotel apartment. She had no family. I believe you knew that when you hired her. I see, said Terry. He drew a long, deep, shuddering breath and leaned back in the chair. So that's the story, he said, his voice strengthening. I might have known it. Blackmail. There are always fools that want to try blackmail. No, said the old man. Not blackmail, comptroller. I want your life. Terry laughed shortly, contemptuously. No knowledge that you have can threaten my life. They will come, said the old man, leaning wearily back against his cushions. As you say, the bureau guards will come, and I think I shall kill myself when I hear them starting to crack the shield around this room. They will come in and find you with a dead man. What will you tell them, Terry? Tell them anything I choose. They won't question me. No, the guards won't, but the bureau will. How can they raise a man to the fourth level when there is a two-hour mystery in his background? They will want to know what you were doing here. I was kidnapped, said Terry. By whom? Can you prove it? And why? I've been held a prisoner here. By a dead man? No, no, Terry. The circumstances are suspicious. You walk away from the embassy under your own power. You disappear and are found in a shielded room with a man who has committed suicide. This must be explained, and in the end you will have to tell them the truth. And what if I do? 
said Terry truculently. But the truth is so fantastic, Terry, so uncheckable. I am dead, and I am the only one who could have supported your story. These people who were here when you came in are common actors. They have no idea why I wanted you decoyed here. These are my rooms, and there is no obvious connection between me and the dead Killaren. And perhaps I will decide to live just long enough to denounce you as a traitor when they enter. Ashen-faced, Terry stared. The Bureau will have to question you. They will clamp a block on your mind so that you can't operate the reflex that stops your heart. And they will question you, over and over again. Because the Bureau cannot afford to take chances. You will go into a private hell of your own, Terry Mac. You will tell the story of your own evil to that girl over and over again, pleading to be believed. And they will not believe you. And in the end, they will kill you, just to be on the safe side. Because, you see, you might have been doing something traitorous in these two shielded hours. Terry's head bobbed limply like a drunken man's. He made one last effort. Why? he said. Why do you do this, your life, for a girl who was no connection to you? The old man folded his hands. I was a little like your governor, he said. We all have our sins. I loved Kilaren, and the shock of her death wrecked my health. He cocked his head suddenly on one side. Listen, he said. From beyond the closed door of the room a high-pitched humming was barely audible. It grew in volume, going up the scale. Terry leaped to his feet, and for the space of a couple of seconds he lunged first this way and then that, like a wild animal beating against its trap. Then, as if all will had at last gone out of him, he stopped in the middle of the room and closed his eyes. For a fraction of a moment he stood there, before a faint convulsion seized him, and he fell. With a faint smile on his face the old man reached out to a hidden switch and cut the shield about the room. Uniformed guards tumbled through the door to pull up in dismay at the sight of the body on the floor. "'I'm sorry,' said the old man. I, "'I must have turned the shield on by mistake. I was trying to signal someone. The comptroller seems to have had a heart attack.'" End of No Shield from the Dead by Gordon R. Dixon by Philip K. Dick. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Greg Marguerite. Piper in the Woods by Philip K. Dick. Earth maintained an important garrison on asteroid Y-3. Now suddenly it was imperiled with a biological impossibility, men becoming plants. Well, Corporal Westerberg, Dr. Henry Harris said gently, just why do you think you're a plant? As he spoke, Harris glanced down again at the card on his desk. It was from the base commander himself, made out in Cox's heavy scrawl. Doc, this is the lad I told you about. Talk to him and try to find out how he got this delusion. He's from the new garrison, the new check station on asteroid Y-3, and we don't want anything to go wrong there. Especially a silly damn thing like this. Harris pushed the guard aside and stared back up at the youth across the desk from him. The young man seemed ill at ease and appeared to be avoiding answering the question Harris had put to him. Harris frowned. Westerberg was a good-looking chap, actually handsome in his patrol uniform, a shock of blonde hair over one eye. He was tall, almost six feet, a fine, healthy lad, just two years out of training, according to the card. Born in Detroit, had measles when he was nine, interested in jet engines, tennis, and girls. Twenty-six years old. Well, Corporal Westerberg, Dr. Harris said again, why do you think you're a plant? The Corporal looked up shyly. He cleared his throat. Sir, 
I am a plant. I don't just think so. I've been a plant for several days now. I see, the doctor nodded. You mean that you weren't always a plant? No, sir. I just became a plant recently. And what were you before you became a plant? Well, sir, I was just like the rest of you. There was silence. Dr. Harris took up his pen and scratched a few lines, but nothing of importance came. A plant, and such a healthy-looking lad. Harris removed his steel-rimmed glasses and polished them with his handkerchief. He put them on again and leaned back in his chair. Care for a cigarette, Corporal? No, sir. The doctor lit one himself, resting his arm on the edge of the chair. Corporal, you must realize that there are very few men who become plants, especially on such short notice. I have to admit you are the first person who has ever told me such a thing. Yes, sir, I realize it's quite rare. You can understand why I'm interested, then. When you say you're a plant, you mean you're not capable of mobility? Or do you mean you're a vegetable as opposed to an animal? Or just what? The corporal looked away. I can't tell you any more, he murmured. I'm sorry, sir. Well, would you mind telling me how you became a plant? Corporal Westerberg hesitated. He stared down at the floor, then out the window at the spaceport, then at a fly on the desk. At last he stood up, getting slowly to his feet. I can't even tell you that, sir, he said. You can't? Why not? Because, because I promised not to. The room was silent. Dr. Harris rose, too, and they both stood facing each other. Harris frowned, rubbing his jaw. Corporal. Just who did you promise? I can't even tell you that, sir. I'm sorry. The doctor considered this. At last he went to the door and opened it. All right, Corporal. You may go now. And thanks for your time. I'm sorry I'm not more helpful. The Corporal went slowly out, and Harris closed the door after him. Then he went across his office to the vidphone. He rang Commander Cox's letter. A moment later, the beefy, good-natured face of the base commander appeared. Cox, this is Harris. I talked to him, all right. All I could get is the statement that he's a plant. What else is there? What kind of behavior pattern? Well, Cox said, the first thing they noticed was that he wouldn't do any work. The garrison chief reported that this Westerberg would wander off outside the garrison and just sit all day long. Just sit. In the sun? Yes, just sit in the sun. Then at nightfall he would come back in. When they asked why he wasn't working in the jet repair building, he told them he had to be out in the sun. Then he said, Cox hesitated. Yes, said what? He said that work was unnatural, that it was a waste of time, that the only worthwhile thing was to sit and contemplate outside. What then? Then they asked him how he got that idea, and he revealed to them that he had become a plant. I'm going to have to talk to him again, I can see, Harris said. And he applied for a permanent discharge from the patrol. What reason did he give? The same, that he's a plant now and has no more interest in being a patrolman. All he wants to do is sit in the sun. It's the damnedest thing I ever heard. All right. I think I'll visit him in his quarters. Harris looked at his watch. I'll go over after dinner. Good luck, Cox said gloomily. But who ever heard of a man turning into a plant? We told him it wasn't possible, but he just smiled at us. I'll let you know how I make out, Harris said. Harris walked slowly down the hall. It was after six. The evening meal was over. A dim concept was coming into his mind, but it was much too soon to be sure. He increased his pace, turning right at the end of the hall. Two nurses passed, hurrying by. Westerberg was quartered with a buddy, a man who had been injured in a jet blast and who was now almost recovered. Harris came to the dorm wing and stopped, checking the numbers on the doors. Can I help you, sir? The robot attendant said, gliding up. 
I'm looking for Corporal Westerberg's room. Three doors to the right. Harris went on. Asteroid Y-3 had only recently been garrisoned and staffed. It had become the primary checkpoint to halt and examine ships entering the system from outer space. The garrison made sure that no dangerous bacteria, fungus, or what not arrived to infect the system. A nice asteroid it was, warm, well-watered, with trees and lakes and lots of sunlight, and the most modern garrison in the nine planets. He shook his head, coming to the third door. He stopped, raising his hand and knocking. "'Who's there?' sounded through the door. "'I want to see Corporal Westerberg.' The door opened. A bovine youth with horn-rimmed glasses looked out, a book in his hand. "'Who are you?' "'Dr. Harris.' "'I'm sorry, sir. Corporal Westerberg is asleep.' "'Would he mind if I woke him up? I want very much to talk to him.' Harris peered inside. He could see a neat room with a desk, a rug, and lamp, and two bunks. On one of the bunks was Westerberg, lying face up, his arms folded across his chest, his eyes tightly closed. "'Sir,' the bovine youth said, "'I'm afraid I can't wake him up for you much as I'd like to.' "'You can't. Why not?' "'Sir, Corporal Westerberg won't wake up. Not after the sun sets. He just won't. He—' can't be wakened. Cataleptic? Really? But in the morning, as soon as the sun comes up, he leaps out of bed and goes outside, stays the whole day. I see, the doctor said. Well, thanks anyhow. He went back out into the hall, and the door shut after him. There's more to this man than I realized, he murmured. He went on back the way he had come. It was a warm, sunny day. The sky was almost free of clouds, and a gentle wind moved through the cedars along the bank of the stream. There was a path leading from the hospital building down the slope to the stream. At the stream a small bridge led over to the other side, and a few patients were standing on the bridge, wrapped in their bathrobes, looking aimlessly down at the water. It took Harris several minutes to find Westerberg. The youth was not with the other patients, near or around the bridge. He had gone farther down, past the cedar trees, and out onto a strip of bright meadow where poppies and grass grew everywhere. He was sitting on the stream bank on a flat gray stone, leaning back and staring up, his mouth open a little. He did not notice the doctor until Harris was almost beside him. Hello? Harris said softly. Westerberg opened his eyes, looking up. He smiled and got slowly to his feet a graceful flowing motion that was rather surprising for a man of his size. Hello, doctor. What brings you out here? Nothing. Thought I'd get some sun. Here, you can share my rock. Westerberg moved over, and Harris sat down gingerly, being careful not to catch his trousers on the sharp edges of the rock. He lit a cigarette and gazed silently down at the water. Beside him, Westerberg had resumed his strange position, leaning back, resting on his hands, staring up with his eyes shut tight. "'Nice day,' the doctor said. "'Yes.' "'Do you come here every day?' "'Yes.' "'You like it better out here than inside?' "'I can't stay inside,' Westerberg said. "'You can't. How do you mean, can't? You would die without air, wouldn't you? The corporal said. And you'd die without sunlight? Westerberg nodded. Corporal, may I ask you something? Do you plan to do this the rest of your life? Sit out in the sun on a flat rock? Nothing else? Westerberg nodded. How about your job? You went to school for years to become a patrolman. You wanted to enter the patrol very badly. You were given a fine rating and a first-class position. How do you feel giving all that up? You know it won't be easy to get back in. Do you realize that? I realize it. And you're really going to give it all up? That's right. Harris was silent for a while. At last he put his cigarette out and turned toward the youth. All right. 
Let's say you give up your job and sit in the sun. Well, what happens then? Someone else has to do the job instead of you, isn't that true? The job has to be done. Your job has to be done. And if you don't do it, someone else has to. I suppose so. Westerberg, suppose everyone felt the way you do. Suppose everyone wanted to sit in the sun all day. What would happen? No one would check ships coming from outer space. Bacteria and toxic crystals would enter the system and cause mass death and suffering. Isn't that right? If everyone felt the way I do, they wouldn't be going into outer space. But they have to. They have to trade. They have to get minerals and products and new plants. Why? To keep society going. Why? Well, Harris gestured, people couldn't live without society. Westerberg said nothing to that. Harris watched him, but the youth did not answer. Isn't that right? Harris said. Perhaps. It's a peculiar business, Doctor. You know, I struggled for years to get through training. I had to work and pay my own way, wash dishes, work in kitchens, studied at night, learned, crammed, worked on and on. And you know what I think now? What? I wish I'd become a plant earlier. Dr. Harris stood up. Westerberg, when you come inside, will you stop off at my office? I want to give you a few tests, if you don't mind. The shock box? Westerberg smiled. I knew that would be coming around. Sure, I don't mind. Nettled, Harris left the rock, walking back up the bank a short distance. About three, Corporal. The Corporal nodded. Harris made his way up the hill to the path toward the hospital building. The whole thing was beginning to become more clear to him. A boy who had struggled all his life, financial insecurity, idealized goal, getting a patrol assignment, finally reached it, found the load too great, and on asteroid Y3 there was too much vegetation to look at all day. Primitive identification and projection on the flora of the asteroid. Concept of security involved in immobility and permanence. Unchanging forest. He entered the building. A robot orderly stopped him almost at once. Sir Commander Cox wants you urgently on the vidphone. Thanks. Harris strode to his office. He dialed Cox's letter, and the commander's face came presently into focus. Cox, this is Harris. I've been out talking to the boy. I'm beginning to get this lined up. Now I can see the pattern. Too much load, too long. Finally gets what he wants, and the idealization shatters under the— Harris! Cox barked. Shut up and listen. I just got a report from Y3. They're sending an express rocket here. It's on the way. An express rocket? Five more cases like Westerberg. All say they're plants. The garrison chief is worried as hell. Says we must find out what it is or the garrison will fall apart right away. Do you get me, Harris? Find out what it is. Yes, sir, Harris murmured. Y yes, sir. By the end of the week there were twenty cases, and all, of course, were from Asteroid Y-3. Commander Cox and Harris stood together at the top of the hill, looking gloomily down at the stream below. Sixteen men and four women sat in the sun along the bank, none of them moving, none speaking. An hour had gone by since Cox and Harris appeared, and in all that time the twenty people below had not stirred. I don't get it, Cox said, shaking his head. I just absolutely don't get it. Harris. Is this the beginning of the end? Is everything going to start cracking around us? It gives me a hell of a strange feeling to see those people down there, basking away in the sun, just sitting and basking. Who's that man there with the red hair? That's Ulrich Deutsch. He was second in command at the garrison. Now look at him. Sits and dozes with his mouth open and his eyes shut. A week ago that man was climbing, going right to the top. When the garrison chief retires, he was supposed to take over, maybe another year at the most. All his life he's been climbing to get up there. And now he sits in the sun, Harris finished. That woman, the brunette with the short hair, career woman, head of the entire office staff at the garrison, and the man beside her, 
janitor. And that cute little gal there with the bosom? Secretary, just out of school. All kinds. And I got a note this morning. Three more coming in sometime today. Harris nodded. The strange thing is they really want to sit down there. They're completely rational. They could do something else, but they just don't care to. Well, Cox said, what are you going to do? Have you found anything? We're counting on you. Let's hear it. I couldn't get anything out of them directly, Harris said, but I've had some interesting results with the shock box. Let's go inside and I'll show you. Fine. Cox turned and started toward the hospital. Show me anything you've got. This is serious. Now I know how Tiberius felt when Christianity showed up in high places. Harris snapped off the light. The room was pitch black. I'll run this first reel for you. The subject is one of the best biologists stationed at the garrison, Robert Bradshaw. He came in yesterday. I got a good run from the shock box because Bradshaw's mind is so highly differentiated. There's a lot of repressed material of a non-rational nature, more than usual. He pressed the switch. The projector whirred, and on the far wall a three-dimensional image appeared in color, so real that it might have been the man himself. Robert Bradshaw was a man of fifty, heavy-set, with iron-gray hair and a square jaw. He sat in the chair calmly, his hands resting on the arms, oblivious to the electrodes attached to his neck and wrist. There I go, Harris said. Watch. His film image appeared, approaching Bradshaw. Now, Mr. Bradshaw, his image said, this won't hurt you at all, and it'll help us a lot. The image rotated the controls on the shock box. Bradshaw stiffened and his jaw set, but otherwise he gave no sign. The image of Harris regarded him for a time and then stepped away from the controls. Can you hear me, Mr. Bradshaw? The image asked. Yes. What is your name? Robert C. Bradshaw. What is your position? Chief Biologist at the check station on Y-3. Are you there now? No, I'm back on Terra in a hospital. Why? Because I admitted to the garrison chief that I had become a plant. Is that true, that you are a plant? Yes. In a non-biological sense, I retain the physiology of a human being, of course. What do you mean, then, that you're a plant? The reference is to attitudinal response, to Weltenschung. Go on. It is possible for a warm-blooded animal and upper primate to adopt the psychology of a plant to some extent. Yes. I refer to this. And the others, they refer to this also? Yes. How did this occur, your adopting this attitude? Bradshaw's image hesitated, the lips twitching. See? Harris said to Cox. Strong conflict. He wouldn't have gone on if he had been fully conscious. I... Yes? I was taught to become a plant. The image of Harris showed surprise and interest. What do you mean you were taught to become a plant? They realized my problems and taught me to become a plant. Now I'm free from them, the problems. Who? Who taught you? The Pipers. Who? The Pipers? Who are the Pipers? There was no answer. Mr. Bradshaw, who are the Pipers? After a long, agonized pause, the heavy lips parted. They live in the woods. Harris snapped off the projector, and the lights came on. He and Cox blinked. That was all I could get, Harris said. But I was lucky to get that. He wasn't supposed to tell. Not at all. That was the thing they all promised not to do, tell who taught them to become plants. The Pipers who live in the woods on Asteroid Y-3. You got this story from all twenty? No, Harris grimaced. Most of them put up too much fight. I couldn't even get this much from them. Cox reflected. The Pipers. Well, what do you propose to do? Just wait around until you can get the full story? Is that your program? No, Harris said. Not at all. 
I'm going to Y-3 and find out who the Pipers are myself. The small patrol ship made its landing with care and precision, its jets choking into final silence. The hatch slid back, and Dr. Henry Harris found himself staring out at a field of brown, sun-baked landing field. At the end of the field was a tall signal tower. Around the field, on all sides, were long, gray buildings, the garrison check station itself. Not far off, a huge Venusian cruiser was parked, a vast green hulk, like an enormous lime. The technicians from the station were swarming all over it, checking and examining each inch of it for lethal life-forms and poisons that might have attached themselves to the hull. "'All out, sir,' the pilot said. Harris nodded. He took hold of his two suitcases and stepped carefully down. The ground was hot underfoot, and he blinked in the bright sunlight. Jupiter was in the sky, and the vast planet reflected considerable sunlight down onto the asteroid. Harris started across the field, carrying his suitcases. A field attendant was already busy opening the storage compartment of the patrol ship, extracting his trunk. The attendant lowered the trunk into a waiting dolly and came after him, manipulating the little truck with bored skill. As Harris came to the entrance of the signal tower, the gate slid back and a man came forward, an older man, large and robust, with white hair and a steady walk. How are you, doctor? he said, holding out his hand. I'm Lawrence Watts, the garrison chief. They shook hands. Watts smiled down at Harris. He was a huge old man, still regal and straight in his dark blue uniform with his gold epaulets sparkling on his shoulders. Have a good trip? Watts asked. Come on inside and I'll have a drink fixed for you. It gets hot around here with the big mirror up there. Jupiter? Harris followed him inside the building. The signal tower was cool and dark, a welcome relief. Why is the gravity so near Terra as I expected to go flying off like a kangaroo? Is it artificial? No. There's a dense core of some kind to the asteroid, some kind of metallic deposit. That's why we picked this asteroid out of all the others. It made the construction problem much simpler, and it also explains why the asteroid has natural air and water. Did you see the hills? The hills? When we get up higher in the tower, we'll be able to see over the buildings. There's quite a natural park here, a regular little forest, complete with everything you'd want. Come in here, Harris. This is my office. The old man strode at quite a clip around the corner and into a large, well-furnished apartment. Isn't this pleasant? I intend to make my last year here as amiable as possible. He frowned. Of course, with Deutsch gone, I may be here forever. Oh, well. He shrugged. Sit down, Harris. Thanks. Harris took a chair, stretching his legs out. He watched Watts as he closed the door to the hall. By the way, any more cases come up? Two more today. Watts was grim. Makes almost thirty in all. We have three hundred men in this station. At the rate it's going. Chief, you spoke about a forest on the asteroid. Do you allow the crew to go into the forest at will? Or do you restrict them to the buildings and grounds? Watts rubbed his jaw. Well, it's a difficult situation, Harris. I have to let the men leave the ground sometime. They can see the forest from the buildings, and as long as you can see a nice place to stretch out and relax, that does it. Once every ten days they have a full period of rest, and then they go out and fool around. And then it happens? Yes, I suppose so, but as long as they can see the forest they'll want to go, I can't help it. I know. I'm not censuring you. Well, what's your theory? What happens to them out there? What do they do? What happens? Once they get out there and take it easy for a while, they don't want to come back and work. It's boondoggling, playing hooky. They don't want to work, so off they go. How about this business of their delusions? Watts laughed good-naturedly. Listen, Harris, you know as well as I do that it's a lot of poppycock. They're no more plants than you or I. They just don't want to work, that's all. When I was a cadet, we had a few ways to make people work. I wish we could lay a few on their backs like we used to. You think this is simple gold-bricking, then? 
Don't you think it is? No, Harris said. They really believe their plants. I put them through the high-frequency shock treatment, the shock box. The whole nervous system is paralyzed, all inhibitions stopped cold. They tell the truth then, and they said the same thing, and more. Watts paced back and forth, his hands clasped behind his back. Harris, you're a doctor, and I suppose you know what you're talking about, but look at the situation here. We have a garrison, a good modern garrison. We're probably the most modern outfit in the system. Every new device and gadget is here that science can produce. Harris, this garrison is one vast machine. The men are parts, and each has his job. The maintenance crew, the biologists, the office crew, the managerial staff. Look what happens when one person steps away from his job. Everything else begins to creak. We can't service the bugs if no one services the machines. We can't order food to feed the crews if no one makes out the reports, takes inventories. We can't direct any kind of activity if the second-in-command decides to go out and sit in the sun all day. Thirty people. One-tenth of the garrison. But we can't run without them. The garrison is built that way. If you take the supports out, the whole building falls. No one can leave. We're all tied here, and these people know it. They know they have no right to do that run off on their own. No one has that right any more. We're all too tightly interwoven to suddenly start doing what we want. It's unfair to the rest, the majority." Harris nodded. Chief, can I ask you something? What is it? Are there any inhabitants on the asteroid? Any natives? Natives? Watts considered. Yes, there's some kind of aborigines living out there. He waved vaguely toward the window. What are they like? Have you seen them? Yes, I've seen them. At least I saw them when we first came here. They hung around for a while, watching us, then after a time they disappeared. Did they die off? Diseases of some kind? No, they just disappeared into the forest. They're still there someplace. What kind of people are they? Well, the story is that they're originally from Mars, though they don't look much like Martians. They're dark, a kind of coppery color, thin, very agile in their own way. They hunt and fish, no written language. We don't pay much attention to them. I see. Harris paused. Chief, have you ever heard of anything called the Pipers? The Pipers? Watts frowned. No. Why? The patients mentioned something called the Pipers. According to Bradshaw, the Pipers taught him to become a plant. He learned it from them. A kind of teaching. The Pipers? What are they? I don't know, Harris admitted. I thought maybe you might know. My first assumption, of course, was that they're natives. But now I'm not so sure, not after hearing your description of them. The natives are primitive savages. They don't have anything to teach anybody, especially a top-flight biologist." Harris hesitated. Chief, I'd like to go into the woods and look around. Is that possible? Certainly. I can arrange it for you. I'll give you one of the men to show you around. I'd rather go alone. Is there any danger? No, none that I know of, except— Except the Pipers, Harris finished. I know. Well. There's only one way to find them, and that's it. I'll have to take my chances." If you walk in a straight line, Chief Watts said, you'll find yourself back at the garrison in about six hours. It's a damn small asteroid. There's a couple of streams and lakes, so don't fall in. How about snakes or poisonous insects? Nothing like that reported. We did a lot of tramping around at first, but it's grown back now the way it was. We never encountered anything dangerous. Thanks, Chief," Harris said. They shook hands. I'll see you before nightfall. Good luck. The Chief and his two armed escorts turned and went back across the rise, down the other side toward the garrison. Harris watched them go until they disappeared inside the building. Then he turned and started into the grove of trees. The woods were very silent around him as he walked. Trees towered up on all sides of him huge dark green trees like eucalyptus. The ground underfoot was soft with endless leaves that had fallen and rotted into soil. 
After a while the grove of high trees fell behind, and he found himself crossing a dry meadow. The grass and weeds burned brown in the sun. Insects buzzed around him, rising up from the dry weed stalks. Something scuttled ahead, hurrying through the undergrowth. He caught sight of a gray ball with many legs, scampering furiously, its antenna weaving. The meadow ended at the bottom of a hill. He was going up now, going higher and higher. Ahead of him an endless expanse of green rose, acres of wild growth. He scrambled to the top finally, blowing and panting, catching his breath. He went on. Now he was going down again, plunging into a deep gully. Tall ferns grew as large as trees. He was entering a living Jurassic forest, ferns that stretched out endlessly ahead of him. Down he went, walking carefully. The air began to turn cold around him. The floor of the gully was damp and silent. Underfoot the ground was almost wet. He came out on a level table. It was dark, with the ferns growing up on all sides, dense growths of ferns, silent and unmoving. He came upon a natural path, an old stream bed, rough and rocky, but easy to follow. The air was thick and oppressive. Beyond the ferns he could see the side of the next hill, a green field rising up. Something gray was ahead. Rocks, piled up boulders, scattered and stacked here and there. The stream bed led directly to them. Apparently this had been a pool of some kind, a stream emptying from it. He climbed the first of the boulders awkwardly, feeling his way up. At the top he paused, resting again. As yet he had had no luck. So far he had not met any of the natives. It would be through them that he would find the mysterious pipers that were stealing the men away, if such really existed. If he could find the natives, talk to them, perhaps he could find out something. But as yet he had been unsuccessful. He looked around. The woods were very silent. A slight breeze moved through the ferns, rustling them, but that was all. Where were the natives? Probably they had a settlement of some sort, huts, a clearing. The asteroid was small. He should be able to find them by nightfall. He started down the rocks. More rocks rose up ahead, and he climbed them. Suddenly he stopped, listening. Far off he could hear a sound, the sound of water. Was he approaching a pool of some kind? He went on again, trying to locate the sound. He scrambled down the rocks and up rocks, and all around him there was silence except for the splashing of distant water. Maybe a waterfall, water in motion, a stream. If he found the stream, he might find the natives. The rocks ended and the stream bed began again, but this time it was wet, the bottom muddy and overgrown with moss. He was on the right track. Not too long ago this stream had flowed, probably during the rainy season. He went up on the side of the stream, pushing through the ferns and vines. A golden snake slid expertly out of his path. Something glinted ahead, something sparkling through the ferns. Water. A pool. He hurried, pushing the vines aside and stepping out, leaving them behind. He was standing on the edge of a pool, a deep pool sunk in a hollow of gray rocks, surrounded by ferns and vines. The water was clear and bright and in motion, flowing in a waterfall at the far end. It was beautiful, and he stood watching, marveling at it, the undisturbed quality of it. Untouched it was, just as it had always been, probably, as long as the asteroid existed. Was he the first to see it? Perhaps. It was so hidden, so concealed by the ferns, it gave him a strange feeling, a feeling almost of ownership. He stepped down a little toward the water, and it was then he noticed her. The girl was sitting on the far edge of the pool, staring down into the water, resting her head on one drawn-up knee. She had been bathing. He could see that at once. Her coppery body was still wet and glistening with moisture, sparkling in the sun. She had not seen him. He stopped, holding his breath, watching her. She was lovely, very lovely with long, dark hair that wound around her shoulders and arms. Her body was slim, very slender, with a supple grace to it that made him stare, 
accustomed as he was to various forms of anatomy. How silent she was! Silent and unmoving, staring down at the water. Time passed. Strange, unchanging time as he watched the girl. Time might even have ceased with the girl sitting on the rock staring into the water and the rows of great ferns behind her as rigid as if they had been painted there. All at once the girl looked up. Harris shifted, suddenly conscious of himself as an intruder. He stepped back. I'm sorry, he murmured. I'm from the garrison. I didn't mean to come poking around. She nodded without speaking. You don't mind? Harris asked presently. No. So she spoke Terran. He moved a little toward her, around the side of the pool. I hope you don't mind my bothering you. I won't be on the asteroid very long. This is my first day here. I just arrived from Terra. She smiled faintly. I'm a doctor. Henry Harris. He looked down at her, at the slim, coppery body gleaming in the sunlight, a faint sheen of moisture on her arms and thighs. You might be interested in why I'm here. He paused. Maybe you can even help me. She looked up a little. Oh? Would you like to help me? She smiled. Yes, of course. That's good. Mind if I sit down? He looked around and found himself a flat rock. He sat down slowly, facing her. Cigarette? No. Well, I'll have one. He lit up, taking a deep breath. You see, we have a problem at the garrison. Something has been happening to some of the men, and it seems to be spreading. We have to find out what causes it, or we won't be able to run the garrison. He waited for a moment. She nodded slightly. How silent she was, silent and unmoving, like the ferns. Well, I've been able to find out a few things from them, and one very interesting fact stands out. They keep saying that something called, called the Pipers, are responsible for their condition. They say the Pipers taught them. He stopped. A strange look had flitted across her dark, small face. Do you know the Pipers? She nodded. Acute satisfaction flooded over Harris. You do? I was sure the natives would know. He stood up again. I was sure they would, if the Pipers really existed. Then they do exist, do they? They exist. Harris frowned. And they're here, in the woods? Yes. I see. He ground his cigarette out impatiently. You don't suppose there's any chance you could take me to them, do you? Take you? Yes, I have this problem, and I have to solve it. You see, the base commander on Terra has assigned this to me, this business about the Pipers. It has to be solved, and I'm the one assigned to the job. So it's important to me to find them. Do you see? Do you understand?" She nodded. Well, will you take me to them? The girl was silent. For a long time she sat, staring down into the water, resting her head against her knee. Harris began to become impatient. He fidgeted back and forth, resting first on one leg and then on the other. Well, will you? He said again. It's important to the whole garrison. What do you say? He felt around in his pockets. Maybe I could give you something. What do I have? He brought out his lighter. I could give you my lighter. The girl stood up, rising slowly, gracefully, without motion or effort. Harris's mouth fell open. How supple she was, gliding to her feet in a single motion. He blinked. Without effort she had stood, seemingly without change. All at once she was standing instead of sitting, standing and looking calmly at him, her small face expressionless. Will you? he said. Yes, come along. She turned away, moving toward the row of ferns. Harris followed quickly, stumbling across the rocks. Fine, he said. Thanks a lot. I'm very interested to meet these pipers. Where are you taking me? To your village? How much time do we have before nightfall? The girl did not answer. She had entered the ferns already, and Harris quickened his pace to keep from losing her. How silently she glided. Wait, he called. Wait for me. The girl paused, waiting for him, slim and lovely 
looking silently back. He entered the ferns, hurrying after her. Well, I'll be damned, Commander Cox said. It sure didn't take you long. He leaped down the steps two at a time. Let me give you a hand. Harris grinned, lugging his heavy suitcases. He set them down and breathed a sigh of relief. It isn't worth it, he said. I'm going to give up taking so much. Come on inside, soldier. Give him a hand. A patrolman hurried over and took one of the suitcases. The three men went inside and down the corridor to Harris's quarters. Harris unlocked the door and the patrolman deposited his suitcase inside. Thanks, Harris said. He set the other down beside it. It's good to be back, even for a little while. A little while? I just came back to settle my affairs. I have to return to Y-3 tomorrow morning. And you didn't solve the problem? I solved it, but I haven't cured it. I'm going back and get to work right away. There's a lot to be done. But you found out what it is. Yes, it was just what the men said. The Pipers. The Pipers do exist? Yes, Harris nodded. They do exist. He removed his coat and put it over the back of the chair. Then he went to the window and let it down. Warm spring air rushed into the room. He settled himself on the bed, leaning back. The Pipers exist all right, in the minds of the garrison crew. To the crew, the Pipers are real. The crew created them. It's a mass hypnosis, a group projection, and all the men there have it, to some degree. How did it start? Those men on Y-3 were sent there because they were skilled, highly trained men with exceptional ability. All their lives they've been schooled by complex modern society, fast tempo and high integration between people. Constant pressure toward some goal, some job to be done. Those men are put down suddenly on an asteroid where there are natives living the most primitive of existence, completely vegetable lives. No concept of goal, no concept of purpose, and hence no ability to plan. The natives live the way the animals live, from day to day, sleeping, picking food from the trees, a kind of Garden of Eden existence without struggle or conflict. So, but... Each of the garrison crew sees the natives and unconsciously thinks of his own early life when he was a child, when he had no worries, no responsibilities, before he joined modern society, a baby lying in the sun. But he can't admit this to himself. He can't admit that he might want to live like the natives, to lie and sleep all day, so he invents the pipers. The idea of a mysterious group living in the woods who trap him, lead him into their kind of life. Then he can blame them, not himself. They teach him to become a part of the woods. What are you going to do? Have the woods burned? No. Harris shook his head. That's not the answer. The woods are harmless. The answer is psychotherapy for the men. That's why I'm going right back so I can begin work. They've got to be made to see that the Pipers are inside them, their own unconscious voices calling to them to give up their responsibilities. They've got to be made to realize that there are no Pipers, at least not outside themselves. The woods are harmless and the natives have nothing to teach anyone. They're primitive savages without even a written language. We're seeing a psychological projection by a whole garrison of men who want to lay down their work and take it easy for a while. The room was silent. I see, Cox said presently. Well, it makes sense. He got to his feet. I hope you can do something with the men when you get back. I hope so, too, Harris agreed. And I think I can. After all, it's just a question of increasing their self-awareness. When they have that, the Pipers will vanish. Cox nodded. Well, you go ahead with your unpacking, Doc. I'll see you at dinner, and maybe before you leave tomorrow. Fine. Harris opened the door, and the commander went out into the hall. Harris closed the door after him, and then went back across the room. He looked out the window for a moment, his hands in his pockets. It was becoming evening. The air was turning cool. The sun was just setting as he watched, disappearing behind the buildings of the city surrounding the hospital. He watched it go down. Then he went over to his two suitcases. He was tired. 
very tired from his trip. A great weariness was beginning to descend over him. There were so many things to do, so terribly many. How could he hope to do them all? Back to the asteroid, and then what? He yawned, his eyes closing. How sleepy he was. He looked over at the bed. Then he sat down on the edge of it and took his shoes off. So much to do, the next day. He put his shoes in the corner of the room. Then he bent over, unsnapping one of the suitcases. He opened the suitcase. From it he took a bulging gunny sack. Carefully he emptied the contents of the sack out on the floor. Dirt. Rich, soft dirt. Dirt he had collected during his last hours there. Dirt he had carefully gathered up. When the dirt was spread out on the floor, he sat down in the middle of it. He stretched himself out, leaning back. When he was fully comfortable, he folded his hands across his chest and closed his eyes. So much work to do. But later on, of course, tomorrow. How warm the dirt was. He was sound asleep in a moment. End of Piper in the Woods by Philip K. Dick Camera by John McGreevy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.com. Reading by Bologna Times. The Prophetic Camera by John McGreevy Joey Barrett set his camera carefully to one side and swung onto the edge of the desk. He knew this annoyed Nugent, and, at the moment, nothing gave him greater satisfaction than his ability to irritate the editor. His heels thunked against the highly polished sides of the desk, and he shook his head very deliberately, in rhythm with the heel hammering. No. He said, I don't think so, Nugent. He decided the drumming had lost its impact, so he crossed his legs and turned to face the balding man behind the desk. Why should I? This assignment's out of my line and you know it. Nugent nodded. I know. But this is an unusual story, Joey, and I'd like to get a photographer's slant on it. Want to find out how the other half thinks, huh? Nugent referred to a memo. This is the address. He pushed the slip of paper toward Joey. I think you'll find this Jason Ewing most cooperative. He's a crackpot. Joey shied away from the memo and slid off the desk. That's why none of your brainy reporters will touch the assignment. He's eccentric. Nugent didn't bother to hide his impatience. What inventor isn't? He's an inventor? New kind of camera. That's where you come in, Joey. Nugent leaned back in his swivel chair. I want a photographer's reaction to it. What's so special about his camera? Nugent didn't look at Joey. It photographs another dimension. There was a moment's silence. Nugent was abruptly preoccupied with his hands. Joey moved slowly toward the desk. Another dimension? You mean stereoopticon stuff with depth? Nugent stood. No, I don't think that's what Ewing means. He moved from his desk to the window. I want you to find out what it is. Get all the information you can. Are you sure this thing doesn't belong on the comic page, Nugent? Dusk was settling over the city. Nugent stared out at the darkening skyline. I admit it sounds crazy, but it'll make a good human interest yarn. He turned back to Joey. Just bring in the facts, and one of the rewrite boys will put them in shape. Joey Barrett's chin set doggedly. You've got no right to ask me to... But he didn't finish. His editor had abruptly moved in very close. You're in no position to quibble, Joey. What does that mean? Nugent's thin lips were tightly compressed. The management's not happy with you. Joey's laugh was brittle. Nugent walked slowly back to his desk. I've had more and more complaints about your work. Joey was close behind him. I take the assignments you hand me 
And there's no one on the staff gets a sharper shot. Nugent waved this aside. It's your manner. He pushed a glossy 8x10 print toward the photographer. You play up the grizzly, the macabre. Joey stared down at the picture. A slow smile narrowed his eyes. I photograph what I see. I figure it's what your readers want to see, too. Nugent sat heavily. We had a hundred phone calls about that picture. Brutal, sadistic, morbid. The print fell face up before Nugent. He turned it over. Joey laughed. <laughs> sure, it's all those things, and they loved it. He leaned very close to Nugent. You didn't have to print it. It was the only shot I had. It was printed or be scooped on one of the big stories of the year. Joey's outward nonchalance failed to mask entirely his inner tension. When I take a picture, they remember it. There's a difference between memorable photography and cheap sensationalism. The editor picked up the memo with Ewing's address. All things considered, I think you'd better get this interview for me. Joey stared at Nugent for an insolent second. Then he took the memo. He checked the address, jammed the paper into his pocket, and moved quickly to the door. Hand on the knob, he paused. Oh, Nugent, he called. If you can't see the story, I bring back. Just remember, it's in another dimension. He slammed the door on Nugent's anger. Early evening traffic was heavy as he pulled into the quiet, old-fashioned street where Ewing lived. Sober brownstone houses, their front steps rising steeply to stained glass paneled doors, heavily curtained bay windows, weather-stained and rotting gingerbread, an atmosphere of reluctant decay and genteel senescence. Ewing's house was like a dozen others in the same block. Joey was not a man given to hunches, and yet, as he climbed out of his car and stood staring up at the silent house, he could not repress a shiver of apprehension. He looked up the street. Nothing marred the quiet. A middle-aged woman hurried home with her armload of groceries. A man paraded an ancient dog on a leash. Slowly, Joey climbed the steps. His apprehension was no more than the resentment he felt for the assignment. He yanked the old-fashioned bell and listened for its echoes dying deep in the house. He fidgeted impatiently. Perhaps old Ewing wasn't at home, or maybe he was so eccentric he no longer answered the bell. Joey jerked it again. On the traffic-noisy boulevard a block away, he heard a raw squealing of brakes. Joey sighed and turned away. He'd wasted an hour. He started down the steps, and the door opened. Jason Ewing was very old. His incredibly blue eyes seemed alien in the yellow parchment face. His clothing, his manner, even his speech were archaic. As Joey shook the bony hand, Ewing was apologizing for the delay. I was in my dark room, he said, the voice strangely resonant to come from so frail a chest, and I had to get the developer off my hands. Joey nodded and stepped inside. The atmosphere of the house was a curious mixture of chemical and decay. There was a layer of dust on the bric-a-brac, and as Joey followed the stooped figure from the entry hall into the living room, he saw Ewing as a kind of insubstantial ghost, moving through the deserted room so carefully that the dust was not disturbed. Ewing gestured to a chair which looked prim and uncomfortable in its yellowed antimacassars. Sit down please, Mr. Barrett. He switched on an ornate table lamp. It's most kind of you to be interested in my work. Joey gave him the automatic smile. The room was a combination studio and parlor. A bulky antique camera lorded it over the conventional furnishings. Its unblinking eye regarded Joey coldly. There was a fireplace with massive brass andirons cast to resemble griffin heads. Purple draperies at the window were faded by the sun and time. The heavy furniture was definitely 
shabby even the antique photograph album with its plush cover and gold-plated clasp and lock was right for the room this was jason ewing's world and joey felt himself to be an alien ewing hovered nervously white fingers clenching and unclenching reaching out now and then to touch the album on the dusty tabletop i know you are a busy man mr barrett he said so i'll come at once to the point joey relaxed as much as he could in the old chair i should tell you first mr ewing that i'm not a writer i'm a photographer my editor thought maybe you and me would talk the same language ewing bobbed his head up and down excellent excellent he pulled up a small chair believe me mr barrett i hesitated a very long while before i decided to make my discovery public joey disguised a grin what finally decided you ewing closed his eyes i'm not well heart most unreliable doctor tells me i may may die at any time i see but before i die the old man said leaning forward again i must share my secret he seemed to have difficulty in finding the words he sought it's it's so extraordinary mr barrett that i've been afraid to divulge it he gave a sad shake of his head people today are so unwilling to accept the unusual joey writhed inwardly this was worse than he had thought he would make nugent pay mr nugent said something about your, your photographing another dimension he prompted the old man pushed himself to his feet it was accidental i've dabbled in amateur photography for years he limped over to his camera not only took pictures developed my own he paused and looked very directly at joey about six years ago i began experimenting with a new developer ewing's eyes were disturbing joey looked away you had used commercial developers before yes ewing gripped the camera i wanted a developer that would give a more sharply defined image i tried fifty different formulae never quite achieving what i had in mind joey lit a cigarette you must have spent a lot of time on it i had retired i live alone here no other interests the phrases came in little gasps as if ewing had to force the words between his lips made no progress and then i tried formula fifty three the pause indicated joey was expected to react formula fifty three ewing moved back to the light my fifty-third experiment radical departure from commercial developers it succeeded it succeeded mr barrett but not in the way i had imagined the fish-white hands rested on the photo album i developed some film in formula fifty three and received the shock of my life his voice was a whisper the pictures on the negative were not the pictures i had taken he paused to watch the effect on barrett joey scratched his ear you took one set of pictures and the negatives you got were of another set i know what you're thinking ewing said what i thought first that i'd gotten hold of the wrong film but that wasn't the answer the same thing happened again and again whenever i used formula fifty three as my developer i produced a strange set of pictures joey stood up nervously the old boy was crazier than he had first guessed humoring him seemed the only answer that's incredible ewing nodded excitedly i thought i was losing my mind but slowly i began to realize what had happened what the old man sank into the chair by the table school of modern philosophers teaches all time is coexistent joey felt almost sorry for the old boy he was so much in earnest about his crack brain discovery time coexistent past present future all simultaneous running along in parallel dimensions joey tried to laugh <laughs> a little rough for me mr ewing he apologized look he went on quickly i've been thinking but ewing wasn't listening simplify it at this moment caesar crossing the rubicon 
Columbus is discovering America. You and I are talking. A man in the twenty-fifth century is rocketing toward Mars. I see what you mean. Ewing was holding the old-fashioned photo album in his lap. Well, I know now that what I've stumbled into with Formula 53 is another dimension in time. You mean that that you can take a picture of what's happening in another time? Ewing nodded. I know it's difficult to grasp, Mr. Barrett. He held out the plush-covered album. But I have proof. Joey stepped toward the old man. You've got pictures in there. Pictures of this other dimension? Yes. He fumbled in his vest pocket, found a small key, and with trembling hand inserted it in the album lock. I've never shown anyone these pictures before, he said. Despite himself, Joey felt excited. Even as he dismissed Ewing as a hopeless crackpot, he was disturbingly eager to see the pictures in the old album. Ewing gestured for him to be seated. Joey sat in the chair near the table, and the old man handed him the open album. So far, Ewing said, I haven't been able to control the process. I photograph a subject, and the picture may be projected ten years into the future or a hundred years into the past. There must be an infinite number of dimensions registered on the film, but my developer varies. Joey's initial eagerness was quickly dissipated. The photographs in the album were disappointingly ordinary. True, there were some that seemed to be trick shots, and a few in which the costuming was unfamiliar, but certainly nothing to document the old boy's claim. Aside from a few shots that were interesting because of their violence, there was nothing in the album. Ewing waited for Joey's reaction, the parchment face even more deeply wrinkled by excitement, the blue eyes blazing. Well, Mr. Barrett? Joey left the album open at the picture of a gruesome accident. Apparently, two cars had met head-on. The one had been a sleek convertible. The other was an old sedan. Both were terribly crumpled. Glass littered the street. Steam spewed from the twisted radiator of the old wreck. A man sprawled from the front seat of the sedan. An elderly man with a white beard. A beard spattered with blood. His sightless eyes stared accusingly at the small cluster of onlookers who surrounded the wreck. Nearby, thrown from the crushed convertible by the impact, lay a woman. She wore an extreme evening dress, and a fur cape had fallen not far from her body. All around her were pearls, spilled from the broken strand at her throat. Joey looked up at Ewing. He shook his head. You've got some interesting pictures, but I can't see that they've proved your theory. They could have been taken any time. He pointed to the photo of the wreck. This one, for instance. He smiled up at the old man. That looks like a shot I might have made. Ewing's entire body seemed shaken by his eagerness to prove his point. Mr. Barrett, that picture is of an accident that hasn't occurred. One evening, I took a picture of the street out there, at the corner, where our street joins the boulevard. His voice was low, urgent. When I snapped that photo, the street was deserted. There were no cars, no people. Joey took another look at the wreck. He closed the album with finality. Mr. Ewing, he said, I'm not questioning your sincerity. I can see that you're convinced your developer has extraordinary powers. But you don't believe me. There was despair in the old man's voice. What can I say to make you believe that you've just looked at the picture of an accident that's yet to happen? Joey laid the album on the table. It's an interesting theory. Ewing moved to his camera. It's more than a theory. I can prove it. He ducked behind the camera. Let me take your picture, Mr. Barrett, and I'll prove it. Wait a minute. Joey half rose from the chair in protest, and then, with a shrug, subsided. Sure he said. Why not? Thank you, Ewing answered. He focused the camera, cut on extra lights, posed Joey, took his picture. The ordeal over, Joey moved toward the door. You'll see, Mr. Barrett, this picture will convince you. Joey nodded. Sure, sure, you give me a call. They were in the entry hall. As I said, Ewing continued, I haven't much time. That's why I'm very anxious to pass on my discovery. 
It could do great good in the right hands. Joey opened the door. I understand, he said. You give me a call. I will. Joey was outside, the door between him and Ewing's pathetic eagerness. As he bounded down the steps, he was devising a revenge extreme enough for Nugent. He slipped in behind the wheel. It was surprising that anyone as near psycho as Ewing should be loose. The old boy had lived too long alone in the empty house. Just as he drew away from the curb, Joey heard the crash. Squealing rubber, splintering glass, rending metal, perhaps a human scream, compounded into an awful discord that ricocheted against the quiet brownstone fronts, building to a crescendo of metallic anguish. After the first moment of surprise, Joey experienced the curious exaltation he always felt at a scene of violence. The trip wasn't a waste after all. He'd get a picture, and from the sound of the crash, it would be a good one. As he clambered out of his car, camera ready, people were running down steps. Cars were swinging off the boulevard. The first cluster of the curious was collecting. With professional assurance, Joey brushed people aside and moved in. One car had been stopped at the intersection, and the other had careened off the boulevard and smashed head-on into it. Joey stopped on the crowd's inner edge and stared. It was impossible. One car was an old sedan, the other a sleek convertible. An old man with blood-spattered white beard half spilled from the sedan, and on the glistening pavement lay a woman in evening dress, surrounded by dozens of pearls. From habit, Joey took the picture of the accident and delivered it to Nugent. By the time he had developed his picture, he was beginning to enjoy the knowledge that it was an exact duplicate of the photograph in Ewing's album. Only he and Ewing realized the power of Formula 53. It couldn't be coincidence. The details were too exact. Ewing's explanation was the only one possible, and that meant the old boy wasn't crazy. The formula was all he insisted. Such a formula could be a great force for good, the old man had said, in the right hands, in the hands of Joey Barrett. Joey decided to keep his secret. This was not a power to be shared with Leslie Nugent or anyone else. So, when he faced his editor again, he was careful to dismiss the Ewing interview with just the proper degree of casualness. There's no doubt about it, he said. Ewing's a crackpot. Nugent scowled impatiently. Even so. I tell you, if we run the story he gave me, we'll be laughed out of business. Joey watched Nugent closely. But surely, as a human interest yarn, the editor protested, we'd be justified. Joey shook his head. He's an old crank, trying to build up his ego with these phony claims. Nugent leaned back. There was absolutely no basis for his theory? None! Joey laughed easily. You should have seen the obvious trick photos he tried to pass off as evidence. My advice is, forget Jason Ewing. There was a long pause. Then Nugent nodded. All right. Thanks, Joey. He picked up a glossy of the accident. You outdid yourself on this one. Joey sauntered to the door. The master's touch, he called. I'll hit you for a raise later. Satisfied that Nugent considered the Ewing story dead, Joey left the paper and hurried to a payphone. When Jason Ewing answered, there was a note of near hysteria in his voice. He seemed frightened by Joey's interest and was extremely reluctant to give him another interview. I don't blame you for being irritated, Joey said. I was very rude. But look, Mr. Ewing, now I see I was wrong. We can't talk about it on the phone. All I want is a chance to see you again. Maybe tomorrow? There was such a long pause that Joey thought Ewing had broken the connection. Then he heard the old man sigh. <sighs> I, I don't know what to say, Ewing faltered. In the light of, of recent developments, I think it would be unwise to involve you, Mr. Barrett. Joey laughed. Listen, this is the break of a lifetime for me. How about tomorrow morning at nine? Tomorrow. The one word was neither affirmation nor question. But Joey chose to interpret it as agreement. 
See you in the morning at nine, Mr. Ewing, he said, and hung up quickly. Joey slept little that night. He was up early, gulped a hasty breakfast, and stood on the steps at Ewing's house at five minutes to nine. Again, as on the day before, he had to ring the bell twice before the door opened and the wrinkled face showed itself. He was shocked by the change in Ewing. The man seemed much older, and there was a haunting fear in the blue eyes. It would have been wiser, the old man whispered, if you had not come here again, for us not to have met. Joey was determined to be charming. He put his hand on the thin old arm and gently pushed Ewing into the entry hall. I don't blame you for being bitter, he said, closing the door. I was a fool yesterday. Ewing pulled free and moved agitatedly into the living room. Even the morning sun made no impression on the shadows there. The old man didn't look at Joey. You were right, he said. It would be better to forget the formula. Joey fought down his impatience. He tried to move smoothly, keep his voice calm. No, you mustn't think that. You can't be selfish. You said yourself, Mr. Ewing, that this knowledge could do great good. The quiet persuasiveness of Joey's approach seemed cause for further alarm. I said that, but since then I, I see that it might also do great harm. He tottered away from Joey and slumped tiredly into the chair by the table. Mr. Ewing, Joey said, following him, yesterday I saw one of your pictures come to life. Ewing did not look up. I know. The accident at the corner. I was afraid you had seen it. Afraid? Joey laughed. That was the clincher. He leaned over the old man. Listen, Mr. Ewing, the second I saw that wreck, I realized what we have in Formula 53. I want to help you make use of it, the proper use. The old man shook his head. I'm afraid, he whimpered. Joey ignored the interruption. We'll work this together. If we play it smart, the sky's the limit. We can be millionaires. Name our own prices. He laughed in his excitement. Ha! <laughs> They'll meet our demands when they see what we've got to offer. Ewing had slowly pushed himself to his feet. He regarded Joey with mixed apprehension and disgust. You, you can't commercialize my discovery, he protested. I wouldn't permit the formula to be used for personal gain. Not just my gain, you and me together. Joey looked at the red plush photo album and rubbed his hands. I'll bet we've got pictures in that album worth a hundred grand. Abruptly, Ewing stepped past Joey and seized the album. He cradled it in his arms. That's out of the question. He tottered toward the fireplace. Mr. Barrett, he pleaded, I beg you to go now. Anger simmered in Joey. Anger and frustration. All right he said, forcing himself to be reasonable. Those are your pictures. He faced Ewing at the fireplace. But if I take some, will you give me the formula so I can develop them? Stubbornly, the old man shook his head. What is the formula? Joey demanded. I've never written it down. Ewing clutched the red plush photo album with one hand and gestured imploringly with the other. Mr. Barrett, every moment you stay here, you jeopardize us both. Leave now, please. Forget we ever met, that you ever heard of Formula 53. Forget? Joey's hands clenched and unclenched in mounting desperation. You can't start a guy on a thing like this, Ewing, and then tell him to forget it. For a long second, they stared at each other. Ewing was breathing heavily, and perspiration beaded the parchment face. Joey tried another tactic. Look, if you don't want to give me the formula, at least let me have a few of the pictures in that album. Whatever I get out of them, I'll split with you. He reached out, tentatively. Ewing shrank back. Go away. Leave me alone. There's nothing in the album. I burned the pictures. You're lying. The thought of the money the old fool had thrown away cut into Joey like a knife. You wouldn't do a crazy thing like that. Only two left. Should have burned them. Panic seized Joey. He grabbed at the red plush album. I don't believe you. Let me see. Ewing held on to the book with the tenacity of an aged crab. You mustn't, he croaked. 
You're destroying yourself. Don't! But the old man's stubborn and futile resistance stoked the smoldering fires of Joey's anger. He gripped one corner of the coveted trophy with his left hand, and with his right gave Ewing a vicious shove. With a rattling cry, the old man staggered back and fell with a clatter into the fireplace. The book was in Joey's hand. He didn't look at Ewing. The clasp was not locked. Feverishly, he opened the heavy cover. The truth took his breath away. Ewing hadn't lied. The pages were empty. He had burned the pictures. The crazy old fool. But he had said there were two pictures left. Joey thumbed hastily through the empty album till he reached the first of the remaining pictures. He cried out. It was a self-portrait of Ewing. He lay sprawled on the floor before the fireplace, blue eyes staring up at the ceiling, blood smearing his temple and one of the massive brass andirons. Joey dropped the album on the table and slowly turned. He closed his eyes. Oh, God, he whispered. No, no. Like a sleepwalker, he moved to the silent figure, knelt, searched in vain for a pulse or heartbeat. There was none. Jason Ewing was dead. Joey stared at the andiron with its telltale stain. He pulled himself up to a half crouch and looked wildly around the dark living room. The camera was an accusing eye. It was an accident, he murmured. His heart. He was an old man. The photo album still lay open on the table. Ewing had saved two pictures. One of himself. The other. There was a heavy knocking at the front door. Joey went shakily to the album. Gripping the table's edge, he turned to the second picture. Joey Barrett sat in a chair. His trousers were slit. His head was shaved, and there were straps and electrodes. It was the kind of picture that would sell a thousand extra copies. End of The Prophetic Camera by John McGreevy By Damon Knight. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Greg Marguerite. Special delivery by Damon Knight. All Len had to hear was the old gag. We've never lost a father yet. His child was not even born, and it was thoroughly unbearable. Len and Moira Connington lived in a rented cottage with a small yard, a smaller garden, and too many fir trees. The lawn, which Len seldom had time to mow, was full of weeds, and the garden was overgrown with blackberry brambles. The house itself was clean and smelled better than most city apartments, and Moira kept geraniums in the windows. However, it was dark on account of the firs. Approaching the door one late spring afternoon, Len tripped on an unnoticed flagstone and scattered examination papers all the way to the porch. When he picked himself up, Moira was giggling in the doorway. That was funny. The hell it was, said Len. I banged my nose. He picked up his chemistry B papers in a stiff silence. A red drop fell on the last one. Damn it! Moira held the screen door for him, looking contrite and faintly surprised. She followed him into the bathroom. Len, I didn't mean to laugh. Does it hurt much? No, said Len, staring fiercely at his scraped nose in the mirror. It was throbbing like a gong. That's good. It was the funniest thing. I mean... Funny peculiar, she clarified hastily. Len stared at her. The whites of her eyes were showing. Is there anything the matter with you? he demanded. I don't know, she said on a rising note. Nothing like that ever happened to me before. I didn't think it was funny at all. I was worried about you, and I didn't know I was going to laugh. She laughed again, a trifle nervously. Maybe I'm cracking up. Moira was a dark-haired young woman with a placidly friendly disposition. Len had met her in his senior year at Columbia with, 
looking at it impartially, which Len seldom did, regrettable results. At present, in her seventh month, she was shaped like a rather bosomy Cupid doll. Emotional upsets, he remembered, may occur frequently during this period. He leaned to get past her belly and kissed her forgivingly. You're probably tired. Go sit down. I'll, I'll get you some coffee. Except Moira had never had any hysterics till now. Or morning sickness, either. She burped instead. And anyhow, was there anything in the literature about fits of giggling? After supper, he marked seventeen sets of papers desultorily in red pencil, then got up to look for the baby book. There were four dog-eared paper-bound volumes with smiling infants' faces on the covers, but the one he wanted wasn't there. He looked behind the bookcase and on the wicker table beside it. Moira! Hmm? Where the devil is the other baby book? I've got it. Len went and looked over her shoulder. She was staring at a drawing of a fetus lying in a sort of upside-down yoga position inside a cross-sectioned woman's body. That's what he looks like, she said. Mama. The diagram was of a fetus at term. What was that about your mother? Len asked, puzzled. Don't be silly, she said abstractedly. He waited, but she didn't look up or turn the page. After a while, he went back to his work. He watched her. Eventually, she leafed through to the back of the book, read a few pages, and put it down. She lighted a cigarette and immediately put it out again. She fetched up a belch. That was a good one, said Len admiringly. Moira sighed. Feeling tense, Len picked up his coffee cup and started toward the kitchen. He halted beside Moira's chair. On the side table was her after-dinner cup, still full of coffee, black, scummed with oil droplets, stone cold. "'Didn't you want your coffee?' he asked solicitously. She looked at the cup. "'I did, but—' She paused and shook her head, looking perplexed. "'Well, do you want another cup now?' "'Yes, please. No.' Len, who had begun a step, rocked back on his heels. Which, damn it? Her face got all swollen. Oh, Len, I'm so mixed up, she said, and began to tremble. Len felt part of his irritation spilling over into protectiveness. What you need, he said firmly, is a drink. He climbed a stepladder to get at the top cabinet shelf, which cached their liquor when they had any. Small upstate towns and their school boards being what they were, this was one of many necessary financial precautions. Inspecting the doleful few fingers of whiskey in the bottle, Len swore under his breath. They couldn't afford a decent supply of booze or new clothes for Moira. The original idea had been for Len to teach for a year while they saved enough money so that he could go back for his master's degree. More lately, this proving unlikely, they had merely been trying to put aside enough for summer school, and even that was beginning to look like the wildest optimism. High school teachers without seniority weren't supposed to be married, or graduate physics students for that matter. He mixed two stiff highballs and carried them back into the living room. Here you are. Skull. Ah, uh, she said appreciatively, that tastes... Ugh. She set the glass down and stared at it with her mouth half open. What's the matter now? She turned her head carefully, as if she were afraid it would come off. Len, I, I don't know. Mama! That's the second time you've said that. What, what is this all? Said what? Mama, look, kid, if you're... I didn't. She appeared a little feverish. You sure did, said Len reasonably, once when you were looking at the baby book, and then again just now after you said, uh, to the highball. Speaking of which, Mama drink milk, said Moira, speaking with exaggerated clarity. Moira hated milk. Len swallowed half his highball, turned, and went silently into the kitchen. When he came back with the milk, Moira looked at it as if it contained a snake. Len, I didn't say that. Okay. I didn't. I, I didn't say Mama, and I didn't say that about the milk. 
Her voice quavered. And I didn't laugh at you when you fell down. Len tried to be patient. It was somebody else. It was! She looked down at her gingham-covered bulge. You, you won't believe me. Put your hand there. No, a, a little lower. Under the cloth her flesh was warm and solid against his palm. Kicks? he inquired. Not yet. Now, she said in a strained voice. You in there. If you want your milk, kick three times. Len opened his mouth and shut it again. Under his hand were three explicit kicks, one after the other. Moira closed her eyes, held her breath, and drank the milk down in one long, horrid gulp. Once in a great while, Moira read, cell cleavage will not have followed the ordinary pattern that produces a normal baby. In these rare cases some parts of the body will develop excessively, while others do not develop at all. This disorderly cell growth, which is strikingly similar to the wild cell growth that we know as cancer. Her shoulders moved convulsively in a shudder. Blah! Why do you keep reading that stuff if it makes you feel that way? I have to, she said absently. She picked up another book from the stack. There's a page missing. Len attacked the last of his medium-boiled egg in a noncommittal manner. It's a wonder it held together this long, he said, which was perfectly just. The book had had something spilled on it, partially dissolving the glue, and was in an advanced state of anarchy. However, the fact was that Len had torn out the page in question four nights ago after reading it carefully. The topic was Psychoses in Pregnancy. Moira had now decided that the baby was male, that his name was Leonardo, not referring to Len, but to da Vinci, that he had informed her of these things along with a good many others, that he was keeping her from her favorite foods and making her eat things she detested, like liver and tripe, and that she had to read books of his choice all day long in order to keep him from kicking. It was miserably hot. With commencement only two weeks away, Len's students were torpid and galvanic by turns. Then there was the matter of his contract for next year, and the possible opening at Oster High, which would mean more money, and the parent-teacher's thing tonight at which Superintendent Greer and his wife would be regally present. Moira was knee-deep in Volume One of Der Untergang des Abelandes. Moving her lips, an occasional guttural escaped her. Len cleared his throat. Moi? Und Ossel des Tragaschen. What in God's name does he mean by that? What, Len? He made an irritated noise. Why not try the English edition? Leo wants to learn German. What were you going to say? Len closed his eyes for a moment. About this PTA business, you, you, you sure you want to go? Well, of of course it's pretty important, isn't it, unless you think I look too sloppy. No, no, damn it, but are you feeling up to it? There were faint violet crescents under Moira's eyes. She had been sleeping badly. Sure, she said. All right, then you'll go see the doctor tomorrow? I said I would. And you won't say anything about Leo to Mrs. Greer or anybody? She looked slightly embarrassed. Not till he's born, I think, don't you? It would be an awfully hard thing to prove. Even you wouldn't have believed me if you hadn't felt him kick. The experiment had not been repeated, though Len had asked often enough. All little Leo had wanted, Moira said, was to establish communication with his mother. He didn't seem to be interested in Len at all. Too young, she explained. And still... Len recalled the frogs his biology class had dissected last semester. One of them had had two hearts. This disorderly cell growth, like a cancer, unpredictable, extra fingers or toes, or a double dose of cortex? And I'll burp like a lady, if at all, Moira assured him cheerfully as they got ready to leave. The room was empty except for the ladies of the committee two nervously smiling male teachers and the impressive bulk of Superintendent Greer when the Conningtons arrived. Card table legs shrieked on the bare floor. The air was heavy with wood polish and musk. 
Greer advanced, beaming fixedly. Well, isn't this nice? How are you young folks this warm evening? Oh, we thought we'd be here earlier, Mr. Greer, said Moira with pretty vexation. She looked surprisingly schoolgirlish and chic. The lump that was Leo was hardly noticeable unless you caught her in profile. I'll go right now and help the ladies. There must be something I can still do. No, now we won't hear of it. But I'll tell you what you can do. You can go right over there and say hello to Mrs. Greer. I know she's dying to sit down and have a good chat with you. Go ahead now. Don't worry about this husband of yours. I'll take care of him. Moira receded into a scattering of small shrieks of pleasure, at least half of them arcing across a gap of mutual dislike. Greer, exhibiting perfect dentures, exhaled Listerine. His pink skin looked not only scrubbed, but disinfected. His gold-rimmed glasses belonged in an optometrist's window, and his tropical suit had obviously come straight from the cleaners. It was impossible to think of Greer unshaven, Greer smoking a cigar, Greer with a smudge of axle grease on his forehead, or Greer making love to his wife. Well, sir, this weather... When I think of what this valley was like twenty years ago... At today's prices? Len listened with growing admiration, putting in comments where required. He had never realized before that there were so many absolutely neutral topics of conversation. A few more people straggled in, raising the room temperature about half a degree per capita. Greer did not perspire. He merely glowed. Across the room Moira was now seated chummily with Mrs. Greer, a large-bosomed woman in an outrageously unfashionable hat. Moira appeared to be telling a joke. Len knew perfectly well that it was a clean one, but he listened tensely all the same until he heard Mrs. Greer yelp with laughter. Her voice carried well. Oh, that's priceless. Oh, dear, I only hope I can remember it. Len had resolutely not been thinking of ways to turn the conversation toward the Oster vacancy. He stiffened again when he realized that Greer had abruptly begun to talk shop. His heart began pounding absurdly. Greer was asking highly pertinent questions in a good-humored but businesslike way, drawing Len out and not even bothering to be the slightest bit Machiavellian about it. Len answered candidly, except when he was certain that he knew what the superintendent wanted to hear. Then he lied like a Trojan. Mrs. Greer had conjured up a premature pot of tea, and, oblivious of the stares of the thirsty teacher's present, she and Moira were hogging it, heads together as if they were plotting the overthrow of the Republic, or exchanging recipes. Greer listened attentively to Len's final reply, which was delivered with as pious an air as if Len had been a Boy Scout swearing on the manual. But since the question had been, do you plan to make teaching your career, there was not a word of truth in it. He then inspected his paunch and assumed a mild theatrical frown. Len, with that social sixth sense which is unmistakable when it operates, knew that his next words were going to be, you may have heard that Oster High will be needing a new science teacher next fall. At this point, Moira made a noise like a seal. The ensuing silence was broken a moment later by a hearty scream, followed instantly by a clatter and a bone-shaking thud. Mrs. Greer was sitting on the floor, legs sprawled, hat over her eye. She appeared to be attempting to perform some sort of excessively pagan dance. It was Leo! Moira incoherently told Len at home. You know, she's English. She said, of course a cup of tea wouldn't hurt me, and she insisted I go ahead and drink it while it was hot, and I couldn't. No, no, wait, said Len in a controlled fury. What? So I drank some, and Leo kicked up and made me burp the burp I was saving up, and— Oh, Lord. Then he kicked the teacup out of my hand into her lap, and I— wish I was dead. On the following day, Len took Moira to the doctor's office, where they read dog-eared copies of The Rotarian and Field and Stream for an hour. Dr. Berry was a round little man with soulful eyes and a twenty-four-hour bedside manner. On the walls of his office, where it is customary for doctors to hang all sorts of diplomas and certificates of membership, Berry had only three. 
The rest of the space was filled with enlarged colored photographs of beautiful, beautiful children. When Len followed Moira determinedly into the consulting room, Berry looked mildly shocked for a moment, then apparently decided to carry on as if nothing outre had happened. You could not say that he spoke or even whispered. He rustled. Now, Mrs. Connington, we're looking just fine today. How have we been feeling? Just fine. My husband thinks I'm insane. That's good. Well, that's a funny thing for him to think, isn't it? Berry glanced at the wall midway between himself and Len, then shuffled some file cards rather nervously. Now, um, have we had any soreness in our stomach? Yes. He's been kicking me black and blue. Berry misinterpreted Moira's brooding glance at Len, and his eyebrows twitched involuntarily. The baby, said Len. The baby kicks her. Berry coughed. Uh, any headaches, dizziness, vomiting, swelling in our legs or ankles? No. All righty. Now let's just find out how much we've gained, and then we'll get up on the examination table. Berry drew the sheet down over Moira's abdomen as if it were an exceptionally fragile egg. He probed delicately with his fat fingertips, then used the stethoscope. Those X-rays, said Len, have they come back yet? Mm-hmm said Berry. Yes, they have. He moved the stethoscope and listened again. Did they show anything unusual? Len asked. Berry's eyebrows twitched a polite question. We've been having a little argument, Moira said in a strained voice, about whether this is an ordinary baby or not. Berry took the stethoscope tubes away from his ears. He gazed at Moira like an anxious spaniel. Now let's not worry about that. We're going to have a perfectly healthy, wonderful baby, and if anybody tells us differently, why, we'll just tell them to go jump in the lake, won't we?" The baby is absolutely normal, Len said in a marked manner. Absolutely. Perry applied the stethoscope again. His face blanched. What's the matter? Len asked after a moment. The doctor's gaze was fixed and glassy. Vagitus uterinus, Berry muttered. He pulled the stethoscope off abruptly and stared at it. No, of course it couldn't be. Now, isn't that a nuisance? We seem to be picking up a radio broadcast with our little stethoscope here. I'll just go and get another instrument. Moira and Len exchanged glances. Moira's was almost excessively bland. Berry confidently came in with a new stethoscope, put the diaphragm against Moira's belly, listened for an instant, and twitched once all over, as if his mainspring had snapped. Visibly jangling, he stepped away from the table. His jaw worked several times before any sound came out. Excuse me, he said, and walked out in an uneven line. Len snatched up the instrument he had dropped. Like a bell, ringing under water, muffled but clear, a tiny voice was shouting, You bladder-headed pill-pusher, you bedside vacuum, you fifth-rate tree surgeon, you inflated— A pause. Is that you, Connington? Get off the line. I haven't finished with Dr. Bedpan yet. Moira smiled like a Buddha-shaped bomb. Well, she said. We've got to think. Len kept saying over and over. You've got to think. Moira was combing her hair, snapping the comb smartly at the end of each stroke. I've had plenty of time to think ever since it happened. When you catch up... Len flung his tie at the carved wooden pineapple on the corner of the footboard. Moy, be reasonable. The chances against the kid kicking three times in any one-minute period are only about one in a hundred. The chances against anything like... Moira grunted and stiffened for a moment. Then she cocked her head to one side with a listening expression, a new mannerism of hers that was beginning to send intangible snakes crawling up Len's spine. "'What now?' he asked sharply. "'He says to keep our voices down. He's thinking.' Len's fingers clenched convulsively, and a button flew off his shirt, shaking. He pulled his arms out of the sleeves and dropped the shirt on the floor. "'Look!' I just want to get this straight. 
When he talks to you, you don't hear him shouting all the way up past your liver and lights. What? You know perfectly well. He reads my mind. That isn't the same as... Len took a deep breath. Let's not get off on that. What I want to know is... What is it like? Do you seem to hear a real voice, or do you just know what he's telling you without knowing how you know?" Moira put the comb down in order to think better. It isn't like hearing a voice. You never confuse one with the other. It's more... The nearest I can come to it is, it's like remembering a voice, except that you don't know what's coming. Len picked his tie off the floor and abstractedly began nodding it on his bare chest. And. He sees what you see? He knows what you're thinking? He can hear when people talk to you?" Of course. This is tremendous! Len began to blunder around the bedroom, not looking at where he was going. They thought Macaulay was a genius. This kid isn't even born. I heard him. He was cussing Barry out like Monty Woolley. He had me reading The Man Who Came to Dinner two days ago. Len made his way around a small bedside table by trial and error. That's another thing. How much could you say about his... his... personality? I mean, does he seem to know what he's doing, or is he just striking out wildly in all directions? He paused. Are you sure he's really conscious at all? Moira began. That's silly, and stopped. Define consciousness, she said doubtfully. All right. What I really mean, why am I wearing this necktie? He ripped it off and threw it over a lampshade. What I mean, are you sure you're really conscious? Okay. You make joke. I laugh. Ha ha. What I'm trying to ask is, have you seen any evidence of creative thought, organized thought, or is he just integrating along the lines of, of instinctive responses? Do you... I know what you mean. Shut up a minute. I don't know. I mean, is he awake or asleep and dreaming about us, like the Red King? I don't know. And if that's it, what'll happen when he wakes up? Moira took off her robe, folded it neatly, and maneuvered herself between the sheets. Come to bed. Len got one sock off before another thought struck him. He reads your mind. Can he read other people's? He looked appalled. Can he read mine? He doesn't. Whether it's because he can't, I don't know. I think he just doesn't care. Len pulled the other sock halfway down and left it there. In a stiffer tone, he said, One of the things he doesn't care about is whether I have a job. No, he thought it was funny. I wanted to sink through the floor, but... I had all I could do to keep from laughing when she fell down. Len, what are we going to do?" He swiveled around and looked at her. Look, he said, I, I didn't mean to sound that gloomy. We'll do something. We'll fix it. Really. I hope so. Careful of his elbows and knees, Len climbed into the bed beside her. Okay now? Mmm. Ugh. Moira tried to sit up suddenly and almost made it. She wound up propped on one elbow and said indignantly, Oh, no. Len stared at her in the dimness. What? She grunted again. Len, get up. All, all right. Len, hurry. Len fought his way convulsively past the treacherous sheet and staggered up, goose-pimpled and tense. What's wrong? You'll have to sleep on the couch. The sheets are in the bottom. On the couch? Are you crazy? I can't help it, she said in a small, faint voice. Please don't let's argue. You'll just have to. Why? We can't sleep in the same bed, she wailed. He says it's, oh, unhygienic. Len's contract was not renewed. He got a job waiting on tables in a resort hotel, an occupation which pays more money than teaching future citizens the rudiments of three basic sciences, but for which Len had no aptitude. He lasted three days at it. He was then idle for a week and a half until his four years of college physics earned him employment as a clerk in an electrical shop. 
His employer was a cheerfully aggressive man who assured Len that there were great opportunities in radio and television, and firmly believed that the atom bomb tests were causing all the bad weather. Moira, in her eighth month, walked to the county library every day and trundled a load of books home in the perambulator. Little Leo, it appeared, was working his way simultaneously through biology, astrophysics, phrenology, chemical engineering, architecture, Christian science, psychosomatic medicine, marine law, business management, yoga, crystallography, metaphysics, and modern literature. His domination of Moira's life remained absolute, and his experiments with her regimen continued. One week she ate nothing but nuts and fruit, washed down with distilled water. The next she was on a diet of porterhouse steak, dandelion greens, and haddocal. With the coming of full summer, fortunately few of the high school staff were in evidence. Len met Dr. Berry once on the street. Berry started twitched, and walked off rapidly in an entirely new direction. The diabolical event was due on or about July 29th. Len crossed off each day on their wall calendar with an empathetic black grease pencil. It would, he supposed, be an uncomfortable thing at best to be the parent of a super-prodigy. Leo would no doubt be dictator of the world by the time he was fifteen, unless he would be assassinated first. But almost anything would be a fair price for getting Leo out of his maternal fortress. Then there was the day that Len came home to find Moira weeping over the typewriter with a half-inch stack of manuscript beside her. It isn't anything. I'm just tired. He started this after lunch. Look. Len turned the face-down sheaf the right way up. Droning. Abrasing. The Demiurge. Higher begrims the tale. Eyes undotted, grueling, and looking, turns off. Alarm seizes clothes, stewed beardly a wretch. Pence, therefore, shoes we, pawns. Let the pants take air of them souls. The first three sheets were all like that. The fourth was a perfectly good Petrarchian sonnet, reviling the current administration and the political party of which Len was a Registration Day member. The fifth was hand-lettered in the Cyrillic alphabet and illustrated with geometric diagrams. Len put it down and stared shakily at Moira. No, go on, she said. Read the rest. The sixth and seventh were obscene limericks, and the eighth, ninth, and so on to the end of the stack were what looked like the first chapters of a rattling good historical adventure novel. Its chief characters were Cyrus the Great, his jaunty-bosomed daughter Lygia, of whom Len had never previously heard, and a one-armed Graco-Mede adventurer named Xanthes. There were also courtesans, spies, apparitions, scullery slaves, oracles, cutthroats, lepers, priests, and men-at-arms in magnificent profusion. "'He's decided,' said Moira, "'what he wants to be when he's born.' Leo refused to be bothered with mundane details. When there were eighty pages of the manuscript, it was Moira who invented a title and byline for it. The Virgin of Persepolis, by Leon Len, and mailed it off to a literary agent in New York. His response a week later was cautiously enthusiastic. He asked for an outline of the remainder of the novel. Moira replied that this was impossible, trying to sound as unworldly and impenetrably artistic as she could. She enclosed the thirty-odd pages Leo had turned out through her in the meantime. Nothing was heard from the agent for two weeks. At the end of this time Moira received an astonishing document, exquisitely printed and bound in imitation leather, thirty-two pages including the index, containing three times as many clauses as a lease. This turned out to be a book contract. With it came the agent's check for nine hundred dollars. Len tilted his mop handle against the wall and straightened carefully, conscious of every individual gritty muscle in his back. How did women do housework every day, seven days a week, fifty-two goddamn weeks a year? It was a little cooler now that the sun was down and he was working stripped to the shorts and bath slippers but he might as well have been wearing an overcoat in a Turkish bath. The faint whisper of Moira's monstrous new electrical typewriter stopped, leaving a fainter hum. Len went into the living room and sagged on one arm of a chair. 
Moira, gleaming sweatily in a flowered housecoat, was lighting a cigarette. "'How's it going?' he asked, hoping for an answer. He hadn't always received one. She switched off the machine wearily. Page 289. Xanthes killed an Axenander. Thought he would. How about Ganesh and Zeusius? I don't know, she frowned. I can't figure it out. You know who it was that raped Marianne in the garden? No. Who? Ganesh. You're kidding. Nope. She pointed to the stack of typescript. See for yourself. Len didn't move. But Ganesh was in Lydia buying back the sapphire. He didn't return till— I know, I know, but he wasn't. That was Zeusius in a putty nose with his beard dyed. It's all perfectly logical the way Leo explains it. Zeusius overheard Ganesh talking to the three Mongols. You remember? Ganesh thought there was somebody behind the curtain, only that was when they heard Lygia scream, and while their backs were turned— All right, but— for God's sake, this fouls everything up. If Ganesh never went to Lydia, then he couldn't have had anything to do with distempering Cyrus's armor. And Zeusius couldn't either, because— It's exasperating, I know. He's going to pull another rabbit out of the hat and clear everything up, but I don't see how. Len brooded. It beats me. It had to be either Ganesh or Zeusius, or Philomenes, though that doesn't seem possible. Look, damn it, if Zeusius knew about the sapphire all the time, that rules out Philomenes once and for all. Unless— No. I forgot about that business in the temple. Um, do you think Leo really knows what he's doing? I'm certain. Lately I've been able to tell what he's thinking even when he isn't talking to me. I mean, just generally, like when he's puzzling over something, or when he's feeling mean. It's going to be something brilliant, and he knows what it is, but he won't tell me. We'll just have to wait. I guess so. Len stood up, grunting. You want me to see if there's anything in the pot? Please. Len wandered into the kitchen, turned the flame on under the silex, stared briefly at the dishes waiting in the sink, and wandered out again. Since the onslaught of the novel, Leo had relinquished his interest in Moira's diet, and she had been living on coffee small blessings. Moira was leaning back with her eyes closed, looking very tired. How's the money? she asked without moving. Lousy. We're down to twenty-one bucks. She raised her head and opened her eyes wide. We couldn't be, Len. How could anybody go through nine hundred dollars that fast? Typewriter, then the dictaphone that Leo thought he wanted till about half an hour after it was paid for. We spent less than fifty on ourselves, I think. Rent, groceries. It goes when there isn't any coming in. She sighed. I thought it would last longer. So did I. If he doesn't finish this thing in a few days, I'll have to go look for work again. Oh, that isn't so good. How am I going to take care of the house and do Leo's writing for him? I know, but— All right. If it works out, fine. If it doesn't, he must be near the end by now." She stubbed out her cigarette abruptly and sat up, hands over the keyboard. He's getting ready again. See about that coffee, will you? I'm half dead. Len poured two cups and carried them in. Moira was still sitting poised in front of the typewriter with a curious half-formed expression on her face. Abruptly the carriage whipped over, muttered to itself briefly, and thumped the paper up twice. Then it stopped. Moira's eyes got bigger and rounder. "'What's the matter?' said Len. He looked over her shoulder. The last line on the page read, "'To be continued in our next.' Moira's hands curled into small, helpless fists. After a moment she turned off the machine. "'What?' said Len incredulously. "'To be continued? What kind of talk is that?' He says he's bored with the novel," Moira replied dully. He says he knows the ending, so it's artistically complete. It doesn't matter whether anybody else thinks so or not. She paused. But he says that isn't the real reason. Well? He's got two reasons. One is that he doesn't want to finish the book till he's certain he'll have complete control of the money it earns. Yes, said Len, swallowing a lump of anger. 
That makes a certain amount of sense. It's his book, if he wants guarantees. You haven't heard the other one. All right, let's have it. He wants to teach us, so we'll never forget who the boss is in this family. Len, I'm awfully tired, Moira complained piteously late that night. Let's just go over it once more. There has to be some way. He still isn't talking to you? I haven't felt anything from him for the last twenty minutes. I think he's asleep. All right. Let's suppose he isn't going to listen to reason. I think we'd better. Len made an incoherent noise. Well, okay, I still don't see why we can't write the last chapter ourselves. It'd only be a few pages. Go ahead and try. Not me. You've done a little writing. Damned good, too, and if you're so sure all the clues are there. Look, if you say you can't do it, all right, we'll hire somebody. A professional writer. It happens all the time. Thorn Smith's last novel. It wasn't Thorn Smith's, and it wasn't a novel, she said dogmatically. But it sold. What one writer starts, another can finish. Nobody ever finished the mystery of Edwin Drood. Oh, hell. Len, it's impossible. It is. Let me finish. If you're thinking we could have somebody rewrite the last part Leo did. Yeah, I just thought of that. Even that wouldn't do any good. You'd have to go all the way back, almost to page one. It would be another story when you got through. Let's go to bed. Moy, do you remember when we used to worry about the law of opposites? Hmm? The law of opposites, when we used to be afraid the kid would turn out to be a pick-and-shovel man with a pointy head. Uh, mm. He turned. Moira was standing with one hand on her belly and the other behind her back. She looked as if she were about to start practicing a low bow and nodded she could make it. What's the matter now? he asked. Pain in the small of my back. Bad one? No. Belly hurt, too? She frowned. Don't be foolish. I'm feeling for the contraction. There it comes. The... But you just said the small of your back. Where do you think labor pains usually start? The pains were coming at twenty-minute intervals, and the taxi had not arrived. Moira was packed and ready. Len was trying to set her a good example by remaining calm. He strolled over to the wall calendar gazed at it in an offhand manner, and turned away. "'Len, I know it's only the 15th of July,' she said impatiently. "'Huh? I, I didn't say anything about that.' "'You said it seven times. Sit down. You're making me nervous.' Len perched on the corner of the table, folded his arms, and immediately got up to look out the window. On the way back he circled the table in an aimless way picked up a bottle of ink and shook it to see if the cap was on tight, stumbled over a waste-basket, carefully upended it, and sat down with an air of ici je suis, ici je reste. Nothing to worry about, he said firmly. Women have kids all the time. True. What for? he demanded violently. Moira grinned at him, then winced slightly and looked at the clock. Eighteen minutes this time. They're getting closer." When she relaxed, Len put a cigarette in his mouth and lighted it in only two tries. How's Leo taking it? Isn't saying. He feels, she concentrated, apprehensive. He tells me he's feeling strange and he doesn't like it. I don't think he's entirely awake. Funny. I'm glad this is happening now, Len announced. So am I, but look said Len, moving energetically to the arm of the chair. We've always had it pretty good, haven't we? Not that it hasn't been tough at times, but you know. I know. Well, that's the way it'll be again once this is over. I, I don't care how much of a super brain he is. Once he's born, you, you know what I mean. The only reason he's had the edge on us all this time is he could get at us and we couldn't get at him. If he's got the mind of an adult, he can learn to act like one. It's that simple. Moira hesitated. You can't take him out to the woodshed. He's going to be a helpless baby, physically, like anybody else's. He has to be taken care of. 
All right. There are plenty of other ways. If he behaves, he gets read to. Things like that. That's right, but there's one other thing I thought of. You remember when you said, suppose he's asleep and dreaming, and what happens if he wakes up? Yeah. That reminds me of something else, or maybe it's the same thing. Did you know that a fetus in the womb only gets about half the amount of oxygen in his blood that he'll have when he starts to breathe? Len looked thoughtful. I forgot. Well, that's just one more thing Leo does that babies aren't supposed to. Use as much energy as he does, you mean. What I'm getting at is, it can't be because he's getting more than the normal amount of oxygen, can it? I mean, he's the prodigy, not me. He must be using it more efficiently. And if that's it, what will happen when he gets twice as much?" They had prepared and disinfected her, along with other indignities. And now she could see herself in the reflector of the big delivery table light, the image clear and bright like everything else, but very haloed and swimmy, and looking like a bad statue of Sita. She had no idea how long she had been there. That was the dope, probably. But she was getting pretty tired. Bear down," said the staff doctor kindly, and before she could answer, the pain came up like violins, and she had to gulp at the tingly coldness of laughing gas. When the mask was lifted, she said, I am bearing down. But the doctor had gone back to work and wasn't listening. Anyhow, she had Leo. How are you feeling? His answer was muddled. Because of the anesthetic? But she didn't really need it. Her perception of him was clear. Darkness and pressure, impatience, a slow satanic anger, and something else. Uncertainty? Dread? Two or three more ought to do it. Bear down. Fear, unmistakable now, and a desperate determination. Doctor, he, he doesn't want to be born. Seems that way sometimes, doesn't it? Now bear down, good and hard. Tell him stop blur to danger stop I feel stop I tell stop What Leo what Bear down the doctor said abstractedly Faintly like a voice under water gasping before it drowns Hurry I hate you tell him sealed incubator tenth oxygen nine tenths inert gases Hurry 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 An incubator she panted. He'll need an incubator to live, won't he? Not this baby. A fine, normal, healthy one. He's idiot, lying, stupid fool. Need incubator. Tenth oxygen. Tenth. Hurry. Before it's... The pressure abruptly ceased. Leo was born. The doctor was holding him up by his heels. Red. Wrinkled. Puny. But the voice was still there. Very small. Very far away. To... Late, same as death. Then a hint of the old, cold arrogance. Now you'll never know who killed Cyrus. The doctor slapped him smartly on the minuscule behind. The wizened, malevolent face writhed open, but it was only the angry squall of an ordinary infant that came out. Leo was gone, like a light turned off beneath the measureless ocean. Moira raised her head weakly. Give him one for me, she said. End of Special Delivery by Damon Knight The Sun by Arthur C. Clarke This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Greg Marguerite The Stroke of the Sun by Arthur C. Clarke Kill the umpire, the audience cried, and why shouldn't they? He was on the ball, wasn't he? Someone else should be telling this story. Someone who understands the funny kind of football they play down in South America. 
Back in Moscow, Idaho, we grab the ball and run with it. In the small but prosperous republic, which I'll call Perivia, they kick it around with their feet. And that is nothing to what they do to the umpire. One of the first things I learned when I got to Perivia, after various distressing adventures in the less democratic parts of South America, was that last year's match had been lost owing to the knavish dishonesty of the referee. He had, it seemed, penalized most of the players on the team, disallowing a goal and generally made sure that the best side wouldn't win. This diatribe made me quite homesick, but remembering where I was, I merely commented, you should have paid him more money. We did, was the bitter reply, but the Panagorians got at him later. Too bad, I answered. It's hard nowadays to find an honest man who stays bought. The customs inspector who'd just taken my last hundred-dollar bill had the grace to blush beneath his stubble as he waved me across the border. The next few weeks were tough, but Presently I was back in what I prefer to call the agricultural machinery business. The last thing I had time to bother about was football. I knew that my expensive imports were going to be used at any moment and wanted to make sure that this time my profits went with me when I left the country. Even so, I could hardly ignore the excitement as the day for the return match drew nearer. For one thing, it interfered with business. I'd go to a conference arranged with great difficulty and expense at a safe hotel, and half of the time everyone would be talking about football. Gentlemen, I'd protest, our next consignment of rotary drills is being unloaded tomorrow, and unless we get that permit from the Minister of Agriculture, some busybody may open the cases, and then— Don't worry, my boy, General Sierra or Colonel Pedro would answer airily. That's already been taken care of. Leave it to the army. I knew better than to retort, which army? And for the next ten minutes I'd have to listen to arguments about football tactics and the best way of dealing with recalcitrant referees. It was then that Don Hernando Diaz's name came up for the first time. I knew of him as one of the country's leading industrialists, but he had an equal reputation as playboy, racing car driver, and scientific dilettante. It surprised me to learn that he was one of us, for he was also a favorite of President Ruiz. Naturally, I'd never met him. He had to be very particular about his friends, and there were few people who cared to meet me unless they had to. I suspected that something was happening when I took my place in the football stadium on that memorable day. If you think I had no wish to be there, you are quite correct. But Colonel Pedro had given me a ticket, and it was unhealthy to hurt his feelings by not using it. There had been a slight delay in admitting the spectators. The police had done their best, but it takes time to search a hundred thousand people for concealed firearms. The visiting team had insisted on this, to the great indignation of the locals. The protests faded swiftly enough, however, as the artillery accumulated at the checkpoints. Then a sweating band played the two national anthems. The teams were presented to El Presidente and his lady, and the Cardinal blessed everybody. While we were waiting, I examined the program, a beautifully produced affair that had been given to me by the lieutenant. It was tabloid-sized, printed on art paper, and bound in metal foil that gleamed like silver. You could see your face in it, and I noticed a number of ladies using it to make last-minute repairs and adjustments. I also noticed that this special victory souvenir issue had been paid for by an impressive list of subscribers headed by Don Hernando, who had himself, it seemed, presented fifty thousand free copies to our gallant fighting men. If this was a bid for popularity, it seemed a rather naive one, and surely President Ruiz wouldn't let half his army be bottled up in the stadium for the best part of an afternoon. These reflections were interrupted by the roar of the enormous crowd as the play started. For the first ten minutes it was a pretty open game, and I don't think there were more than three fights. The Perivians just missed one goal. The ball was headed out so neatly that the frantic applause from the Pangorian supporters, who had a special police guard and a fortified section of the stadium all to themselves, went quite unbooed. I began to feel disappointed. Why, 
if you changed the shape of the ball, this might be a good-natured Idaho game. There was no real work for the Red Cross until nearly half-time, when three Peruvians and two Panagorians, or it may have been the other way around, fused together in a magnificent melee from which only one survivor emerged under his own power. The casualties were carted off amid such pandemonium, and there was a short break while replacements were brought up. This started the first major incident. The Peruvians complained that the other side's wounded were shamming, so that fresh reserves could be poured in. But the referee was adamant. The new men came on, and the background noise dropped to just below the threshold of pain as the game resumed. The Panagorians promptly scored, and though none of my neighbors actually committed suicide, several seemed close to it. The transfusion of new blood had apparently pepped up the visitors, and things looked bad for the home team. Their opponents were passing the ball with such skill that the Peruvian defenses were as porous as a sieve. At this rate, I told myself, the ref can afford to be honest. His side will win anyway and to give him his due I'd seen no sign of any obvious bias so far. I didn't have long to wait. A last-minute rally by the home team blocked a threatened attack on their goal, and a mighty kick by one of the defenders sent the ball rocketing toward the other end of the field. Before it had reached the apex of its flight, the piercing shriek of the referee's whistle brought the game to a halt. There was a brief consultation between ref and captains. The crowd was roaring its disapproval. "'What's happening now?' I asked plaintively. "'The ref says our man was off sides.' "'But how can he be? He's on top of his own goal.' "'Shush!' said the lieutenant, obviously unwilling to waste time enlightening my ignorance. I don't shush easily, but this time I let it go and tried to work things out for myself. It seemed that the ref had awarded the Panagorians a free kick at our goal, and I couldn't understand the way everybody felt about it. The ball soared through the air in a beautiful parabola, nicked the post, and cannoned in. A mighty roar of anguish rose from the crowd, then died abruptly to a silence that was even more impressive. It was as if a great animal had been wounded, and was biding the time for its revenge. Despite the heat pouring down from the not far from vertical sun, I felt a sudden chill as if a cold wind had swept past me. Not for all the wealth of the Incans would I have changed places with the man sweating out there on the field in his bulletproof vest. We were two down, but there was still hope. A lot could happen before the end of the game. The Peruvians were on their mettle now, playing with almost demonic intensity, like men who had accepted a challenge and were going to show that they could beat it. The new spirit paid off promptly. The home team scored one impeccable goal within a couple of minutes, and the crowd went wild with joy. By this time I was shouting like everyone else and telling that referee things I didn't know I could say in Spanish. It was one to two now, and a hundred thousand people were praying and cursing for the goal that would bring us level again. It came just after halftime. The ball had been passed to one of our forwards. He ran about fifty feet with it, evaded a couple of the defenders with some neat footwork, and kicked it cleanly into the goal. It had scarcely dropped down from the net when that whistle blew again. Now what? I wondered. He can't disallow that. But he did. The ball, it seemed, had been handled. I've got pretty good eyes, and I never saw it, so I cannot honestly say that I blame anyone for what happened next. The police managed to keep the crowd off the field, though it was touch and go for a minute. The two teams drew apart, leaving the center of the pitch bare except for the stubbornly defiant figure of the referee. He was probably wondering how he could make his escape from the stadium, and was consoling himself with the thought that when this game was over he could retire for good. The thin, high bugle call took everyone completely by surprise. Everyone, that is, except the fifty thousand well-trained men who had been waiting for it with mounting impatience. The whole arena became instantly silent, so silent that I could hear the noise of the traffic outside the stadium. A second time that bugle sounded. 
and all the vast acreage of faces opposite me vanished in a blinding sea of fire. I cried out and covered my eyes. For one horrified moment I thought of atomic bombs and braced myself uselessly for the blast. But there was no concussion. Only that flickering veil of flame that beat even through my closed eyelids for long seconds, then vanished as swiftly as it had come when the bugle blared out for the third and last time. Everything was just as it had been before except for one minor item. Where the referee had been standing there was a small, smoldering heap from which a thin column of smoke curled up into the still air. What in heaven's name had happened? I turned to my companion, who was as shaken as I was. Madre de Dios, I heard him mutter. I never knew it would do that. He was staring not at the small funeral down there on the field, but at the handsome souvenir program spread across his knees, and then, in a flash of incredulous comprehension, I understood. Seldom do we realize just how much energy there is in sunlight. I've since looked it up, and the experts say that more than a horsepower hits every square yard of the earth. Those fifty thousand well-trained fans with their tinfoil reflectors had intercepted most of the heat falling on one side of that enormous stadium, and aimed it all in one direction. Even allowing for the programs that weren't tilted accurately, the late ref must have absorbed the heat of about a thousand electric fires. He couldn't have felt much. It was as if he had been dropped into a blast furnace. I doubt if even the ingenious Don Hernando realized exactly what would happen when he had talked his trusting friend, President Riaz, into lending him the necessary manpower. The well-drilled fans had been told that the ref would merely be dazzled out of action for the game. But I'm sure that no one had any regrets. They play football for keeps in Perivia. Likewise, politics. While the game was continuing to its now predictable end, beneath the benign gaze of a new and understandably docile referee, my friends were hard at work. When our victorious team had marched off the field, the final score was fourteen to two, everything had been settled. There had been practically no shooting, and as the President emerged from the stadium he was politely informed that a seat had been reserved for him on the morning flight to Mexico City. As General Sierra remarked to me when I boarded the same plane as his late chief, we let the army win the football match, and while it was busy we won the country. So everybody's happy. Though I was too polite to voice any doubts, I could not help thinking that this was a rather short-sighted attitude. Several million Panagorians were very unhappy indeed, and sooner or later there would be a day of reckoning. I suspect that it's not far away. Last week a friend of mine, who is one of the world's top experts in our specialized field, indiscreetly blurted out one of his problems to me. Joe, he said, why the devil should anyone want me to build a guided missile that can fit inside a football? End of The Stroke of the Sun by Arthur C. Clarke Enough at last. By Lynn Venable. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bologna Times. Time Enough at Last. By Lynn Venable. The atomic bomb meant to most people the end. To Henry Bemis, it meant something far different a thing to appreciate and enjoy. For a long time Henry Bemis had had an ambition to read a book, not just the title or the preface or a page somewhere in the middle. He wanted to read the whole thing all the way through from beginning to end. A simple ambition, perhaps, but in the cluttered life of Henry Bemis an impossibility. Henry had no time of his own. There was his wife, Agnes, who owned that part of it that his employer, Mr. Carsville, did not buy. Henry was allowed enough to get to and from work 
that in itself being quite a concession on Agnes's part. Also, nature had conspired against Henry by handing him with a pair of hopelessly myopic eyes. Poor Henry literally couldn't see his hand in front of his face. For a while, when he was very young, his parents had thought him an idiot. When they realized it was his eyes, they got glasses for him. He was never quite able to catch up. There was never enough time. It looked as though Henry's ambition would never be realized. Then something happened which changed all that. Henry was down in the vault of the East Side Bank and Trust when it happened. He had stolen a few moments from the duties of his teller's cage to try to read a few pages of the magazine he had bought that morning. He'd made an excuse to Mr. Carsville about needing bills in large denominations for a certain customer, and then, safe inside the dim recesses of the vault, he had pulled from inside his coat the pocket-sized magazine. He had just started a picture article cheerfully entitled, the new weapons and what they'll do to you, when all the noise in the world crashed in upon his eardrums. It seemed to be inside of him and outside of him all at once. Then the concrete floor was rising up at him, and the ceiling came slanting down toward him, and for a fleeting second Henry thought of a story he had started to read once called The Pit and the Pendulum. He regretted in that insane moment that he had never had time to finish that story to see how it came out. Then all was darkness and quiet and unconsciousness. When Henry came to, he knew that something was desperately wrong with the East Side Bank and Trust. The heavy steel door of the vault was buckled and twisted, and the floor tilted up at a dizzy angle, while the ceiling dipped crazily toward it. Henry gingerly got to his feet, moving arms and legs experimentally. Assured that nothing was broken, he tenderly raised a hand to his eyes. His precious glasses were intact, thank God. He would never have been able to find his way out of the shattered vault without them. He made a mental note to write Dr. Torrance to have a spare pair made and mailed to him. Blasted nuisance not having his prescription on file locally, but Henry trusted no one but Dr. Torrance to grind those thick lenses into his own complicated prescription. Henry removed the heavy glasses from his face. Instantly the room dissolved into a neutral blur. Henry saw a pink splash that he knew was his hand, and a white blob come up to meet the pink as he withdrew his pocket handkerchief and carefully dusted the lenses. As he replaced the glasses, they slipped down on the bridge of his nose a little. He had been meaning to have them tightened for some time. He suddenly realized, without the radiation actually entering his conscious thoughts, that something momentous had happened, something worse than the boiler blowing up, something worse than the gas main exploding, something worse than anything that had ever happened before. He felt that way because it was so quiet. There was no whine of sirens, no shouting, no running, just an ominous and all-pervading silence. Henry walked across the slanting floor. Slipping and stumbling on the uneven surface, he made his way to the elevator. The car lay crumpled at the foot of the shaft like a discarded accordion. There was something inside of it that Henry could not look at, something that had once been a person, or perhaps several people. It was impossible to tell now. Feeling sick, Henry staggered toward the stairway. The steps were still there, but so jumbled and piled back upon one another that it was more like climbing the side of a mountain than mounting a stairway. It was quiet in the huge chamber that had been the lobby of the bank. It looked strangely cheerful, with the sunlight shining through the girders where the ceiling had fallen. The dappled sunlight glinted across the silent lobby, and everywhere there were huddled lumps of unpleasantness that made Henry sick as he tried not to look at them. "'Mr. Carsville?' he called. It was very quiet. Something had to be done, of course. This was terrible, right in the middle of a Monday, too. Mr. Carsville would know what to do. He called again, 
more loudly, and his voice cracked hoarsely. Mr. Carsville! And then he saw an arm and shoulder extending out from under a huge fallen block of marble ceiling. In the buttonhole was the white carnation Mr. Carsville had worn to work that morning, and on the third finger of that hand was a massive signet ring also belonging to Mr. Carsville. Numbly, Henry realized that the rest of Mr. Carsville was under that block of marble. Henry felt a pang of real sorrow. Mr. Carsville was gone, and so was the rest of the staff. Mr. Wilkinson, and Mr. Emery, and Mr. Prithard, and the same with Pete, and Ralph, and Jenkins, and Hunter, and Pat the guard, and Willie the doorman. There was no way to say what was to be done about the East Side Bank and Trust, except Henry Bemis, and Henry wasn't worried about the bank. There was something he wanted to do. He climbed carefully over piles of fallen masonry. Once he stepped down into something that crunched and squashed beneath his feet, and he set his teeth on edge to keep from retching. The street was not much different from the inside, bright sunlight and so much concrete to crawl over. But the unpleasantness was much, much worse. Everywhere there were strange, motionless lumps that Henry could not look at. Suddenly, he remembered Agnes. He should be trying to get to Agnes, shouldn't he? He remembered a poster he had seen that said, In event of emergency, do not use the telephone. Your loved ones are as safe as you. He wondered about Agnes. He looked at the smashed automobiles, some with their four wheels pointing skyward like the stiffened legs of dead animals. He couldn't get to Agnes now anyway. If she was safe, then she was safe. Otherwise, of course, Henry knew Agnes wasn't safe. He had a feeling that there wasn't anyone safe for a long, long way. Maybe not in the whole state, or the whole country, or the whole world. No, that was a thought Henry didn't want to think. He forced it from his mind and turned his thoughts back to Agnes. She had been a pretty good wife, now that it was all said and done. It wasn't exactly her fault if people didn't have time to read nowadays. It was just that there was the house, and the bank, and the yard. There were the Joneses for bridge, and the Graysons for Canasta, and charades with the Bryants, and the television. The television Agnes loved to watch, but would never watch alone. He never had time to read even a newspaper. He started thinking about last night, that business about the newspaper. Henry had settled into his chair, quietly, afraid that a creaking spring might call to Agnes's attention the fact that he was momentarily unoccupied. He had unfolded the newspaper slowly and carefully. The sharp crackle of the paper would have been a clarion call to Agnes. He had glanced at the headlines of the first page. Collapse of conference imminent. He didn't have time to read the article. He turned to the second page. Salon predicts war only days away. He flipped through the pages faster, reading brief snatches here and there, afraid to spend too much time on any one item. On a back page was a brief article entitled Prehistoric Artifacts Unearthed in Yucatan. Henry smiled to himself and carefully folded the sheet of paper into fourths. That would be interesting. He would read all of it. Then it came, Agnes's voice. Henry! And then she was upon him. She lightly flicked the paper out of his hands and into the fireplace. He saw the flames lick up and curl possessively around the unread article. Agnes continued. Henry, tonight is the Joneses' bridge night. They'll be here in thirty minutes, and I'm not dressed yet, and here you are, reading. She had emphasized the last word as though it were an unclean act. Hurry and shave. You know how smooth Jasper Jones's chin always looks, and then straighten up this room. She glanced regretfully toward the fireplace. Oh, dear, that paper— Oh, the television schedule. Oh, well, 
after the joneses leave there won't be time for anything but the late late movie and don't just sit there henry hurry henry was hurrying now but hurrying too much he cut his leg on a twisted piece of metal that had once been an automobile fender he thought about things like lockjaw and gangrene and his hand trembled as he tied his pocket handkerchief around the wound in his mind he saw the fire again licking across the face of last night's newspaper he thought that now he would have time to read all the newspapers he wanted to only now there wouldn't be any more that heap of rubble across the street had been the gazette building it was terrible to think there would never be another up-to-date newspaper agnes would have been very upset no television schedule but then of course no television he wanted to laugh but he didn't that wouldn't have been fitting not at all he could see the building he was looking for now but the silhouette was strangely changed the great circular dome was now a ragged semicircle half of it gone and one of the great wings of the building had fallen in upon itself a sudden panic gripped henry bemis what if they were all ruined destroyed every one of them what if there wasn't a single one left tears of helplessness welled in his eyes as he painfully fought his way over and through the twisted fragments of the city he thought of the building when it had been whole he remembered the many nights he had paused outside its wide and welcoming doors he thought of the warm nights when the doors had been thrown open and he could see the people inside see them sitting at the plain wooden tables with the stacks of books beside them he used to think then what a wonderful thing a public library was a place where anybody anybody at all could go in and read he had been tempted to enter many times he had watched the people through the open doors the man in greasy work clothes who sat near the door night after night laboriously studying a technical journal perhaps difficult for him but promising a brighter future there had been an aged scholarly gentleman who sat on the other side of the door leisurely paging moving his lips a little as he did so a man having little time left but rich in time because he could do with it as he chose henry had never gone in he had started up the steps once got almost to the door but then he remembered agnes her questions and shouting and he had turned away he was going in now though almost crawling his breath coming in stabbing gasps his hands torn and bleeding his trouser leg was sticky red where the wound in his leg had soaked through the handkerchief it was throbbing badly but henry didn't care he had reached his destination part of the inscription was still there over the now doorless entrance p u b blank c l i b r blank the rest had been torn away the place was in shambles the shelves were overturned broken smashed tilted their precious contents spilled in disorder upon the floor a lot of the books henry noted gleefully were still intact still whole still readable he was literally knee-deep in them he wallowed in books he picked one up the title was collected works of william shakespeare yes he must read that sometime he laid it aside carefully he picked up another spinoza he tossed it away seized another and another and still another which to read first there were so many he had been conducting himself a little like a starving man in a delicatessen grabbing a little of this and a little of that in a frenzy of enjoyment but now he steadied away from the pile about him he selected one volume sat comfortably down on an overturned shelf and opened the book henry bemis smiled there was the rumble of complaining stone minute in comparison with the epic complaints following the fall of the bomb this one occurred under one corner of the shelf upon which henry sat the shelf moved threw him off balance the glasses slipped from his nose and fell with a tinkle he bent down 
clawing blindly and found finally their smashed remains a minor indirect destruction stemming from the sudden wholesale smashing of a city but the only one that greatly interested henry bemis he stared down at the blurred page before him he began to cry End of Time Enough at Last by Lynn Venable